Can I have a seat? All right, let's go on the record on uh, Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The city of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, uh, along with Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil and Public Service Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Crowsey, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Renner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen. Mr. Jensen appears in person. Good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for coming on time. Uh, we'll wait till you get your uh, equipment here. We'll get some hearing equipment that is not working this morning.
going to go uh, continue now. The appearances have been stated. We're still on the record. I wanted to thank the jury again for coming in on time, folks. Uh, we are going to start the trial then. Um, we have to swear you in again, so if everybody could rise, raise your right hands. Good morning. <clears throat> Do you and each of you swear you will well and truly try the issue joined between the state of Wisconsin, the plaintiff, and Mark Jensen, the defendant, and unless discharged by the court, give a true verdict according to the law and the evidence given in court to help you, God? Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. The jury has been sworn in. At this time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to read what is called preliminary jury instructions. Um, you'll have more instructions after we finish the case, but these preliminary instructions will give you some idea of how we're going to proceed with the trial. And then after I'm done, the attorneys will do their opening statements. So with that, I will begin by saying before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. Your duty is to decide the case based solely on the evidence presented and the law given to you by the court. Do not let any personal feelings or bias or prejudice about such things as race, religion, national origin, sex, or age affect your deliberations. Do not begin your deliberations and discussions of the case until all the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case amongst yourself or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. You may be excused from the courtroom when it's necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, the lawyers or the witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, the lawyers, and the witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversation about this case. There are a number of representatives from the media covering this trial. As was discussed earlier, what the media may report is not of the standard necessary for jury use in deciding the great issues which will be presented to you in this case. For that reason, you must not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news accounts on the radio or television about this trial. Do not watch or listen to any newscasts on television or radio which originate from Milwaukee, Kenosha, Whitewater, or Lake Geneva for the duration of the trial. Do not read the Kenosha News, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the Janesville Gazette, the Week, the Midweek, or the Racine Journal Times. Do not read anything at all on the Internet which pertains to this case. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene. Do not engage in any experimentation or research relating to any issues, facts, or persons involved in this case. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, websites, or other reference materials for any additional information regarding this case or any issues which may pertain to it. Anything you may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. Television and photography will be occurring during this trial. Under no circumstances will televising or photographing members of the jury be permitted. And so you will not be pictured in any images which are ever broadcast or telecast. For those who may be interested, I have requested that the media make available to you after the trial is over access to all the media accounts which will be telecast during the trial. It's critically important to the fairness of this trial that you adhere to this order that you not read, watch, or listen any account of these proceedings. You must understand that the violation of this order will have serious repercussions 
both for the integrity of the trial and for anyone who would violate the court's order. Your ability to remain without sequestration is dependent upon compliance with this order, and you must also understand that any intentional violation will be punished as contempt of court. If you see or hear any outside information about this case, you must promptly report that to the court. Evidence. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received, whether or not an exhibit goes to the jury room. Three, any facts to which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated or which the court has directed you to find. Objections of counsel, evidence received over objection. Attorneys for each side have the right and a duty to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should not draw any conclusions from the fact an objection was made. By allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection of counsel, the court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence. You jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight of the evidence. Note taking permitted. You are not required to, but you may take notes during this trial, except during the opening statements and closing arguments. The court will provide you with the materials. In taking notes, you must be careful that it does not distract you from carefully listening to and observing the witnesses. You may rely on your notes to refresh your memory during your deliberations. Otherwise, keep them confidential. After the trial, the notes will be collected and destroyed. Transcripts not available for deliberations. You will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. You should pay careful attention to all the testimony because you must rely primarily on your memory of the evidence and testimony introduced during the trial. The credibility of witnesses. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinize into the way the testimony of witnesses and determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility, that is the believability of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness and the weight you give to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors, whether the witness had an interest or a lack of interest in the result of this trial, the witness's conduct, appearance, demeanor on the witness stand, the clearness or lack of clearness of the witness's recollections, the opportunity the witness had for observing and for knowing the matters the witness testified about, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony, the apparent intelligence of the witness, bias or prejudice, if any, has been shown, possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other facts and circumstances during a trial which tend either to support or discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the way you believe it should receive. There's no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Instead, use your common sense and experience in everyday life. You determine for yourself the reliability of things people say to you. You should do the same thing here. I'm going to give you the elements of first degree intentional homicide. First degree intentional homicide as defined in statute 94001 of the criminal code of Wisconsin is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with the intent to kill that person or another. The state's burden of proof. Before you may find a defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. The elements of the crime that the state must prove. Number one, the defendant caused the death of Julie Jensen. Cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the death. 
Number two, the defendant acted with the intent to kill Julie Jensen. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. When may intent exist? While the law requires that the defendant acted with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent exist for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brooded over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even for a minute. There need not be any appreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. Deciding about intent, you cannot look into a person's mind to find intent. Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances, in this case, bearing upon intent. Intent and motive. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive reverse refers to a person's reason for doing something, while motive may be shown as a circumstance in aiding to establish the guilt of a defendant. The state is not required to prove motive on part of the defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all the circumstances. Burden of proof, the presumption of innocence. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. Presumption of innocence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The state's burden of proof, the burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. Reasonable hypothesis. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and return a verdict of not guilty. The meaning of reasonable doubt. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt it would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon in the most, when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt. You are to search for the truth. Opening statements. The lawyers will now make their opening statements. The purpose of an opening statement is to give the lawyers an opportunity to tell you what they expect the evidence will show so that you will be better, you will better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, opening statements are not evidence. With that, is the state ready to proceed with their opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil.
Go ahead. I'm just waiting for your comments. Like I said, we'll wait. <laughs> This is Julie Jensen. She's with her two sons, David the older boy and Douglas the little boy. As you are aware by now in this case, Mark Jensen, the defendant, stands accused of murdering his wife, Julie Jensen, in 1998 by poisoning her with ethylene glycol, the main ingredient in antifreeze. Now when you have a murder case such as this, you hear evidence in great detail about the person who is killed. So you're going to hear evidence about how Julie's body was discovered dead in her bed at her home. You'll hear detailed evidence about things like how her arm was positioned, the lividity of the blood in her body, how her face looked, buried in the pillow. You're going to hear about Julie's blood and what was in it, her stomach contents and her kidneys, and how they revealed the evidence of the ethylene glycol poisoning. And there's two things that you're going to hear in the evidence that you should know about ethylene glycol poisoning. A person should not have ethylene glycol in their system. The human body is made up of all sorts of things, but ethylene glycol is not one of them. So if ethylene glycol is found in a person, that is instant evidence of poisoning. And it has happened that some people have accidentally killed themselves with ethylene glycol, and some people have purposefully committed suicide by drinking ethylene glycol, but in this case, the evidence you're going to hear is that the defendant murdered his wife with ethylene glycol, that this was not Julie Jensen ingesting that substance to commit suicide. And that leads me to the other thing you should know about ethylene glycol. It's a drug that is not commonly tested for at autopsy. At autopsies, there are tests that are done for drugs, like prescription drugs or illegal street drugs. But ethylene glycol, such an unusual substance, is not typically tested for. And so a person doing an autopsy isn't necessarily going to find it unless they're looking for it. So you're going to hear that evidence about the ethylene glycol in Julie Jensen's blood and in her stomach and other evidence of that poisoning in her system. You may even see some photos from the autopsy showing evidence from the inside of her body. So in this trial, you're going to hear Julie Jensen talked about in that way, that detached, impersonal evidence. But this is Julie Jensen. And in this murder case, even more important than how her body was found and what was in her blood and her stomach, even more important than that is the evidence you will hear about Julie the person. You are going to hear from witness after witness, people who knew Julie in various aspects of her life, that her family and her children were everything to her. She even had a specialized license plate on her car my three Ds, that stood for her two children, David and Douglas, and the father of her children, the third D, Daddy, that was for Mark Jensen. When Julie Jensen died, her oldest son, David, he was eight years old, he was in third grade at Southport Elementary School, and you, you are going to hear from David's third grade teacher, her name is Therese DeFazio. And she's a witness in this case because Julie Jensen was very involved in her son's life. She was actually a room mother in this third grade class. And so even though her youngest child, Douglas, he was only three years old and she was a stay-at-home mom, it doesn't mean that she just stayed at home. Every Wednesday morning, starting in the beginning of that school year in 1998, 
Julie would volunteer in David's classroom to help out Ms. DeFazio. She would help the other students in the class and help Ms. DeFazio with various projects. And one thing that Julie Jensen and Ms. DeFazio had in common that you'll hear about in the evidence is that Ms. DeFazio had two sons too, two older sons. And so that was a topic of conversation between them because Julie Jensen was asking her for advice. What do you do with two sons? How do you raise your sons? She was looking towards the future, thinking about college for, for David, a, a very bright child. And Julie Jensen was also a big part of her children's activities. She was the kind of mom who would make Halloween costumes for her kids by hand. She was good at crafts and sewing, and she was a good baker. And you're going to hear in this case a lot about the neighborhood. The Jensens lived in Pleasant Prairie in a neighborhood known as Carroll Beach, which is near the lake. They had a nice yard with a beautiful garden, a swimming pool, and you'll hear from the neighbors who often saw Julie playing in the yard with the children or neighborhood children coming over to the house because they had the swimming pool. But Julie Jensen also had a life outside her children. Before her oldest son was born, she worked as an assistant at a stock brokerage firm. And even when she was a stay-at-home mom, she wasn't an isolated person. She was outgoing. She went out of her way to meet and get to know her neighbors. She made her neighbors her friends. And you're going to hear from a variety of neighbors who say that about Julie Jensen. She was also active in a neighborhood book club. You're going to hear about the book club. The month before Julie Jensen died in November of 1998, she hosted the book club and she invited the ladies in the book club into her home. Finally, she was an avid gardener. Gardening was really her passion, so she would be outside a lot working on the garden. In the week of her death, she called a neighbor just to discuss gardening, some seeds that the neighbor had or had grown. Julie Jensen was looking to purchase that in the future and was asking questions about it of her neighbor. The only real problem for Julie Jensen in the fall of 1998 was with her marriage. But before we talk about that time, the fall of 1998, I want to go back to 1990 and to 1991 in the months after David, her oldest, was born. Now that's a big transition time in a marriage, the time before kids and the time after kids. And it caused some issues in the Jensen marriage. Julie felt that the defendant was not involved enough with David, not supportive enough. And she had returned to work part time after David's birth, and that was a difficult transition too. And Julie Jensen during that time was suffering from some postpartum depression. And she went to a psychotherapist. She saw the, the psychotherapist for about a year. She was prescribed an antidepressant. And the defendant also went to the psychotherapist several times too, because the therapist felt it was useful to see both the Jensen's and these sessions lasted about a year. So in this trial, if you hear about Julie Jensen's history of depression, that this is a suicide because she had a history of depression. Well, that's it. The postpartum depression and seasonal affective disorder when the seasons change, like fall, that she was treated for for one year in 1990 to 1991. Julie Jensen did not have a history of suicide attempts. She did not have suicidal ideation. She had no suicide plans. And what a therapist is supposed to do, what you'll hear in the evidence, is ask someone if they have signs of depression to ask that person about risk of suicide. At no time did Julie Jensen ever say she was contemplating suicide. And in fact, she would cite her children. She could never do it because of her kids. And that's what happened in 1990 and 1991. 
And really what you're going to hear is the problem during that time period was with the Jensen marriage. In addition to Julie Jensen's concerns about the defendant's lack of involvement with David, she just felt the defendant didn't love her anymore. And she even contemplated divorce during that time period. Julie Jensen began confiding in a coworker, a man named Perry Tarika. He was going through a divorce and he also had a young child. And one weekend, Julie made the mistake of inviting Perry Tarika to her home on a weekend when her husband was gone. And that weekend, she had sex, she had a fling with Perry Tarika. So she cheated on her husband. Now that's the only time Julie Jensen and Perry Tarika were intimate. And you can tell from the evidence that Julie Jensen immediately regretted this. She cut off the relationship with this man immediately. And she even left her employment where they had worked together. And after that, Julie Jensen decided to not keep secrets from her husband again. And in this trial, I expect you'll hear from Perry Tarika as a witness. I expect you'll hear about this relationship he and Julie Jensen had as co-workers at first, and then confiding in each other about their more personal issues. And you'll hear about during that time period, as Julie was contemplating divorce, she even went with Mr. Tariqa to his divorce lawyer. And in fact, in June of 1991, Julie Jensen did file for divorce, though obviously that didn't go through. The reason I am going back to 1990 and 1991 is because that changed everything in the Jensen marriage. You will hear in the evidence that the defendant never forgave Julie Jensen for that affair. And by the way, there's no obligation to forgive a spouse for an affair. That's not required. Sometimes affairs break relationships, they break marriages. When that happens, divorce is always an option. Forgiveness is not required. But Mark Jensen did not file for a divorce. Instead, he engaged in a campaign of covert harassment directed at his wife to degrade her and gratify him. In a case that is full of strange facts, this harassment over the course of years is perhaps the strangest. And here's how it would look. From time to time, starting after Julie's affair, someone would apparently be leaving pornographic images outside of the Jensen home, on the deck, in the shed, even allegedly mailing these pornographic images to the defendant's place of work and leaving them on his car at work. And so what were these images? Well, almost all of them appeared to be printed out computer photos, so in black and white, on regular paper. Only once was it an actual photograph that was left. And these photos were pornographic. They would show sexual activity, sometimes sexual intercourse, sometimes oral sex, sometimes a woman positioned as though she was about to perform oral sex on a man, and sometimes just naked photos of men with erect penises. Another feature of this harassment was phone calls. Far more than the occasional hang-up call that people got in the 1990s, over and over and over again, call after call of hang-ups. And a lot of this was directed towards Mark, he said, that he would get these harassing calls at work, that he would receive these harassing photos at work. And so over and over and over again, Julie Jensen reported this activity to the Pleasant Prairie Police Department beginning in 1991 after that affair, and all the way through the beginning of 1998, this continued. An extremely long length of time, almost seven years. And this happened so frequently 
and Julie Jensen reported it to the police that she actually asked to just speak to one officer so she wouldn't have to say the whole story over and over again. And that officer ended up being Officer Ron Cosman. And so how it would work is most of the images were purportedly found by the defendant. That's what Julie told the police. The defendant would come to her and present her with the images he had found at work or at home. And as the Jensen's reported it to the police, they believed the culprit was Perry Tarika. Because it seemed as though the images were chosen to resemble Julie. And the frightening idea was presented that this man, Perry Tarika, had secretly taken pictures of him and Julie when they had sex that long time ago. That he had had this fling with Julie and now he was rubbing it in her face to humiliate her for years. And the police tried to investigate this. The police suggested to Julie that she keep a log of this activity. And you're going to see that she did. She kept a handwritten log. And it's actually stunning to see because it's so long. There's just page after page of this harassing activity. Because the defendant had said that these images were frequently left at his vehicle at work, the Pleasant Prairie Police Department suggested that the Jensen's hire a private investigator. Maybe that person can stake out the car and see if they catch anybody. Or they suggested placing a video camera, videotape the car and see if anyone leaves anything. But these efforts didn't work. The defendant was aware of this private investigator. And so while that private investigator was involved, nothing happened. The police also suggested putting a trace on the phone through the phone company. Remember, we're talking about the 90s, and so no caller ID. But when these traces were put on, the calls would stop. So the anonymous perpetrator could not be found that way. And so Officer Ron Cosman, he had a lot of contacts with Julie about this because of the harassment. And he was thinking about these traces. And he was thinking, well, how could these phone calls stop when we try to put these traces on? How could the perpetrator know to stop these calls? The only people who know about these traces are the Jensen's and me, the police officer. And so Ron Cosman specifically asked Julie, for the last trace that was done, he asked her not to tell the defendant. And so when the last trace is put on, and Officer Ron Cosman is checking in on that, and so he goes to Julie's house and he asks her if the calls had continued, and she said no. But Julie wasn't looking him in the eye. And so he asked her, did you tell the defendant this trace was going on? And she admitted that she had. And at that moment, Ron Cosman was frustrated with her, said, why'd you do that? And so Julie explained, remember in her mind, this harassment is her fault. It's because of that affair. This degradation, what her husband is going through, what she's going through, it's her fault. And she said, well, after that affair, she just didn't want to keep things from the defendant. Didn't feel right not to tell him, so she told him. And it's true that the man that Julie Jensen had this affair with, he was a suspect too. But the thing is, he had never even lived in Wisconsin, and then even living in Illinois, he ended up moving away, far away, like you have to fly a plane. He ended up moving far away early on. And this harassment, again, went on for like seven years. And so it just didn't make sense. He's coming back to Wisconsin to leave these pictures around the Jensen home. It's not even a drive away. To leave these pictures at Mark Jensen's place of work, it just doesn't make sense. So you're going to see in the evidence this log that Julie kept of this harassment. And Julie Jensen ended up dying. She died on December 3rd of 1998. But this virtually constant harassment that had been going on since 1991, it slows down after June of 1998, and then it comes to a total stop after August of 1998. 
And you're going to hear in the evidence in this period of time that that's when the defendant gets a girlfriend. That's when his affair starts. Now, you're also going to hear about computer evidence. And most of the computer evidence relates to the murder itself, but some of it relates to this harassment. And one thing you'll hear is that the defendant, on his work computer, which was seized by the police, this is a 2002 computer, so years after the harassment, but it's still relevant for this reason. On this 2002 work computer, the defendant had an extensive collection of pornographic images. Judge, I object at this point, and I'd ask for a sidebar. Why don't you guys go on the back for a second? We're going to just take care of it right away. <clears throat> images of pornography unless they can somehow be connected to the images that were given that were dropped around the house or around the work I'm not sure how that's relevant it's years after um, Julie Jensen's death and unless there's a direct connection a computer he had after her death I don't know how that's relevant or those images would be relevant your honor may I I'll just say this I think it's outrageous that my that uh, Ms. Uh, O'Neill Ms. Niels, McNeil's opening statement was interrupted by this. Defense counsel has known for years, for years, that this evidence had been admitted at the last trial. If it was defense counsel's intention to bring a motion to exclude this evidence, that motion should have been heard by this court. We had numerous pretrial motions. There's never been any question that this evidence was going to be admitted during the course of this trial. And this evidence is clearly critically relevant to the evidence the state is going to be presenting during the course of this case. This, these 2,200 penis photos that were on the defendant's computer demonstrate a number of things. It demonstrates his odd preoccupation with the male member. It demonstrates that his level of, of offense that he took, that his wife, Julie, had had this affair with this Perry Tarika, in which she had apparently performed fellatio upon Perry Tarika, but it was something that she wouldn't do with him. These Venus photos that were left around the house for years and years and years, according to the investigating officers, including a, a Detective Ellis, who was a private detective in this matter, reflected that somebody had an enormous array of pornogra pornography that they could tap in order to find penis photos that kind of, that included a person that kind of looked like Julie and included a background that, that where they could not exclude her bedroom as being the sort, the, the place where these photos were taken. Um, there was ample testimony about this at the last trial. The relevance of the other X evidence has already been ruled upon by the Wisconsin Court of Appeals and it's the law of the case in this matter. So to uh, interrupt this opening statement on this basis is outrageous, and the motion, the objection should be overruled, and we should continue with this opening statement. I'll let you respond briefly. Thank you, Judge. I have to object when I think there's irrelevant, inadmissible evidence being presented, and I'm going to continue to do that during witnesses, even if they testified about it last time, because this court decides what's relevant in this case. Um, unless they can connect these 2002 penis pictures to the evidence prior to 1998, I don't understand how it's relevant. If the pictures that the Jensen's were receiving were of someone giving fellatio, and these are just penis pictures, again, I'm not sure how it's relevant to the death of the death of Julie Jensen. All right. Uh, what I'm going to say is the last statement by Ms. Krause would be a great statement at a closing argument because we would have had all the evidence come in and if the defense 
had made a motion on relevance and I had overruled it, the defense could argue, well, even though it came in, we don't think it's relevant. We're at opening statements. I don't see, I mean, this is not my first rodeo. I don't see a lot of objections at opening statements. And a lot of times, you know, statements are made and then they come back to haunt the other party because that evidence was never presented. It never came in. So I just read to the ju uh, jury, opening statements are not evidence. They're an opportunity to tell you what the evidence will show. And if the state wants to bring in this evidence, I'm not going to prejudge every little bit of statement in it that's being made now and rule whether it's relevant or not. We're going to be here for three years, not five weeks. So it's not a good objection. I understand, Judge. and I you, will you have a right, but it's not a good objection. I want it noted for the record. Bring the jury back. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We are back on the record. All right, we're back on the record on the Jensen matter. The jury has returned to the courtroom. The appearances are the same. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm going to um, overrule the objection and the state can uh, continue with their opening statement. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. So these 2002 images on the work computer, they're relevant because it shows that the defendant had an extensive collection of pornographic images that were categorized and were similar to the harassing images that were left around the Jensen residence over that period of time. Um, and I describe those images for a reason because they connect to these 2002 images found on the defendant's work computer. But that's in 2002. So let's talk about 1998. What you're going to see here is you're going to see an example of Julie's log, what she kept, what she hand wrote about this harassing activity. You'll see the date at the top there, January 19th of 1998, and what Julie Jensen described as new tactics live on the Internet. And so she's describing this harassment that is apparently occurring now with a change of tactics over the Internet. And then what I want to see, I want to show you next is what is noted on April 13th of 1998. Julie Jensen notes in this log an email that's part of the harassment. Here's the email. You'll see that it's from someone by the name of Turtle, that's the name in the email, to Mark Jensen. And then you'll see in the text of the email, um, consistent with the harassment, here's a few for Jay, so Julie, of me soft. Also a shot I took without her knowing it of a married girl in the office I'm currently doing at a nearby hotel. Attached to this email are three images, three pornographic images of nude males. 
and then what looks like a surreptitious image taken of a topless woman in a hotel room. And it's consistent with the harassment because here's this harasser suggesting essentially he's doing it to another woman, taking pictures of her secretly, which was the same implication given to Julie Jensen in the course of this harassment. And then also, again, of course, the pictures of a nude male. This email is from M. Jensen at execpc.com to M. Jensen at execpc.com with the names changed. So the way you would see this email in 1998, it would just look like it's from an anonymous person named Turtle to Mark Jensen. But the way our computer analysts can see the email, our computer analysts can see who it's from. It's an email the defendant sent to himself pretending under disguise to be He's acting as the perpetrator of this harassment. So how do we know Mark Jensen is really the harasser? A variety of things, but this email proves it. Where else do we see the email? We see this same email address show up on the Jensen home computer. This email address, mjensen at execpc.com, is in the Jensen home computer under the name Mark Jensen. So this harassing, degrading email that's noted in Julie's log was sent by Mark Jensen to Mark Jensen under the guise of the harasser to be presented by the defendant to Julie as continued punishment for her affair. Now, years later in the spring of 1998. So that's the evidence that you're going to hear, that the first time the Jensen marriage was on the rocks in the early 1990s, that Julie Jensen sought counseling and treatment. She was treated for depression. She seriously contemplated divorce and even filed for divorce in 1991. In contrast, Mark Jensen engaged in a years-long covert campaign to harass and punish his wife. So let's turn to what's happening in 1998 when the Jensen marriage was again crumbling. <clears throat> in 1998, Mark Jensen had moved jobs. He was now working as a stockbroker at a company called Stiefel Nicholas. The home base for that company was in St. Louis. And working in St. Louis as an assistant to the defendant's boss, was a woman by the name of Kelly Labonte. In this case, Kelly Labonte is sometimes referred to as the motive because the defendant began having an affair with her in around September of 1998. And this was a very serious relationship because shortly after Julie Jensen's death, just in the weeks after, Kelly Labonte would come to Pleasant Prairie to visit. She would stay at the defendant's house. Soon thereafter, she moved to Wisconsin. She remained in a relationship with the defendant for years after Julie's death. She married him. She had a child with him. And they were together until about 2009 when they divorced. And Part of this evidence, an important part of this evidence, the computer evidence, right here, you can see in this picture, in the back here, that's the home computer. A picture of the Jensen home computer in their home in 1998. And so because we're talking about 1998, we're talking about not a, a laptop or something mobile, we're talking about a desktop computer that has its own room in the Jensen residence. This isn't in a bedroom or a room that's uh, occupied for people by other, for other reasons. There's no TV. This is the computer room, essentially. And what you're going to see is that on this computer, after it was seized by the police the day of Julie's death, on this computer, the police found emails 
between the defendant and Kelly Labonte. Now, these were work emails in the sense that what the defendant was doing is he was accessing his work emails from home, um, which now is pretty normal to do on your cell phone or on your laptop. But back then in 1998, with dial-up internet, that was pretty sophisticated. And you're going to hear the detective in that time frame didn't even fully understand it. How are these work emails on the home computer? But that's how they were accessed. And so the detective sees these work emails, but he sees they're not just emails between coworkers. These emails are full of sexual innuendo, and it's obvious that these people during the fall of 1998, they were in a relationship. They were having an affair because Kelly ended up getting married too in that time period. In fact, in one of these emails from October of 1998, the defendant refers to Kelly Labonte as his girlfriend. And they end the emails frequently, almost all the time, with I-D-L-Y, I do love you. So within a few months after Julie Jensen's death, the police are aware of this affair, the motive. And the detective sits down with the defendant in April of 1999, so a few months after Julie's death. And as this investigation is continuing, the detective, who has seen these emails, asks the defendant about Kelly Labonte. And the defendant lies. He says before Julie's de death, they were just coworkers and friends. He had only seen her a few times. They weren't in a relationship. And even at that point, in the spring of 1999, he wouldn't describe them as dating. It's a lot of hemming and hawing about what he wanted to call them, and he certainly didn't want to admit to having this affair. Now, in this trial, I expect the undisputed evidence is going to show that the defendant was in the midst of an affair with Kelly Labonte when he killed his wife, Julie. Now, Julie was a perceptive person. And in the fall of 1998, she noticed changes in her husband. She knew that something was wrong. Something had changed after her husband had started this new job at Stiefel Nicholas. And she even suspected that maybe there was another woman. Maybe her husband was having an affair. But the proof that the police had found was on the computer. And a critical part of the evidence that you're going to hear in this case is that Julie Jensen didn't know anything about computers. Now, nowadays, that sounds almost impossible in 2023, but life was different in 1998. People did exist without computers. They had grown up without computers. If you were an adult in 1998, you'd grown up without a computer. You started your work life, no computer. No one had these little computers in their pocket. And the internet itself was in its infancy. This is dial-up internet. You can probably hear it when I say the words, hear it yelling at you. And so what you're going to hear in this case is that this internet, this incredibly slow internet, this is something that Julie Jensen never used. You're going to hear that Julie Jensen didn't have an email address. There's no evidence of her sending an email. You'll see that this computer evidence, that computer in the Jensen home, the internet was only used on that computer during times when the defendant was home. And Julie was a stay-at-home mom, so she had access to this computer all day long. But the computer analysts can tell when the internet was being accessed, the times. And they can tell that when Julie's home alone, no one's using the internet. It's only when the defendant is home late at night, the early morning hours, when it's used during the daytime, it's on a weekend. Those are the times the internet is being used on this computer. And you're going to hear that there's also several documented times when we know from the evidence the defendant was out of town. There's no internet usage during those times. Julie Jensen did not use the computer or the internet back in 1998 when that was actually possible. 
you're even going to hear an anecdote from Therese DeFazio. Remember, she's the third grade teacher. You're going to hear that when Julie Jensen came to her classroom and offered to volunteer, Therese DeFazio thought, oh, it might be helpful. Maybe Julie can help the kids in their computer lab. And so Therese DeFazio suggested that, and Julie was like, oh, no, I don't even know how to turn on a computer. You know, Julie wanted to be helpful, but she told Therese DeFazio way back at the beginning of the school year, I really can't help with the computers. I can maybe type if someone opens a program for me, but that's it. So with proof of the defendant's affair being on the computer, Julie didn't have proof, only suspicions. She and her husband were arguing all the time, and she said when the defendant wasn't arguing with her, he basically didn't speak to her at all. Their relationship in 1998 that fall was just falling apart. And once again, as in 1990, 1991, Julie was contemplating divorce. Now, during this time period, there were a few people that Julie Jensen confided in. Particularly, you're going to hear these names a lot, particularly her neighbors, Margaret and Ted Voigt. Now, I call them Julie's neighbors, but you're going to see in the evidence that they were really more than neighbors. They were friends. They had lived next to each other for years. The Voigts also had two children who were growing up. They both spent a lot of time outside. The Voigts children would come over to play in the pool. They would see Julie outside all the time working on the garden. They would socialize with each other. They went out to dinners. They went to places like Six Flags with their kids. They went to the, the zoo or birthday parties. So they were friends. They were more than neighbors. In fact, you're going to hear in the evidence that Julie Jensen saw the Voigt so commonly that it was basically every day. Virtually every day they'd see each other and chat with each other. So one day, about five or six weeks before Julie died, in about late October of 1998, Ted Voigt saw Julie Jensen in the front of her house. There was a bench there, and she was sitting there and she was crying. And Ted Voigt was getting ready for work that morning, but he saw his friend, his neighbor, crying. And so he went over to her. And this is the first of a series of conversations that Julie Jensen had with Ted Voigt about her concerns about her marriage and what was going on with the defendant. You'll hear about these conversations in detail in the evidence. But basically, over the course of these five or six weeks before her death, Julie Jensen told Ted Voigt about the arguments with the defendant, how the defendant seemed changed, her worry that maybe the defendant was having an affair, and things that Julie had noticed with the defendant about the computer. She talked about going by the computer and seeing sticky notes, sticky notes that he had written by the computer that were suspicious, that had weird words on them like syringe and names of drugs. And she saw the defendant on the computer. For instance, she'd be vacuuming in the hall outside, and she saw on the screen that he was looking up poisoning and then closed the door in her face. She described another time when the defendant had gone to work but left the computer on, and on the screen, there was a website about poisoning. So now, moving to late November, I'm going to put up here a calendar that will help you with the days. Moving to late November in the days before Julie's death, which happened on December 3rd, Julie confided in Therese DeFazio. And this was the last time she saw T Therese DeFazio. And you'll hear Ms. DeFazio recount this conversation and how she saw that Julie was troubled and encouraged Julie to speak to her. And Julie told Ms. DeFazio that she was afraid that her husband was going to kill her. 
Now, Ms. DeFazio was shocked and she was taken aback and she asked Julie why she would think something so serious. And Julie explained about that list, that weird sticky note. And then she explained that she feared that her husband might try to kill her with a drug overdose and make it look like a suicide. Again, Ms. DeFazio asked her why she thought her husband might do this. And Julie said there were other things that she couldn't explain. And Julie confided to Ms. DeFazio, the same as she had to Mr. Voigt, that it bothered her how every time she walked by that computer room and the defendant was in it, he would cover it or turn it off quickly so she, should, she couldn't see the screen. And then there's a third person, the defendant's sister, Laura Coster. During Julie's life, Julie and Laura Coster were good friends. So even though Laura Coster is the defendant's sister, Julie confided in her as a friend. Julie Jensen spoke to the defendant's sister about the same suspicious note, the one that listed the syringe on it, and she even told the defendant's sister. She told her in the fall of 1998 that she feared that the defendant might be planning to kill her. Now this sounds crazy, except for the fact that within a few weeks, within a few days of these conversations, Julie Jensen was dead. This sounds crazy. And that's the problem. That's the dilemma that Julie Jensen was facing. She knew it sounded crazy, and she explained it to Ted Voigt and to Therese DeFazio, that if she acted on these fears, if she did what a person who feared for their life would do, take her kids and run and hide, if she did those things, the defendant would point at her and call her crazy. Look at what my crazy wife did, running off with the kids, acting like I'm going to kill her. So here's what Ted Voigt said about Julie's dilemma. Ted Voigt said that her suspicions were that the defendant was trying to poison her or he's trying to drive her nuts to take away the kids from her because that's what the arguments that they used to have, that he was scaring her, that she was an unfit mother and he would take the kids away from her. Therese DeFazio said, that Julie told her she stayed with her husband for the sake of the boys whom she loved dearly, that she thought if she tried to leave her husband, he'd make up stories that she was unstable and that he'd get the kids. She didn't want to lose her boys. Another thing Julie had told Ms. DeFazio, going back to that prior counseling in 1990 and 1991, she had told Therese DeFazio during that counseling, the defendant would always say things that were making her look like she was crazy. Remember, this is the man who for years tricked Julie into believing that her former lover was leaving debasing pornography all around when it was actually him. These days, we have a word for this. We call it gaslighting. So let's be clear. This isn't a case where it's either a homicide or a tragic suicide. It's either a homicide or a suicide plus. A suicide plus an evil plan to frame an innocent man. That way, the kids won't just lose their mom, they'll lose their dad too. There is one thing that is inescapably clear from the evidence, in spite of her fears that Julie expressed to multiple people before she died, Julie Jensen would not abandon her children. And so she stayed. Now, on Tuesday, December 1st, Julie Jensen went to see the family doctor, Dr. Borman. And during this visit, Julie told the doctor that she was miserable and depressed. So there it is, Julie Jensen talking about being depressed just days before her death. But she also told Dr. Borman that she and the defendant were having marital problems. She told him about the affair that she had and felt that the defendant never forgave her for. 
She told Dr. Borman that she's concerned her marriage might be over, and she told him several times that her kids meant everything to her. She denied being suicidal and talks about not wanting to lose her kids. And so we can see the parallels here to 1990. And Dr. Borman ends up referring her for counseling and giving her samples of Paxil, an antidepressant. One thing that you're going to hear in the evidence is before this visit to the doctor, the defendant was urging Julie to go see a doctor. So maybe he was just being a caring husband for his depressed wife. But this December 1st visit to the doctor was not enough for Mark Jensen. Because the next day, he went to Dr. Borman alone. This is December 2nd. And he didn't go for himself, he went for Julie. And he told Dr. Borman that he was concerned. He'd gotten some information off the internet about the side effects of Paxil. And he was concerned that Julie might be having side effects. And he was concerned because she wasn't sleeping. Now this was odd because Dr. Borman made no note about sleep disturbances the prior day, which is a common question, a question that gets all, asked all the time when dealing with depression. A symptom being sleep disturbance is a very common symptom. Without seeing Julie Jensen, without trying to call her or consult with her, Dr. Borman gave the defendant a prescription for Julie for Ambien, 10 Ambien sleeping pills. So this was sometime during the morning of December 2nd, 1998. By the time of Julie's death, a bit over 24 hours later, three of those pills were gone. And it's too bad that Dr. Borman didn't try to give Julie a call because something was wrong. The morning of December 2nd, when the defendant left the home, Julie called her friend Margaret Voigt. Now, Margaret Voigt, just like Ted Voigt, was Julie's friend. But unlike her husband, Margaret didn't really want to be involved in these troubles. She heard about all of them through her husband. But she didn't really want to get involved. So she knew about them but hadn't spoken as much to Julie as her husband had. So Julie talks on the phone with Margaret Voigt that morning, and Margaret Voigt, who knew her well, who knew her for years, said Julie's voice sounded shaky, and it sounded like she was drunk. Now, there's no reason for Margaret Voigt to know this, but ethylene glycol is an alcohol. And so one of the first stages of poisoning, the first stage of ethylene glycol poisoning, is a person will show signs of intoxication, like they're drunk. So Margaret asks Julie what's wrong, and Julie tells her, while this medication I took, I didn't know it, had, it would have such an effect on me. But Julie was happy, because the defendant was now being so attentive to her. Julie said the defendant was being good to her. He took the kids to school, and, she's go and he's going to go to the doctor for her. And Margaret offered help. She asked Julie if she needed help, but Julie said no. The defendant was being good to her. Margaret Voigt never spoke to Julie Jensen again. Now, these doctor visits are important. Because leading up to them, Julie Jensen had talked to Ted Voigt and described a strange experience where the defendant had very persistently tried to get her to drink some wine. And it just wasn't normal. These were people who had been together with each other for years. And the defendant didn't commonly offer Julie Jensen food and drink like that. She was the homemaker, that was her job, and so Julie described this unusual behavior from the defendant and how her not wanting to drink the wine had actually led to a huge fight between them. It was just another thing on the list of strange things that happened in the weeks before Julie's death. Now the defendant had this ideal drug to enact his plan Ethylene glycol has a sweet taste to it, 
And it's the kind of thing that won't be detected at autopsy. But he has to have a way to slip it to Julie. And being persistent and aggressive about it wasn't working. But now Julie's got this new medication, and he's taking care of her. And these effects from this ethylene glycol can be passed off as side effects of the new medication. And once, once Julie starts getting well and truly sick from this poison, the defendant now has Ambien to give her day and night to drug her senseless. And Julie did get truly sick. On Wednesday, December 2nd, she was supposed to go to Ms. DeFazio's class. She went there every Wednesday. She was very prompt. And so when Ms. DeFazio noted she was missing, Ms. DeFazio went to her son, David, who presented her with a note that said Julie couldn't come in because she was sick. <clears throat> now, there are three stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. Someone who consumes enough eth ethylene glycol at once can die in stage one. But if they reach stage two, which is 12 to 24 hours after ingestion, the person's body becomes acidotic because the body breaks down the ethylene glycol into the poisons. And one of them is called oxalic acid. This causes breathing problems, heavy, rapid breathing, and it can cause heart arrhythmia. A person can go into a coma in this stage and die. If a person does make it to stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning, which can happen 24 to 72 hours after ingestion, that's the kidney phase. You see at the autopsy crystals in someone's kidney when they reach this phase. So the doctors can tell these crystals are from that acid created by ethylene glycol poisoning. And they disrupt kidney function. A person who reaches stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning, they die a, a slow and a painful death. At approximately 4.30 p.m. on December 3rd of 1998, the police responded to the Jensen residence for a pulseless, non-breathing female. Julie Jensen was dead in her bed. The crystals in Julie Jensen's kidneys found after her autopsy show that she had reached stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning before she died. I don't think that there's going to be any dispute in the evidence that Julie Jensen was desperately ill leading up to her death. It's consistent with the medical evidence, and the defendant himself acknowledged it. He said she was breathing funny. She had a hard time breathing. She got up and she fell and she hit her head. The morning of her death, she could hardly sit up in bed. She was groggy, almost incoherent, her breathing was labored and raspy. It sounded like her windpipe was being restricted. The defendant said, I'm not even sure she was coherent. The defendant also adamantly said that that morning she did not get out of bed. So now we go to the sleeping pills. The thing about sleeping pills is you're supposed to take them when you're supposed to be sleeping. And the defendant described Julie Jensen taking the first one Wednesday morning, right after he got them, and then another one Wednesday night, and then a third one Thursday morning, the morning of her death, when she was so terribly ill she was incoherent. The defendant even describes how that morning, he talked about Julie Jensen, he, she couldn't even choke down water and she didn't get the water because she didn't get out of bed. He had to get it for her. So Julie Jensen didn't take a sleeping pill the morning of December 3rd. She was given a sleeping pill. She couldn't get out of bed. The defendant gave it to her. And the children saw their mother dying too. 
David was upset. He didn't want to go to school. He noticed his mom's breathing problems. David said she couldn't talk that morning. And the defendant said something weird to the detective who was talking to him about that morning. He said, there was a question between myself and the kids that morning about whether or not to call an ambulance, take her to the hospital. The kids are eight and three. You don't consult with an eight-year-old and a three-year-old about taking your wife who can't breathe to the hospital. And also, Dr. Borman, who had given her that prescription, given the defendant the Ambien, he had told the defendant, if your wife's condition worsens, you got to get her to the ER. But Mark Jensen didn't listen to Dr. Borman or his kids, for that matter. What the defendant said he did was that afternoon, the afternoon of December 3rd, he said he went to work. So now we come to a witness by the name of Aaron Dillard. And before I talk about what Aaron Dillard ha has to say, I want to talk about who Aaron Dillard is. He became a witness because he was someone in 2007 who was in the same area of the jail as Mark Jensen. Aaron Dillard is a liar and he is a con man. Aaron Dillard is willing to provide information, testimony about Mark Jensen to help himself, to help himself in the outcome of his criminal cases. So why call this lying con man as a witness, someone who everyone acknowledges is a liar? Well, what Aaron Dillard has to say is that while he was in jail with the defendant, the defendant told him what happened about killing his wife. And now again, I cannot be more clear that Aaron Dillard is not an inherently believable witness. He's the opposite. But what Aaron Dillard had to say is eye-opening. Because the only people who know what happened in the last moments of Julie Jensen's life, well, it's only one person, the person who was there, the defendant. And up until this point, up until 2007, a lot of people had spent a lot of time thinking about this case, law enforcement and medical examiners. In this case, we're actually going to be calling two medical examiners as witnesses. You're going to hear from Dr. Chambliss, who actually did the autopsy on Julie Jensen, and Dr. Mainland, who studied the case and ethylene glycol poisoning. And there were some unexplained things about this case. For instance, how Julie Jensen was found in her bed. She was found face down in her pillow to such an extent that you're going to see that her nose was actually shifted to the side. A very odd position for someone to be in who couldn't breathe. Also, she was laying awkwardly across her arm. So her arm was kind of beneath her diagonally an odd position for someone to put themselves in. It looks like someone had simply rolled her over from her back to her face. And part of what happens is in, in an autopsy is that the doctors look for internal injuries. And there was some internal subcutaneous bruising on Julie's rib cage that aligned with how she was laying on her arm. And she also had some hemorrhages in the back of her neck area. <clears throat> now, when someone's doing an autopsy, deciding that the manner of death is asphyxiation, that's often a decision that is based on excluding everything else. You have a person who's dead, and you can't say other ways that they died, but you see some signs of asphyxiation. So different maybe from strangulation, where there's actual force applied to someone's neck, but asphyxiation, where someone's breathing is stopped, like by forcing their face into a pillow. It's not going to leave the same signs. <clears throat> and so sometimes these signs can just be things that are seen, post-mortem artifacts that are seen, and they aren't signs of asphyxiation. But they are also consistent with someone who is su suffocated. And so this leads us 
to what Aaron Dillard says the defendant told him. The defendant had a timing problem. He needed Julie Jensen to die on December 3rd before he got David from school. He could not bring his eight-year-old who had already been wanting to take, that, take his mother to a doctor. He couldn't bring that eight-year-old back in the home where his mother was dying but not dead yet. So if Julie Jensen was alive by the time David Jensen was done with school, that was a problem for the defendant. And what Aaron Dillard said is that the defendant, he took the kids to school and to daycare, which is true. <clears throat> and the defendant returned home, but Julie Jensen was not dead. She was non-responsive. She was incoherent. But the defendant feared that she was actually breathing better. And so he first rolls her onto her face with her face in the pillow. And then he leaves the room, kind of hoping that that will do the job. But when the defendant returned to the room, Julie Jensen was still alive. And so he got on top of her. He pushed her face and her neck into a pillow. He sat on her back so she could not breathe, causing the pressure on her arm that she was laying on, causing the subcutaneous bruising. And then she died. That is the description that Aaron Dillard tells of what Mark Jensen told him. And there's other significant details that Aaron Dillard gives, details about the medications, getting the Paxil, how the defendants, his plan was to slip her antifreeze in juice when she's taking this medication, how Julie was acting drunk. The defendant apparently told Aaron Dillard that Julie was acting drunk. And then also getting the Ambien to sedate Julie. Now I want to be clear that Julie Jensen, untreated, and she was untreated, would have died of ethylene glycol poisoning. So it is that poisoning what this case is truly about. But the significance of Aaron Dillard is not that he is a truth teller, but he's also not a doctor, he's not a toxicologist, he's not a forensic pathologist or a detective, and he certainly can't speak to the dead. And the way Aaron Dillard was able to give details to explain some of the unexplained things in this case was eye-opening, even to people who had thought about the case for a long time. And not being a doctor or a medical examiner or a psychic, the only way Aaron Dillard could do that is if he heard it from the mouth of the defendant. But Aaron Dillard is not the only person the defendant talked to. You heard about Kelly Labonte being referred to as Mark Jensen's motive. Now it's time to get to Mark Jensen's mistake. And that person is Ed Klug. Ed Klug is Mark Jensen's mistake because on a drunken night, the defendant revealed to Ed Klug before Julie's murder that he was looking on the computer for ways to kill his wife. Mark Jensen knew Ed Klug because they both had moved to Stiefel Nicholas in 1998. Mark Jensen had joined the firm earlier and he was actually involved in helping open Ed Klug's branch in Appleton. In fact, Kelly Labonte was there too. And so Mark Jensen actually wasn't so helpful in opening that branch, according to what Ed Klug saw. And so then they know each other from that, and they end up together at a big conference. You're going to hear about this conference that took place in St. Louis in early November of 1998, so before Julie's death, the big company conference. And Mark Jensen and Ed Klug, they know each other, but they both recently joined this company, so they don't know a bunch of people. And so they end up hanging out in the hotel, and at first they are with a bunch of people drinking, but then the hotel clears out. It's basically even past bar close time, and they've been drinking together and talking, and they engage in some wife bashing, so to speak. 
And so during this conversation, when Mark Jensen had been drinking, the defendant told Ed Klug that if you want to get rid of your wife, that you could go to websites that would tell you how to poison your wife, how to kill her, and it wouldn't be detectable. You could use things like Benadryl and antifreeze, things that couldn't be detected. And the way Ed Klug describes it is that Mark Jensen was telling him about a substance that would crystallize someone from the inside out, which is what ethylene glycol does. Ed Klug said Mark Jensen was telling him how he was doing this on the computer and how he was going to kill his wife. So Ed Klug is a big problem for the defendant in this case. And so I think you're likely to hear in the evidence a lot of efforts to attack Ed Klug. That maybe he's someone who just wants the limelight, just wants to insert himself into a big case. But what you're going to hear is that Ed Klug actually never came forward with this information to the police or prosecutors. We had to go to him because one of his coworkers suggested, you go talk to Ed Klug. He has some things to say about Mark Jensen. So not someone who's seeking the limelight. And also, I expect you'll hear as a witness from Joanne Klug. Because it might be said that, well, if Ed Klug didn't report this information right away, in fact, not until 2007, then how do we even know it actually happened? And this is where Joanne Klug comes in. Joanne is Ed's ex-wife now. They were married back in 1998, and actually until years later. But they're not married now, and their marriage was not in great shape in 1998, hence the wife bashing. So that night at the conference, Joanne was checking in on her husband. And that night after this conversation happened, there's a variety of phone calls between Ed Klug and Joanne Klug. And Joanne Klug will come in here and tell you that that very night, Ed Klug told her, hey, remember Mark Jensen, my coworker Mark Jensen? He said he's looking for ways to kill his wife including with antifreeze. So we know right after the fact that Ed Klug, in surprise and shock, told somebody about this conversation. He told his wife then, now his ex-wife. <clears throat> so when the defendant is contemplating this murder, after he was drinking with his guard down, the defendant told Ed Klug about this internet research on websites. And the computer evidence in this case tells you that's exactly what the defendant was doing. Remember that Jensen home computer I showed you the picture of? That was seized by the police and examined by experts from the Wisconsin Department of Justice. And you're going to hear a lot of evidence about this computer because of how important that is. But to try, try to boil it down for you, what you'll see in this computer evidence is the research into websites about poisoning and then specifically ethylene glycol poisoning. Now that research was being done in 1998 in the infancy of the internet. And what's fascinating is that in this computer that was analyzed, by the Department of Justice, you can sometimes even see what those websites look like in 1998. The computer saved that information. And there's no Googling even at that time. For a search engine, you're going to see Yahoo. And you can see this information. It was able to be recovered, even though the user of the computer, the defendant, deleted the internet history. So nowadays, people live and work on computers every day. People are cognizant of privacy. There's things like private browsers and VPNs. But that, back then, it was quite an unusual thing to delete the internet history. And that's what this user, this sophisticated user of the computer, did repeatedly. 
We're only able to see this internet history because of the analysis by the professionals. If a user were simply to open this computer, if it could still turn on even after 1998, and just try to look at the internet history, you wouldn't see anything. And I already told you about Julie's inability to use a computer, and the defendant was quite the opposite. You're going to hear from the defendant's coworker, a man named Dave Naring, who was his friend from work. And he's going to tell you that during this time period, the defendant was very skilled at the computer. He was on the computer all the time at work. Remember, we don't see a single email from Julie Jensen. In contrast, we see a bunch of emails involving the defendant. We can also compare the internet history we see on this home computer with things that we know were going on in the defendant's life. For example, the defendant imagined going on a Windstar cruise with his girlfriend, Kelly Labonte. The internet history shows a visit to the Windstar cruise website. The defendant, in an email, he's offering to buy Kelly Labonte some clothes from Patagonia. On the home computer, we see that online shopping at Patagonia. The defendant is thinking about ways to kill his wife. We see those searches on the home computer. Initially, for a wider variety of ways to kill someone, like pipe bombs, there's even a website accessed with a story about a man trying to kill his wife, his ex-wife, with a pipe bomb. Or we see research on the anarchist cookbook, websites that have to do with like messing with the wiring of a pool to electrocute someone. Now that's the early research. And then we see the research for poisons. And finally, for ethylene glycol poisoning. And again, this aligns with the e emails that we have between the defendant and his girlfriend, his future wife, Kelly Labonte. They start talking about the possibility of a future together, how they're going to deal with their significant others in October of 1998. And we start seeing this research on the computer about killing and poisoning. Now, interestingly, we don't see research about divorce or child custody or child support. We don't see internet activity that overlaps with Julie's interests, what was going on in her life. We don't see internet activity at all when the defendant isn't there. From the evidence, we know that the person doing this internet research, this hidden, deleted internet research, that's the person who killed Julie Jensen. And we know from the evidence that that person was not Julie. It was the defendant. Remember how desperately ill Julie was the morning of her death. She was incoherent. She was struggling to breathe. She did not get out of bed. She couldn't walk, she couldn't talk. She was on her third Ambien pill in about 24 hours. Her eight-year-old knew that she needed to go to the hospital. The defendant was there. As Julie lay dying, did he take her to the hospital or call 911 like his son wanted or like Dr. Borman told him? No, that's when he gave her the sleeping pill. And as Julie lay dying that morning of December 3rd, 1998, he went to the computer room, and that morning he searched for ethylene glycol poisoning. You can see the search term on the bottom of the screen here. This is Julie Jensen. She didn't kill herself. She didn't frame her husband to make it look like a homicide. She didn't abandon her kids and try to take away their father too. She lived for her kids and she died because the defendant murdered her. Thank you. We're gonna take a short break before the uh, defense does their opening. So go in the back, relax. Please don't talk about the case, okay?
thank you. Okay, thank you.
Exhibit 2 is Julie. That's what I thought I just wanted to ask. Are you cold? That's my plan. All right, we are back on the record on Mark Jensen's case. The appearances are all the same. The jury's back in the courtroom. The defense is going to do their opening statement. Attorney Renner, you can proceed anytime you're ready. Thank you. On December 3rd, 1998, Mark Jensen found his wife in their bedroom, motionless. He called 911. When paramedics and the police arrived, they found a distraught mess of a man in Mark Jensen. His eyes were red from the tears streaming down his face. There was snot bubbling up from his grief. He had trouble standing while talking to the police and to the paramedics, trying to explain what was going on. And he directed them to the back bedroom. Prior to 1998, to, to December 3rd, 1998, the Jensen family was just like any other family. They had good days. They had bad days. The Jensens were a middle class family. They loved their boys. And they worked hard to build what they had. Julie Jensen was a smart, educated woman. The kind of woman who, despite the fact that her higher education was in nursing, was able to self-study and gain her Series 7 stock brokerage license. Mark Jensen was a successful stockbroker. They had two sons. But like any other family, 
the Jensen's had their problems. Back in 1990-91, Julie Jensen cheated on her husband. She ultimately did file a divorce proceeding, but in the end, she stayed. She stayed with Mark Jensen and her boys in their home. And Julie is diagnosed with depression. In the following years, you heard about these pornographic pictures left around the home, a constant reminder of the infidelity. Yet, at the time, everyone believed those to be sent by Mr. Tarika, who's the person that Miss. Jensen had hit the affair with. On advice of police, Mr. Jensen hired a private investigator to get to the bottom of these photos. And I believe you're going to hear, and the evidence will show, that Mr. Jensen was not leaving these photos around to be found, to be harassing. As I stated though, Julie Jensen was diagnosed with depression first in 1991. Ultimately, she ends up getting medications She goes to therapy. But here's the thing, mental illnesses don't just go away. You're going to hear multiple witnesses talk about things that Julie Jensen said to them One of the stories you're going to hear is that there was a day when Julie Jensen was caring for her children at home as well as other children in her home. When she called the parents of one of these children, one of her best friends, Laura Coster, and said, your son just smeared feces all over my bathroom. Laura called Mark, and both of them rushed home to figure out what was going on. Yet when they got there, there's no feces all over the bathroom. There's no smell of cleaning products or anything that would have explained why it's not there anymore. You're going to hear that that was the point when Laura Coster decided that maybe Julie shouldn't be caring for my child anymore. You're going to hear about a day when Julie was at her dentist's office in the weeks leading up to her death, crying, upset and saying that she wanted to take her life. And you're going to hear from multiple witnesses about things that Julie told them that were inconsistent with things she told other people. She told some people that Mark 
was forcing her to get a job since her youngest was about to start school. She told others that Mark steadfastly refused to let her get a job even though she wanted to go out and work. You're going to hear statements that Julie made to neighbors, to, to acquaintances. But the people in her family, she never told any of them about any worries about Mark. And every time that someone asked her, hey, let me help you. Let me help you leave. She declined that help each and every time. What brings us here today is Julie Jensen's suicide. The suicide of a woman who was in declining mental health, who was seeing her family doctor, a family practice doctor, for prescriptions for her mental illness, for her depression, not a psychiatrist, And as you listen to the evidence, at the very end of this trial, you're going to be asked to answer one question. Did the state prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Jensen caused Julie's death? Or did they prove to you that Mark Jensen wasn't a great husband and was kind of a jerk. Because those are two very different things. After Julie Jensen's death, an autopsy was performed. Dr. Chambliss can't determine a cause of death based on the autopsy, but based on crystals in the kidneys, Ethylene glycol poisoning is suspected by the Kenosha Medical Examiner. Dr. Long is hired by the prosecution and concludes that ethylene glycol was the cause of Julie Jensen's death. And he claimed it was a homicide based on faulty math and faulty facts. Dr. Mainland, another of the state's witnesses, is in agreement with the cause of death being ethylene glycol poisoning right up until the liar, the snitch, the con man and cheat Aaron Dillard, who has everything to gain by helping out the DA's office and who has access in the jail to every single one of the documents that Mark Jensen had in his cell pertaining to his case, comes forward. And then in 2007, Dr. Mainland, based on the statement of this con man, this liar, this cheat, says, oh, actually, cause of death is suffocation. After almost a decade, 
of saying it was ethylene glycol, the statement of one liar, who you heard from the state in their opening statement is a liar, and who had all of the documents he needed to create a convincing story right there in Mr. Jensen's cell. Everything changes. Now one of the witnesses you're going to hear from is Dr. Lindsay Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a medical examiner who has done thousands of autopsies. She will tell you exactly why this theory of strangulation is flawed. Objection, Your Honor. There's no theory of strangulation that's been described by the state or anybody else. I'm going to overrule it. Again, folks, this is opening statement. It's not evidence. And the attorneys are just basically telling you what they might prove. So, again, it's not evidence. You don't have any notes. Go ahead, Ms. Rutter. Or smothering, I suppose, is a better word for what this state is claiming. Dr. Thomas will be able to tell you exactly why that is not supported by the scientific evidence, by what was found in the autopsy. And you're also going to hear from Dr. Stacy Hale. Now, Dr. Stacy Hale is a medical toxicologist. One of the things you'll learn about is the difference between medical toxicologists and forensic toxicologists. Medical toxicologists deal with the living. They deal with people who are coming into the emergency room, suffering from poisoning, suffering from other issues that have a toxicological basis, which is a big fancy way of saying it's got a chemical in the body basis. And she's going to be able to explain to you exactly why Dr. Long's testimony, Dr. Long's analysis, and Dr. Long's findings are all flawed. Flawed because of bad math and not supported by the physical evidence. When you're listening to the evidence in this case, one of the things that the judge will tell you, and already has told you, is that it's up to you as the jury to weigh the credibility, the believability of the witnesses that are put before you. So who are these witnesses? Jail snitches like Aaron Dillard, known con man, liar, and cheat. Jail snitches who have everything to gain and nothing to lose by coming forward with evidence in this case that they discovered not from conversations with Mr. Jensen but by reviewing the materials that they found in Mr. Jensen's cells. Witnesses whose stories just don't add up. Stories about a late night conversation at a hotel that isn't supported by anyone else that was there. People who had every opportunity to listen to that conversation and again you're going to hear evidence about these flawed witnesses and what kind of people they are. the type of people 
you can believe or the type of people that gossip and who you can't trust when they state things. Witnesses who only come forward almost a decade after the death of Julie Jensen. And reliance on statements of Julie Jensen herself, who the evidence is going to show is an unreliable narrator. She tells people on one hand that she wants to work and her husband won't let her, and tells people on the other hand that she doesn't want to work, she doesn't want to do this, but her husband is making her. Julie Jensen, who is mentally ill and suicidal based on her own statements at the dentist's office. Julie Jensen, who refused to leave despite telling people that she was afraid for her life. Julie Jensen, who had access to the family finances, who had her own car, and had a husband who worked all day. And Julie Jensen, who is not computer illiterate. You are going to hear that Julie Jensen was in charge of the family's finances. And she didn't just write down in her checkbook what she spent in the balances. No. She used a program on the computer called Quicken, a program that required her to go on the computer. Let's talk a little bit more about this computer evidence. Because the computer evidence from the Jensen Home computer, you're going to hear, came from a single user on the computer. Now remember, this is back in 1998. The days of dial-up, right? We all remember, well, maybe not all of us, but a good chunk of us are gonna remember that obnoxious sound that the dial-up modem made. We're also going to have to remember that this was the days before you could stick your internet connection into your wall for the cable, before the days where you had a separate line that came into your house just for internet. In the days of dial-up, you had to plug in the computer to your phone line, to your landline in the home. Now the state makes a big deal about the majority of the computer activity, because not all. The majority happens after Mr. Jensen comes home from work and the entire family is at home. But remember this, if you were in a dial-up situation and you were on the computer and the school called to say that your son was sick or there was an emergency, They got a busy signal. The evidence is going to show that Julie Jensen had just as much access to this computer. The evidence will show that both Mr. Jensen and Mrs. Jensen used this computer. And wouldn't it make sense if when you are at home and your kids are at school and your husband is at work, that you want to have that phone line available in case something happens and that you 
as a responsible parent, would do your online searching when your whole family is at home, when you don't have to be worried about what your three-year-old is doing running around the house, when you don't have to worry that every second you spend on the Internet could be the moment that the emergency call is coming in and getting a busy signal instead of being able to get a hold of you. And as far as the searches on December 3rd, the morning, if you look closely at that search, you're going to see that they started around 940 in the morning. And you're going to hear testimony. Testimony from Ted Voigt that Mark Jensen left the home at 915 that morning to bring his kids to school. And you're going to hear, and this is probably pretty gross to think about, but in Julie Jensen's stomach contents, there was food, described as peppers and potatoes. Why is that important? Well, if Ms. Jensen is well enough to get up and eat, Is she well enough to use a computer? Now, most of us have done searches on the internet, on Yahoo or Google. It doesn't take the most intelligence to pop up a search engine and type in some words. And Julie Jensen a smart, educated woman who lists on her resume computer skills, who is using computer programs to track the family's finances, is not computer illiterate. What Julie Jensen was is a mentally ill woman. She was a mother who suffered from depression, and a person who made allegations against her husband not to the people that were closest to her in her life, but to acquaintances. Julie Jensen is an unreliable narrator, and the evidence will show that. The evidence will also show that Julie Jensen was at high risk for suicide. Dr. Sarah West is one of the people you are going to hear from in this trial as well. Dr. West did an analysis. And she did it post-mortem, of course. But she did an analysis of Julie Jensen. And she's going to explain to you exactly why Julie Jensen was at high risk for suicide. Now, one of the things that you hear often in courts and when we're talking about the jury trial system is innocence until proven guilty. Mr. Jensen is innocent of his wife's death. As you analyze the evidence, 
again, the one question that you have to answer is, did the state prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Jensen caused his wife's death? Here's the thing, the answer to that is no. <coughs> because he didn't cause her death. Julie Jensen took her own life. The evidence will show as much. And at the end of this case, all of the lawyers will come back up here and they're going to ask you to find by, from the state, you're going to hear them ask that you find the defendant guilty. To find this innocent man guilty. Objection, Your Honor. The state's not going to ask the jury to find this innocent man guilty. Again, it's opening statements. Just, just show what you're right. going to uh, do in your case, uh, Ms. Runner. But the evidence in this case is absolutely going to show that Ms. Jensen was suicidal. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Jensen, while not being perfect, is not a murderer. And for that reason, we will be asking you at the end of this case to find Mr. Jensen not guilty, to hold the state to their burden of proof, and ultimately to weigh all of the evidence that you hear, because that evidence will prove to you that Mr. Jensen is not a murderer. He is innocent and he is not guilty. Thank you. All right, we're gonna start the evidence portion. If we could have uh, pencils and notepads given out to the jury. Your view of the witness. Um, they're not going to use that. So that should go in the corner somewhere.
Mr. Chan, are you good? Uh, the state can call their first witness. State calls Ruth Thorwald to the stand. Witness list in front of you. Uh, you can. Give me just. It would help if you give me the number also on the on the list that was filed as of November sixteenth of two thousand twenty-two. But I believe this would be witness one. He wants it on the number one. Witness list. I see. Okay. All the way up front, ma'am, remain standing. Raise your right hand when you come up here. I'll swear you in. You saw me swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. You can have a seat. Get as close as you can to the microphone. If you give us your first and last name, spell both of your names for the court reporter. Ruth Vorwald, R U T H. V O R W A L D. Go ahead, Mr. Jamboy. Can you move that microphone a little bit? Which one? Is that, is that better? That's the one we want. All right. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Vorwald. Good morning. Can you tell me where you lived in December of 1998? Yes, um, 9005 Third Avenue, Pleasant Prairie, which is in Carroll Beach. And is that location in Kenosha County in the state of Wisconsin? That's correct, yes. Did you know or come to know a person by the name of Julie Jensen? Yes, I did. She was actually a very good friend of mine. So. Tell us about when you first met Julie Jensen and the circumstances surrounding that. So um, my husband and I were new to Carroll Beach. Uh, we weren't from the area. We built our house. And um, I had a young son at the time, Nicholas, and I would push him in the neighborhood in the stroller. And then Julie would be walking in the neighborhood pushing her son, David, in the stroller. About what year was this? That would have been 91, the summer of 91. So tell us how you came to meet Julie in, in um, the summer of 1991. So again, just in the neighborhood, pushing our sons in the stroller. Um, and then I was working in Highland Park at the time and saying, you know, I didn't know people in my neighborhood, was kind of struggling to meet people because I wasn't from there. And one of my friends said, well, I have a book club. And that's how I've gotten to know people in my neighborhood. So I said, wow, that's a great idea. Can you give me the information how you do it? And she explained it. And so Julie was the first person that I asked uh, to be in book club with me. And is that the first time you met her is when you asked her to be in the book club? No, no. I had met her, like I said, in the summer of 91, just pushing our sons in the stroller. We would stop and, you know, say hi to each other and, and, and visit. But um, when I really got to know Julie was really in 92 when I started my book club because we had, you know, regular contact then. Okay. So it was in uh, sometime in 1992 that Julie became a member of your book club? Correct. And... Um, Aside from the book club, did you, did you have, see Julie out and about on other occasions? Absolutely, um, because again, we had young children. We would do play dates. We would have birthday, birthday parties. All the neighborhood kids would have birthday parties together. They would do trick-or-treating together. Um, Julie, uh, at, I can't remember what year, but put in a swimming pool in her backyard. And she was so kind and offered uh, to have a swim day with all the kids. I want to say it was Friday afternoons. So we would regularly get together, even Easter, do Easter egg hunts, you know, just different things with our children as the year, you know, went on. Did you notice that there were some things that Julie particularly enjoyed doing with her children? Oh, my gosh. Um, she was a very outside person. Uh, she was always outside in the yard playing with her boys. They would go on bike rides. They would go on walks. She liked to hike. Um, those are the things that I like to do, too, so I think that was another reason why we bonded. We loved doing things outside with our boys and, and uh, the different activities that we would do. So um, your, where was your house in relation to the Jensen residents? So um, they're on Lakeshore Drive. They were the second house um, from Lakeshore Drive, the second house south. And around the corner is 3rd Avenue, and I was right on the corner of 3rd Avenue. I'm going to direct your attention to the tele. Can you see a television screen 
I'll either maybe that that one right there might be the easiest one for you to see the one in the corner there and directing your attention to that can you bring I don't see anything is there what it was in the exhibit oh, I need to okay just a minute There's nothing up. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't know if it was a shadow or yeah. but I just wasn't seeing it. So. Yeah, I need to see. Now, directing your attention to the screen, uh, any one of the screens that's most visible to you, um, can you – whoops, it was there, yep. So your residence – I'll move over here – is 9005 3rd Avenue right there? Correct, yep. And then – Jensen residence was right around here. That is correct. It's the it was the second one. So in the corner. This is a more current photo. But back in 1998, uh, were the trees as big as they are here? Or no. They were smaller. <laughs> yeah, a lot smaller. So you did kind of a you could kind of see that. Could you see the Jensen uh, backyard from your backyard? Yes. Yeah, I could. Now, you indicated that one of the things that Julie loved to do was ride her bicycles with the children. Yes. And I'm directing your attention to Exhibit 2. And can you tell the jury what that uh, what that photograph depicts? That's a very normal photo of Julie being with David and Douglas. And considering the size of David and Douglas versus Julie at that time, can you tell us what year it appears that that photo was taken in? I'm thinking that was the year before she died. I'm thinking the fall the year before she died because the year that she passed, she had the shorter haircut. So 1997? So this photo was taken in 1997, you think? Yes, yes. Okay. And Douglas would have been two years old, and that looks right. Now, between the time when you first met Julie and then she became a member of your book club, uh, between 1992 and um, December 3rd, 1998, how often in the course of a normal month would you see or speak with Julie? Well, for sure monthly because of book club, <coughs> and then many times in between, again, just depending on – what was going on, if it was just a play date or um, an activity at school. I was very active at Southport School where both of our boys went. I was a site parent for a couple years, so we would do fundraisers and that for the school. Again, it just depends. It, but in, in, in the summer, we saw each other a lot more um, just because of the weather being beautiful and being in Carroll Beach. That's the time to really be outside. So you saw her often? Oh, yeah, yeah. And did you feel as though you got to know Julie quite well? I consider her one of my best friends. Um, were you, did you see her in 1998? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, when was the last time that you remember seeing Julie in 19, before her death? So I saw her twice, and again, to see a calendar from that year, I'd, I'd have to look at a calendar. But um, I saw her on two occasions. One, she hosted book club, and that would have been the second Tuesday in November. And then the second time I saw her, uh, my son Matthew was turning five, and I had a bumper bowling party, 
and we invited all the the younger kids in the neighborhood. So Douglas, you know, was at that that birthday party. So what's a bumper bowling party? So when they're so little that they can't hit the ball down the lane very well, so they have bumpers. So if it it, it hits no the bumper, yeah, no gutters. Okay, <laughs> gives them a chance to actually knock a pin down. That might be my only chance. To yeah. See when I'm bowling. <laughs> um, so she didn't have David at that uh, birthday party. No, because Matthew was five, so um, it was Doug. Because uh, David was the age of my older son Nicholas, so Douglas came to the party. And what is Matthew's birthday? Um, November 9th. And so was this birthday party uh, on the Saturday preceding or the Saturday following December 9th? It November would have been 9th. after because we went to Disney World and got back literally the day, well, the night before took her treating, and I needed that weekend break, you know, because we drove down there, and it's exhausting. And so um, I wanted to do it the weekend after his birthday. So the, the Saturday after November 9th is when you saw Julie at your son's birth, birthday celebration. Correct. So, uh, directing your attention to Exhibit 3. Can you identify the photograph on the screen? Yeah. So that's Julie on the left with her son, Douglas. And then um, Carrie Ashley is on the right with her son, um, Joey. And that photograph was taken on the Saturday following November 9th, 1998. Correct. Now, did you spend much time visiting with Julie? Did you see her at the birthday party or talk to her? Oh, yeah. We talked to everybody, especially uh, when the kids were bowling. I mean, we had to help the kids bowl a little bit, but after bowling, you know, we did the lunch and gave them money to do the little video game things that, that kids like to play. So, yeah, it was about three hours. So did Julie, um, was Julie active in the, at the oh, party? Oh, absolutely, yep. Tell us about your recollections of Julie at the party, if you can. I mean, any normal mom with an active three-year-old boy just, you know, helping him and playing and assisting him when he needed help with the ball. And, I mean, she was a very hands-on mom, so if I needed help, she was helping hand out plates when we did the cake, you know, things like that. And, um, well, well, tell us what, you saw Julie interact with her children? Oh, always. <laughs> what kind of yeah. a mother was Julie? Uh, she was a very hands-on, very loving mom. Um, she was a stay-at-home mom. And the one thing I think that I really admired, because I felt I wish I could have done this more because I was a full-time working mom, she was always doing different activities with the boys, not just outside in the yard, but they would do arts and crafts. And she would, you know, get an art book and, and, and look at a different craft they could do together and read to them. She was just, she just devoted her time and attention to her boys and, and whatever she could do with them to make their life better. And directing her attention to Exhibit 4, I mean, um, can you identify the photograph uh, that's been marked as Exhibit 4 that's displayed on the screen here? Yeah, that's Julia with her two boys, David and Douglas. And is that a fair representation of Julie as you remember her? Oh, absolutely. And that, can you tell us by looking at that photo of what year that photo appeared to have been taken in? That had to have been the fall of, um, again, I can't remember the year she passed. Was that 98? Yes. Yeah, that would have been the fall because, again, her hairstyle, that was the style she had then. And Douglas was three. So um, that would have definitely, and based on the jackets, that would have been that fall. And actually, that was Exhibit 4, I think I just showed you. Um, now, fast forward to December 3rd, 1998. What can you tell us about what you remember about that day? Well, my sister was visiting from out of town. What's your sister's name? Sharon Krause. And do you know why? Do you remember why your sister was visiting you from out of town? It, it, she, um, her husband and son, she said, she, I had an activity or something, and she was just wanting to come see my house, spend a night with me, spend some time. So um, she came that Tuesday, December 2nd, and then December 3rd, we got the boys off to school, 
and uh, she finished her coffee, and I like to walk every morning. So um, we left the house shortly after 9 and went for a walk because it's so pretty to walk in Carroll Beach. And then I wanted to point out the homes of my friends, you know, ladies in my book club and my friends. So uh, we walked on Lakeshore Drive, which is, of course, the prettiest way to walk anyway in Carroll Beach. And um, we were not even a mile from my house into the walk, and I saw Mark driving in his vehicle um, heading north towards his home. And what time was that? That would have been about 9.25, 9.30 at the latest. Directing your attention to Exhibit 5, the photograph that's displayed on the screen, Exhibit 5. There it is. Um, now, can you see it well enough from where you're seated? Would it help you move closer? Or? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, and where is your residence in that photo? Is that? It's up. Near the top of the photo? Yeah, it's near the top of the photo. And it was in that straightaway. It was before in Carroll Beach. It takes a curve. So in that straightaway area, um, towards the middle part, lower part, lower three quarters of the photo. It would have been before 104th, so north. If you're looking at the photo, is the road, Lake Michigan is to your right, correct? Yeah, it's the street right along Lake Michigan. So it's not the highlighted street, it's the street just um, to the left of Lake Michigan? Correct. Okay. And you said it was, now where, where, where were you when you saw Mark Jensen driving northbound on Lakeshore Drive? Again, I'm trying to see the, the actual street numbers. But I'm on 90th, and it would have been maybe 10 blocks from there. Again, it wasn't all that far into the walk. So this is your residence here? Yes. And then this is Lakeshore Drive? Yes. And it was in that straightaway area before you can see where it curves, okay. a little so curve. It was before that curve. As you see, I'm moving the cursor down. Tell me to stop when you got to the where. You've been right around there. Right around here. Yep. That's where you saw Mark Jensen? Correct. And tell us what everything happened when you saw Mark Jensen. I waved. And he waved back. He waved back. And then you continued your walk. I, I mean, I did make a comment to my sister that was odd to see him in the middle of the morning on the south side of Carroll Beach with him working in Racine and the boys going to, you know, Southport School. So I, I first thing I said to my sister, that's odd. So, um, and Racine, for the benefit of those who maybe aren't oriented to north-south, Racine is actually north of Kenosha, Correct. north of that location. Correct. And he was coming from the south and heading north when you right. saw him. At there's 90. no grocery stores. There's no gas stations. There's nothing there. It's just um, some residences. There's a lot more now these days. Um, but, yeah, there is really nothing there. And that was somewhere around 925 to 930 in the morning? Correct. Now, what's the next thing you remember happening on December 3rd, 1998? So um, in the afternoon, I was home, and I heard a siren. Then I heard another siren, then another siren, a couple more sirens, and I'm like, what is going on? And I was waiting for Carrie Ashley to drop something off at my house, and she hadn't stopped yet. She was late, and the sirens were stopping right in front of her house and Julie's house. They, their houses face each, face each other, and their driveways face each other. And I looked at my sister, I go, I need to walk over there and see what's going on because it's unusual for Carrie to not have stopped and there's all these sirens so she said I think you're right I'll walk with you so um, and about what time was that that I can't remember I want to say I don't believe my boys were home from school yet so 
I think it was before school was let out, but. So what happened next then? So um, we walk over there, and again, we saw there was a fire truck, there was a fire rescue vehicle, police cars. I think there was an ambulance, but a lot of activity. Um, so what happened then? What, what, if anything, did you do after observing all of this? And where were you when you observed all of this? So I was across the street standing in Carrie Ashley's yard. And I was concerned because I thought, I don't know why, but in my mind I'm thinking fire because the fire truck's right out front. And in my mind I'm thinking, wow, did they have a fire? Do, you know, my house is just right around the corner. Do they need to temporarily come to my house? You know, can I help? I'm a friend. So I walked up to a police officer and I just basically said, um, is there any way I can help? I'm, I'm Julie's friend. You know, if there's any kind of a fire, she can come to my house. And, um, you know, they're willing to stay there. Just let me know how I, if there's anything I can do. And he looked at me and said, I'm sorry she didn't make it. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, I'm sorry she didn't make it. I'm like, <laughs> you don't expect to hear that. You know, that's the last thing you expect to hear when you're thinking you're going over to see a friend. Can you continue now? Pardon. It was just shocking. How old was Julie? Um, 40. And how old were you at that time? 36. And it just broke my heart. I mean, I was a young mother with two young boys. She was a young mother with two young boys. And it just, it's like, how is this possible? How is she dead at 40 years old, a healthy woman dead? And, and all I could think of is her poor boys not having their mother. And I just, I, I, again, your mind is going in one direction and you hear something else and it's, it's just shocking. So after uh, hearing this terrible news, w what did you do then? So I went back home because there's nothing else to do. And then after being home for a while, then I walked back over. I tried mm -hmm. to get my composure because obviously I was devastated and upset. So um, we walked back over. When you say we walked, who's, who My all? sister walked over with me. And about what time was it that you came back the second time? It was... Not evening, but it was dusk. And what happened when you came back the second time? So, um, you know, I saw different neighbors. You know, nobody was talking to each other. It was a very somber, very upsetting situation. I mean, nobody was talking to anybody. It was just awful. Ted Voigt walked over, and then he left, you know, walked back home. Um, Jim Carrey came out stood five feet away. Again, nobody was talking to anybody. And I was standing on the edge, end of Carrie Ashley's um, driveway facing the house, and Mark was standing there. And Mark and I made eye contact. And Mark walked across the street to me, and I, I just looked at him. I said, my God, Mark, what happened? And he looks at me, and he had a cigarette in his hand, and he took a drag of a cigarette, put his head back, she's gone. And I'm like, what do you mean, what happened? And his gave me an explanation about she wasn't feeling good, she was on a prescribed medicine, she wasn't sleeping at night, she hadn't slept for two, three nights, can't remember how many he said, but he said a couple nights. So he wanted to get her some sleeping pills so he got her some sleeping pills that, so she could sleep. And he felt that the combination of the two medicines caused this to happen. What was Mark's demeanor uh, or emotional state as he was telling you these things? What was weird is I'm literally devastated. And his, he talked like it was just a conversation, just no feeling, no emotion, just kind of matter of fact. The, what he said to me kind of sounded rehearsed. It, it was just, 
It was, to me, it was very bizarre. Your Honor, she's conveying her impressions. There's nothing wrong with her conveying her impressions. We'll so. continue. Go ahead, but just move on to something else. Thank you. Um, now, you said you'd seen Julie a number of times in the final months of her life? Correct. And you knew her as a very close friend? Yes. Um, did you ever see any signs that Julie would consider suicide? <laughs> no. Objection, speculation. Well, the opening was pretty to the point what Ms. Renner said to this jury. Correct. So, I mean, this issue is wide open. So go ahead, Mr. Jamboy. Did you ever see any evidence that Julie Jensen was depressed or that she was contemplating suicide? No, never. Julie loved her sons. She lived for her sons. They, she adored her boys. She, she would never, ever do anything like that. As you're sitting here today, is there any doubt in your mind as to how Julie Jensen died? No. And it wasn't suicide? It was not a suicide. Objection, move to strike. We're going to strike that answer. Well, in your estimation, in your opinion, do you have an opinion after knowing Julie for several years, spending time at her house, spending time with her and her children? Judge, I'm going to move to strike. It's going to be stricken. We're not going to get into her One moment, opinion. Then. She's not an expert. She talked about that she wasn't suicidal. I'll allow all that. But we're not going to have witnesses say it's not suicide. This witness. Thank you, Your Honor. So let's move on. After Julie's death, do you remember, which occurred on a Thursday, is that right? I thought it was a Wednesday, but again, it's okay. that was 26 years ago. Uh, tw 24 years. 24 ago. years ago. <laughs> My math is right. Um, did you attend Julie's wake? Yes. Um, do you remember when and where the wake was? What day of the week it was? The wake. I'm trying to think. I. I don't know if it was a. Uh, I don't. I don't know the day of the week. I really don't. So it was, a, but it was within days of her death. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't a long time. It was just within a, a few days. Correct. And um, when you went to the wake, did you go alone or did you go with some other people? No, I went with. Um, I believe I went with Carrie Ashley. And what happened? Can you tell us about what you remember about the wake? Yeah. So, um, you know, the line was you know, decently long. It was an open casket, and I was in line, I want to say, at least 20 minutes. And because of Mark's demeanor the day she died, I was watching him because I thought, again, his demeanor when she died was indifferent. So I was watching him to see how he was behaving. And he was literally standing five feet from her casket, laughing and joking with a group of men the entire time. And again, I thought, in my mind, that's extremely odd. He just lost his wife, the mother of his children, and he's acting like he's at a cocktail party. It was upsetting. Did you attend Julie's funeral? I did not because after I witnessed that, I, I was beyond upset and I'm like, I, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to watch that behavior. Thank you, Ms. Worrell. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. I'm just going to do the cross for the defense. I am, Judge. All right, if we could just save the attorney's name for the court reporter, who's okay. ever doing the cross? Attorney Bridget Krause. Go ahead. And Judge, I need to stand because I can't see the witness. Stand. Just to hold the microphone up, though. I don't know if the microphone's going to get up that, but. There's a hand I can slide over, too. Sure. We could switch seats if you want. Can you see the witness now? I can. Thank you, Judge. Go ahead. We don't, we're not using that. 
Okay. Ms. Forwald, you said you know Julie Jensen since 1991? Correct. You were a neighbor? Correct. You lived behind her? Correct. Your backyards were? Kitty corner. Kitty corner. So not right behind her? Correct. And you said during the time that you met her in 1991, it was as a neighbor? Yes. And that relationship changed as you had more contact with each other? Yes. You had children that were similar ages? Yes. Similar interests? Yes. And you started a book club? Yes. And when you started this book club, you testified that you asked Julie Jensen to join it? Yes, she was the first person I actually asked. Um, and after you asked Julie, other members of the neighborhood joined this book club? Yes. And it'd be fair to say that the purpose of a book club is to talk about books? Yes. And that's what your book club did? Yes. You would pick a book the meeting before, and then when you came to that book club, you would talk about books? Yes. Some people, book clubs become wine clubs, but for you, you guys really talked about the books that you had picked. Yeah, the first hour would always be social. So, you know, catching up, what's going on, what are your kids doing, are you traveling, any trips, what's going on with their school. And then the second part would be discussing the book. So I want to talk about that social hour that you just mentioned. During the social hour, did Julie Jensen mention that she had received treatment for depression? Not to me. Did Julie Jensen mention that she had had an affair on her husband? I heard about that. Um, yes, I did hear about that, but it wasn't discussed at a book club. So I'm talking specifically about that one hour of social time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did Julie Jensen tell you that she had filed for divorce on her husband? No. Or that she was unhappy? No. Now, you talked a little bit about that December 3rd date, so I want to take you back to that date, okay? Um, you said you spoke to law enforcement officers on that day when you first went over to the Jensen's house. Correct. After Julie Jensen passed away, you didn't speak to law enforcement officers again. Correct. You didn't call the Pleasant Prairie Police Department with any concerns that you had? They, no. You didn't call the Pleasant Prairie Pleasant Prairie Police Department after the funeral about any concerns you had? No, because I heard they were already involved, so there was nothing to call. Ma'am, I understand that, but I'm asking you very specific questions. And you didn't call the Pleasant Prairie Police Department about any observations you made at the funeral? No, again, they were already involved, so I didn't. And ma'am, you knew they were involved and you knew they were investigating? Well, yeah, that's... And job. even knowing that, you didn't contact them about any of this information that you provided to this jury today. Well, I know it took, I believe, three years to determine cause of death. Ma'am, did you contact the Pleasant Prairie Police Department at any point when you knew they were investigating the death of Julie Jensen? I did not. The first time you spoke to someone in this case was the prosecution. After they determined cause of death, then I did. The first time you spoke to someone in this case was the prosecution. Objection, Your Honor. I object to the wit to the uh, attorney interrupting the witness's answer. I agree. Let her finish the answer. If you want to object, I'll make a ruling. So. Judge, I don't want to keep moving to strike because she's not actually answering the question. I mean, I can do that, but it doesn't make any sense. But I don't want you interrupting witnesses either. That's fine. So are we on the same page? Absolutely. Thank you. Go so ahead. So I would move to strike her last answer as unresponsive. Objection. Uh, the answer was not unresponsive. I agree. She could not finish it. So ask the question again, and we'll see what it is. Thank you, Judge. The first time you spoke to anyone in this case was the prosecution. That is correct. And that was after Mr. Jensen had been charged. I, I can't say if it was after his charge. It was after it came out, her cause of death. And after... Um, before you actually spoke to the prosecution, you had talked to a number of neighbors. Correct. Um, about what they heard or what they had been told. Correct. And that was prior to you talking to the prosecution? Well, yeah, it was three years. <laughs> and probably after you talked to the prosecution. We're all friends and neighbors. So you continued to talk about what you had heard or what you had observed? Well, in all honesty, we really all wanted to forget that day and what went on because that's not a pleasant memory. Every, I mean, nobody wants to keep all of that 
inside them because it's not fun to talk about. We lost a friend, so it wasn't like we were constantly talking about it. We actually didn't talk about it a lot. So after 2002, you didn't talk to any of your friends or neighbors about Julie Jensen's death? If it would have been very rarely that we would have talked about it. Okay. So you did talk about it? Again, it, sure. I want to talk to you a little bit about the funeral. Mm -hmm. You said that you were in line for about 20 minutes. The wake. Thank you, the wake, the visitation. Yes. Um, you were in line for approximately 20 minutes. Correct. And while you were in line, you saw Mr. Jensen. Yes. And he was standing in like the receiving line that people, the family members stand in at the end of the casket. Yeah, he was on the other side of her casket, like I said, about five feet away. And generally when people go through a receiving line, they stop and talk to the family and then they either leave or they stay for the service. Normally, yes. Um, and he was at the end of that line, or he was at the end of the line that viewed um, Julie Jensen. I think he was the first person. I don't, I'm, but he was, like I said, literally about five feet away. That was a terrible question. That's not what I meant. I didn't mean he was at the end of the person line. I meant he was at the end of the, after viewing Ms. Jensen, he was after that. Correct. Um, and he would be talking to people. My observation was there was a group of friends, and he was talking to them for a considerable amount of time, so it wasn't a constant flow of people. And again, that's my observation. Did you know who those individuals were? I did not. Did you know if they were friends of Julie Jensen? I, I did not know the people. You didn't know if they were family members of Julie Jensen? The family members that I knew, that wasn't them. But you don't know if they were family members of Julie Jensen? No. You don't know what that conversation was. Correct. You don't know if people were telling stories about how they knew her, about things that they did with her. I have no her. idea what was being said. You don't know if they were telling funny anecdotes about things that may have happened in her life. Right, that is when correct. When she was a child, you don't know any of that information. I do not, nope. You also know that many people consider a visitation or a funeral a celebration of life. Yes, it can. A time to talk and reminisce about the person that has passed away. Yep, that's possible. The yep. loved one. Right. You weren't with the family prior to the visitation. I was not. You weren't involved in any service with a pastor prior to the visitation. Nope. You weren't involved um, with anything that happened after the visitation with a pastor or with family. Correct. What you observed was that 20 minutes that you were standing in line. Yes. And as you yourself testified, you were watching him because you didn't like the way that he responded or the way he, his demeanor on December 3rd. Correct. I want to go back to December 3rd, Ms. Forward. You said that you had been at the residence and then you left the residence. Correct. And then after a while, you walked back over there. Yes. And when you walked back over there, that's when you observed Mark Jensen across the street. Yes. He didn't turn his back and walk back into the house? After we talked, I went home. Prior to him walking across the street, once you guys had made eye contact, he didn't turn his back on you and walk into the house? No, he crossed he the street. He came over to talk to you? Correct. To talk to the other neighbors that were there? I, I don't know who else he talked to. I know he talked to me because. Were other neighbors around you? Behind me. I don't know if they could hear. So he actually walked across because he saw you making eye contact with him and he knew you were Julie's friend. Objection. Calls for speculation as to why the defendant walked across. This witness only knows what he did, not why he did it. Sustained. You made eye contact with Mr. Jensen? Yes. And at that point he walked across the street? Yes and he talked to you? Correct. And he knew you were Julie's friend? Yes. And when he talked to you, you asked him what had happened? I did. And he responded to what he had did. happened? You weren't in the home immediately after Mr. Jensen found Ms. Jensen? No. You don't know how he reacted to finding Ms. Jensen? Correct. You don't know how he responded to paramedics or law enforcement that initially saw him? Correct, I did not.
You testified about a couple of photos that we saw up yep. on the screen. Yes. One was of Julie Jensen on a bike with mm -hmm. her boys. Yep. And the other one was them with a view of the lake. Correct. You didn't take those pictures. No, I took the one of the bowling party. You weren't the one on that bike ride with them. I was not. You weren't on the one um, in viewing the lake with them. No. When you saw these bike rides, Mr. Jensen was also involved. He's probably the one that took the photo. Probably the one that took the photo. Because he was also actively involved with his boys. Right. Actively involved with his family. Yes. One second, please, Judge. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Any uh, redirect, Mr. Jamboy? Um, no redirect, Your Honor. All right, Thank you're you, excused, ma'am. Thank you. Say we call Sharon Krause. And how long is this witness going to take? Short. I will hold you to that. I'll be very short. I can't guarantee what she'll do. 37, Your Honor. Thank you. You just raise your right hand, I'll swear you in before you have a seat, okay? You solemnly swear the testimony is matter. Be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll help you God. The witness said, I do. Try to get as close as you can to the microphone. Spell your first and last name for the court reporter. Sharon Krause. And spell it, please. Yes, S-H-A-R-O-N-K-R-A-U-S-E. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Jamboy. Good morning, Ms. Krause. Um, can you tell the jury, um, uh, do you know Ruth Vorwald? Yes, I do. She's my sister. And you remember visiting your sister on December 2nd and December 3rd, 1998? Yes. Do you remember uh, where you were? Um, can you tell us what you can remember about the morning of December 3rd, 1998? Sure. We got up and she got the boys off to school. She said we're going for a walk at 9. We ate, I like to have my coffee, and she wanted to get going. She's very prompt on her scheduling, so we went for a walk. And do you remember um, what, if anything, you saw while you were on your walk with your sister? Uh, we were walking on Lakeshore Drive past Mark and Julie Jensen's home, and we got uh, maybe half a mile, a mile away, and she said, oh, here comes Mark. That's weird. And about what time was it that uh, you and she saw Mark? 9.30. Approximately. Okay. And um, do you remember anything else about uh, December 3rd, 1998, when you were visiting with your sister? I was downstairs. We were going to go have dinner. Ruth was upstairs getting ready. I saw flashing lights behind her house. I went to the stairway, yelled up. I said, Ruth, there's something going on behind your house. There's a lot of red lights. She came down. What happened next? Uh, we took a walk over, and because she said, that's Mark and Julie Jensen's house. And so we walked over there, and there was a police officer standing there. She asked him apparently what happened, but I didn't hear what he said. And then she started crying, and Mark Jensen, she said, here comes Mark. And he came So over. do you remember how much time elapsed between the point where she heard, um, where she started crying and the point where uh, you saw Mark come across? It was very soon after. Um, so... Tell us what you can remember what happened about uh, Mark coming across. He came and approached Ruth. I was standing on her side, and she said, what happened, Mark? And tell us how Mark responded. He took a puff on his cigarette. He blew it in the air. He looked at her and said, she's gone. And she said, what do you mean, she's gone? And he said she hadn't been feeling well. 
and um, she hadn't been sleeping, and he called the doctor and got her sleeping pills. And um, what was your impression of Mark's uh, demeanor as he was providing this information? There was no emotion. There was, he was like he was, had known exactly what he was going to say. It, it, I had a bad feeling. Thank you. Nothing further. Uh, Cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. And just to be clear, Ms. Krause, you and I are not related. My name is Bridget Krause. Oh. No, we're not. You uh, said that you saw Mark Jensen's car about 9.30 a.m. Correct. And that was as you were walking with your sister. Correct. You didn't follow that car. No. You didn't see where that car went. He was heading the opposite direction towards his home. So you guys were heading southbound and he Correct. was heading northbound. Correct. So you don't actually see what, didn't actually see whether he stopped at his home. No. Ma'am, you'd never met Mark Jensen before. No. You didn't know his general demeanor? No. Didn't know his general style of no. talk? There no. are people that are pretty matter-of-fact talkers. Okay. Would that be fair to say? Have yes. you ever met someone like mm -hmm. that in your life? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you didn't have it. She said, mm-hmm. Can you say oh, yes just so the yes. court reporter? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, and as you just said, you had never met him prior to that time that he walked over to talk to your sister. No, I have not. And just so that I understand your testimony, you heard the sirens and then told your sister about it. I saw the lights, red lights flashing behind her house. Red lights flashing behind your sister's house. Yes, correct. And then you told your sister. Yes. And you two walked over there. Correct. And once you walked over there, your sister had some type of conversation with like a police officer or law enforcement. Correct. Yes. And then after your sister had that conversation with law enforcement, shortly thereafter is when Mr. Jensen came over and spoke to your sister. Yes. And it'd be fair to say that you weren't in the Jensen house at the time Mr. Jensen found his wife. No. You don't know how his demeanor was at that point. No. You don't know how he reacted. No. You weren't um, in the Jensen house when EMTs arrived and told Mr. Jensen that his wife was gone. No. You don't know how he reacted. No. I have no further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Any redirect from the state? Um, have you, in the course of your lifetime, uh, been in the vicinity of somebody who had just suffered a terrible, horrible loss? Yes. And have you noticed the na manner in which those people tended to respond? Yes. Sad, dreadful, questioning what happened. A strong emotional response? Very strong, yep. Did you see I've any, experienced it. Did you see any evidence of that in Mark Jensen? No. Nothing further. Any recross on that? Very quickly. Again, ma'am, you weren't in the home when Mark Jensen found um, out that his wife had passed. Objection yeah. asked and answered. Yeah, but you went into it again, so she can ask it. And ma'am, you weren't present when he spoke to his pastor at the home that night? No. Thank you. All right, you're excused. Thank you for coming. Have a good day. Very close to the lunch hour, Mr. Jamboy. Oh, yeah, Your Honor, we don't have a witness. It'll Thank take you. two minutes. Okay, folks, uh, be back by 115, okay? Please don't talk about the case. Have a good lunch. We'll see you at 115.
All right, we're back on the record on uh, Mark Jensen's case. The uh, jury is back in the courtroom. The state is continuing with their case in chief. Who's the next witness for the state? The state calls Therese DeFazio. All right, let's have her come up. For the record, it's number 13 on your uh, list, correct? Correct. Thank you. Yes, I can, can. What about you? Um, would you would you prefer to sit over here? Um, so I'm staring first. So okay, okay, thank you. But I can see her. I can see her no matter where you sit. So you yes, can come up here by the witness stand. I can see her on corners. Remain standing. Raise your right hand. I'll swear you in. He saw me swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Can you have a seat? Get as close as you can to the microphone and spell your first and last name for the reporter. Therese, T-H-E-R-E-S-E, DeBazio, capital D-E, capital F-A-A-Z-I-O. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Ms. McNeil. Ms. DeFazio, in 1998, where did you work? I worked at Southport Elementary School. Were you a teacher there? Yes. What grade did you teach? I taught third grade at that time. And um, how long did you work at Southport Elementary School? Oh, over 20 years. Are you retired now? Yes. And when did you retire? T June of 2013. Okay, so I just have a couple of questions about the school first. Back in 1998, when did school start? It started a little bit before 8 o'clock. So in the morning time, it would yes. be a little bit before 8 o'clock? Yeah. 
Um, and do you know what time school would end typically? It's around between 2.30 and quarter to 3, I think, at that time. So if there weren't after-school activities, that's when the students would generally be let out? Yes. And then in terms of the beginning of the school year, when did school start at the beginning of the school year? Well, that year Labor Day was late, so we had to start before Labor Day. Labor Day was the 7th of September. So we started, uh, I believe it was September 1st, and we had an open house the night before. I'm not positive of those dates, but I'm pretty sure that's it. So early September. Yeah. Um, and so back in 1998, before the start of the school year, was there an open house? Yes, the night before school started. At that open house, did you meet a person by the name of Julie Jensen? Yes, Julie Jensen was there. Her son was in my class, David. And she came up to me and, and volunteered to be a room mother. And I had a couple room mothers that year. Um, and you said her child was named David Jensen? Yes, it was. And so how old are third graders? About eight. Or it could, some of them could be a little bit closer to nine, but he was eight at the time. So eight turning into nine is third grade? Right. Um, and so when you met Julie Jensen um, at that open house, did she volunteer to be a room mother? Yes. She wanted to help me out, so I asked her what kind of skills or things she'd be interested in to help with. Uh, my first question to her was, can you come and work in the computer lab with me? Because at that time, that was a brand new thing to have uh, computers in school. And she says, oh, no, I can't do that. So then I questioned her some more about what she could do. And she's, uh, she helped me out uh, then later on in the tutoring kids in the classroom. OK, so let me go back to that conversation then. Um, so is that something that you generally do with room mothers, figure out the ways they can help you? Right, because you, uh, you, you don't know the people right then. Yet they're first time coming to meet you, too. So uh, you have to find out what their interests are. And, and she was real happy to come and help me. She just uh, couldn't, she says, help me in the computer lab unless uh, I could have somebody open up the program for her. She says, and I can type. All right. Did she say anything about turning on a computer? Oh, she said, I can't even turn on a computer. Uh, she said, my son David helps me. He turns it. We got a new IBM at home, she said. And uh, I have to ask David to come and teach me. And uh, later on in the year, I found out more about how she, little she knew. Um, and did she describe any ability to type? Yes, she could type. She says, but I only type 35 words a minute. And I says, oh. That's how many I do. That's how I remembered it because we both only were slow typers. Um, and now, when you're talking to Julie Jensen about being a room mother, did you have any idea whether she had done this in the past for other grades for David, or did you not know? At that point, when I met her, I did not know. And did you find out more information about that later? No, I didn't. So you're interviewing her to see what she might be helpful with, right? Now, um, as, as you met Julie Jensen, can you just describe for us um, your impression of her, how she looked physically? When I met her, she was, she's a petite woman, uh, blonde hair, and a uh, very sweet person, very gentle person, soft-spoken. And so um, did you, Julie Jensen, in fact, work in your room as a room mother that year? Yes, she did. She came in at about 9 o'clock. She was always on time at 9 o'clock. She would be there and stay until 11 because then she had to go and pick up her three-year-old, Dougie, at the time. Doug is David's younger brother at uh, daycare, or it's like a preschool daycare. And um, she would work with me from 9 until 10.30. At 10.30, our um, music teacher would come in and teach, so that would give us time to go to do some things in the, our, what we call the side room to the classroom, and she could help me do some uh, more things, and that's basically what she helped me with. Now, was this on a set day of the week? Yeah, every Wednesday. So Wednesdays, 9 to 11? Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, um, was Julie generally on time? Oh, well, she was always punctual. So when she didn't show up one Wednesday, I had to ask how she was doing. Her son told me. So um, before December mm -hmm. of 1998, did she show up every Wednesday? Yes, every single Wednesday. 
Um, and can you just tell us your interactions with her over these weeks working with the students? What did you observe? Uh, she was very good with the kids with math and listened to kids read. She was very, uh, very good at all of that. And um, then at 1030, we would go into the side room and she'd help me with either doing some filing or correcting some papers, cutting out things like that. And she, she was uh, very efficient. And did she help out students her, who were not her son? Oh, yes, yes. Um, any student who needed her help when they came in. Now, in terms of David, how would you describe him as a student? He was an excellent student, and he had straight A's. He was just really smart. And he uh, also was um, uh, kind of shy at that age. He was a little bit shy. So on these Wednesdays, once it got to be 1030, um, how would your class change? They would stay in the room, and we'd go to this side room, which had a glass wall that we could see through to the classroom. While the music teacher would be teaching, she was in there with me. And um, while we were correcting papers and things, she'd tell me, ask me questions about raising sons, because I had two sons. Mine were much older, though. They were in high school and college. But she liked to talk about, you know, the boys, like I would with my friends when I was raising my kids, you share knowledge and information about how to raise sons. Um, and so you and Julie are uh, not in the classroom anymore. You're off to the side? Right. Um, and so that gives you time to talk about other topics not yes. in the class? Is that correct? It's correct. Um, and so you're describing one of these conversations about um, talking about raising boys, is that yes. correct? Um, and so did Julie have any specific questions about that that you can recall? Uh, I don't recall the specific questions. It's mostly about, you know, uh, getting them into uh, sports, music, things like that, you know, uh, college for the future, how do you save up for college, and things like that. Otherwise, I don't remember anything else. And did she seem to be thinking about uh, David's future education? She, yes, she wanted to, but I don't recall details about that. And is that when you talked about college? Yes, we mentioned college, yeah, because one of my sons was in college. Now, at some point, did uh, Ms. Jensen talk to you about recognizing your name? Yes. One time she... She was kind of hesitant to ask me, but she says, do you have a brother-in-law that uh, is named Paul DeFazio? And I says, yes, that's my brother-in-law. And so why did she bring that up based on what she said? Basically, she was curious because we had the same last name. And then um, I says, well, yes, Paul is a psychotherapist. And she said, uh, oh, I went to, I'm going to see him for marriage counseling. Um, so she talked about having seen what she learned was your brother-in-law. Right. And what did she say that she saw him for? For marriage counseling. She said that uh, she sheepishly told me that she had an affair. Uh, she says it was like a one-night stand sort of thing. She says that she regretted it right as soon as she had done it. But she um, she talked to her, her husband about it and said... Um, she wanted to divorce, or he wanted a divorce. I don't remember who wanted a divorce, but they were thinking about divorce. And she said, um, oh, well, let's try marriage counseling first. So that's why they're trying to save their marriage through marriage counseling. Now, this is a topic that is fairly sensitive, talking to someone about an affair and marriage counseling. So was that surprising to you, given your relationship with Julie Jensen at that time? Well, I been seeing her every Wednesday since September, and uh, parents usually do confide in me and things. Uh, they, they really feel that the teacher is somebody they can trust, usually, and so they can talk to us about family life or anything. You know, they just open up. And so other parents have talked to you about detailed family life? Yes. Oh, yeah. Over the years, many times. Now, did Ms. Jensen tell you anything at all about how her husband reacted or treated her after the affair? 
She said that um, he was watching everything she did and um, asking her where she was going, when she'd go out, uh, what time she'd be back. He says She says a lot more than he would normally. He was being very controlling over where she went and what she did. And did she describe anything um, where she believed that her husband was critical of her? She said, I, this happened later on about um, conversation we were having one Wednesday. Um, she said that, um, she, I'm trying to think, um, before conferences she was talking to me about, uh, she was worried about the conferences that were coming up on November 18th. And so we had a conversation about that, and she said um, she wanted to know what I was going to bring up. And I said, well, you know your son. He's a wonderful kid. He's just great. But she's, I was going to bring up something about David having ticks and eye ticks. And I know that she didn't want me to bring that up because she said um, he'll be very, um, he'd yell at me. That's how she said it. He'll yell at me if, if you bring that up. And so he, meaning her husband, right? Yes. Um, and so this was something, you said, a conversation that occurred leading up to the time of conferences? Right. It was the Wednesday before conferences. And in terms of these uh, facial tics, what do you mean by that for David? His eye would have like a tick in it, you know, blink in uh, and I don't know. I can't remember how to explain that. I mean, it's just the eye is bouncing around a little bit, you know, the eyelid. And so this was important enough to you that you brought it up with Ms. Jensen? Well, I only brought it up because she was so worried about conferences coming up. And this was something that you were going to say at the conference? Right. And the expectation would be that uh, Julie would be there, but also Mark Jensen? Yes. And. When Julie was describing to you her concerns about this conference, had she talked about a prior conference she had attended about David? She said when he was, David was in second grade, that conference was fine. They went to the conference. She says he sat there quiet, Mark sat there quietly and, and they had a conversation with the teacher. But she says when we got home, he yelled at me and told me I'm a terrible mother and I don't take care of the kids. And, and I says, well, isn't David a straight-A student in second grade? She says, oh, yeah, he, he's a good student. But he would nitpick and find some little thing that he'd bring up that came up at the conference and would just yell at her. And so then how did that cause you to react when this conference actually happened? Well, when we had the conference, it was November 18th, um, I was careful in how I approached anything. I tried to be as positive as I could, which was easy because David was a wonderful student and no behavioral problems. And then I just kind of gently brought the conversation around to the, the eye ticks and said, I think you should take him to a doctor and find out why he's having those eye ticks. I says, I'm not a doctor and you need to have a professional take a look at him. And you said that was November 18th of 1998. Is that yes. accurate? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and so then, was that a Wednesday, do you recall? Yes, that was. And so then the next time you would have seen Julie Jensen, is that the, the next week? Yes, on November 25th. She came at a, in at a regular time. And at that time, were you particularly interested in how the conference had went for her at home? Right. I asked her, I says, so when you got home, did you get yelled at or did everything go fine? She says, well, he told me I can call the doctor after... I pestered him several times, she says, about the doctor. She, he finally admitted, yes, you can go and call the doctor. But then he wouldn't speak to me at all. She said he would just ignore me, pretend I wasn't there. And when you were talking to Julie Jensen on November 25th, did you make any observations about her demeanor? Yes. Um, we went into the side room at about 1030. She'd been doing fine all morning, and then... We brought him into the um, side, her into the side room, and I said, um, "Is something bothering you?" And uh, she was kind of like doing this with her hands. I says, "Come on, tell me what's the matter." She so I don't think I should tell you. She goes, and I said, "Well, when you're ready, 
I'm here for you, I'll listen. And so you made that uh, gesture with your hands. Would you describe that as hand wringing? Yes. Um, and so then at that point, um, she hesitated to tell you anything? She was hesitating, but then after I said to her that uh, when you're ready to talk to me, that's fine. If you want me, I'm here. And she, she thought for a few seconds, and she says, well, I'd like to tell you something. I think my husband was going to kill me last weekend. And I looked at her surprised. I said, that's not something you hear from a parent. And I said, you, I repeated, I said, you said what? And she said that he was going to kill me. I said, you know what, we better have this conversation down in privacy in the teacher's lounge because I didn't know if anybody could hear us from the side room. So we proceeded down to the, the lounge in the teacher's lounge to talk about it. Just more privately? Yes. All right, so when you got to the teacher's lounge, describe that conversation for us. Well, she said that um, she found some notes uh, next to him. She was cleaning the house, and she cleaned in his room and his desk area there, and she found some notes there that had list, like a grocery list. It had things like, um, uh, she said, it had drugs, uh, syringes, I think it even said needles, um, on a, like a grocery list. And um, I said, are you sure that he, those are his notes? She said, yes. So now, if I can follow up on that, mm -hmm. um, did she describe how she came across this list? It was sitting right next to his computer, and she was cleaning the room. Um, and so she brought that up to you as something that caused her concern? Yes. Okay. Because she said he never took drugs, so she didn't, and she wasn't uh, thinking he ever needed a syringe or a needle or anything. So she was, cousin, she just couldn't understand why that note was there. Um, and when you're having this conversation with her, did she say anything else about the computer? They, whenever she'd come into the room and he was on the computer, he'd either turn the screen or turn it off and wouldn't let her see what he was doing. And she asked him once, well, what, why are you always turning off the computer? And you'd say, well, I'm, I'm done with my work for today. And again, this is on the topic of things she saw that she thought were concerning. Yes. Um, and so when Ms. Jensen is talking to you about this list, which has drugs on it, did she say anything about what that made her think? She th was worried that he was going to try and kill her with an overdose of some kind of drug. Um, and what were your thoughts when you heard this? I said to her, you know, if you're in danger and you're feeling you're going to have something happen to you, you need to tell someone in authority. So first of all, I said, you need to call the police. She's in Pleasant Prairie, so I said, you need to call the Pleasant Prairie police. She says, oh, I've already done that. I've talked to someone over there. And then I says, well, and I picked up the phone book and I said, you know, we should look up Women's Horizons. I says, um, they can help you, too. If you feel that you're in danger with him, you need to go to Women's Horizons and get some help. And she said, uh, I have to be here for my boys. She says, I'm not going to leave my boys. And I said, well, you can take your children to Women's Horizons. And she says, oh, no, I can't. Uh, he knows a lot of people in this town. And she says, he'd find me. And he'd probably tell everybody that uh, I was crazy and uh, my kids would be taken away from me. Now, before we move past this list, um, did Julie ever describe to you when talking about this list um, an incident where her husband was offering her something to eat or drink? Yes, he brought her some something to drink one day, and she says, I wouldn't take it. She says, since I saw those notes, I have been... Uh, eating out of anything that I pick up or I have made or I go out to eat. She says, I have not taken anything from him because I'm afraid he's going to put something, like if there is a poison or something, into a drink. And, and she didn't want to take that chance. And so when you're talking to her about getting help and offering her various options, what did she say she was going to do? 
She says, I'm going to get a plan. I'm working on one right now. She says, uh, I'm trying to get a place in Illinois. A friend has said he'd give me a, get me a place in Illinois where I can hide out. I can take the boys with me. She says, I've told the police about it. Uh, I'm trying to get a job. So that, but she says, kind of difficult because Dougie's only just turning three, and she wanted to get um, him into our. We have a at South Park. We had a um, special classroom for preschool, and he could be a peer helper for children who were, had special needs in that classroom. But she hadn't gotten to that yet. She was about to. Uh, she also had been looking for jobs, but she says because Dougie was only in this preschool daycare for a couple hours, two and a half hours in the morning. She says that nobody's going to hire me for something like that. So she was not sure what she could do with that, but she was going to try. And um, Okay, so she wasn't rejecting help or saying she was going to do nothing. She just described a different way of doing it. Yeah, different way of doing it. Now, when you're hearing this conversation with Ms. Jensen, um, what did you do um, uh, after hearing these things? Well, it would keep, we were finishing up our conversation about 11 o'clock. I had to get back to my classroom because the music teacher was in there and leaves at 11. She had to go pick up Dougie. So I looked her straight in the eye and held onto her shoulders and I says, Julie, you need to get some help, and if you need any help, you need to call right away to get it. It could be Women's Horizons. It could be your police officer you talk to. I says, but you need to get some help. And she says, I will. I'm getting my plan in, in, together. I'm going to be ready in another week or two. I'll be ready to go. And so then I told her, well, she asked me not to tell anyone. I says, but I have to tell my principal this. I can't keep a secret like this. So um, right up it, after I went back to my classroom, lunch came around about 40 minutes later. I went to the principal and told her what happened. And... Um, so we both knew about it. Now, when you're having this converse, conversation about Ms. Jensen's fear about her husband killing her, um, was the idea of suicide ever brought up? She never mentioned suicide, no. And did she ever say anything to you about whether she would commit suicide? Oh, she said to me that she was doing all of this to protect her, her relationship with her kids because she said... I would never leave my children. And she said, I, um, I got this plan going so I can take my children. If I don't have a plan, she said, he will just make sure that he gets a good lawyer to say that I'm crazy and I will not get my kids or even visitation rights. And so did Ms. Jensen ever specifically deny to you that she would commit suicide? Well, I never asked her about suicide at all. We never talked about suicide. Now, to go back to the discussion about counseling that yeah. Ms. Jensen had told you about, did she ever say anything about what her husband had said about her in counseling? He said, she told me that whenever they went to counseling, Mark would tell lies to the counselor, the psychotherapist it is. So she would tell, he, she said that she would tell what was going on, he'd make up lies and tell lies all the time about her to make her look like she was had a mental problem. And so when Ms. Jensen is describing her current concern about leaving her husband, mm -hmm. um, was it similar to that, that she was afraid her husband would make up lies about her? Yes. Now, did Ms. Jensen specifically say to you regarding the concerns about her husband making her overdose, did she ever say to you that she was concerned that he would make it look like a suicide? Yes, that's what she thought. That's why she didn't want to drink anything. She thought for sure he was trying to get her to drink some kind of drug or poison that would kill her. And did Ms. Jensen express concern about if she looked crazy, her children being taken away? 
Yes, if she if if he made a good uh, argument about her being crazy, he was also going to go pursue that she'd never see her kids again. He would make sure that she didn't, couldn't even be visited, come to visit the kids, because he um, he was going to make her look like she wasn't capable of being with the children. Now, did she say anything about um, whether she would ever leave her children? She said she'd never leave her kids. That's why she didn't want to go to Women's Horizons in the first place. Um, even though I told her that the children could go with her, she said, it's not safe. He will find me there. I have to go someplace where I can really hide out. Now, when Ms. Jensen, during this conversation, when she talked to you about this list of items, including the drugs and the syringe, did she ever tell you whether she gave that information to anybody else? Objection yes. Uh, sustained. Judge, this is a statement of Ms. Jensen and whether she gave the information to somebody else. Well, this witness doesn't know. Well, I'm... You call that other witness, then. So... So, Ms. DeFazio, I am asking you whether Ms. Jensen ever said anything to you about giving this list to someone else. Yes, she said she gave it, put it in an envelope and gave it to our neighbor. And I don't know which neighbor she didn't tell me. She said neighbor. A neighbor. Now, this is all occurring on November 25th of 1998, this yes. conversation? Is that correct? Yes. That's the last time I saw her alive. So the next Wednesday, would that have been December 2nd of 1998? Yes, it would be. And that Wednesday, were you expecting Ms. Jensen to be in your classroom at 9 a.m.? Yes. And since it was a little after 9 and she was punctual, uh, I said to David, is your mom coming today? And he said, oh, I forgot to give you a note. So he brought up the note, and it said, sorry, I can't come today. I'm sick. Uh, can David go walking home with his friend Eric Shore uh, instead of taking the bus tonight? And I said, uh, and it said she was sick. So I said to David, I said, David, it says here that she's sick. I says, what, is, what kind of sickness does she have? And he says, She's coughing really hard, and my dad won't let me go into. Sorry, ma'am. I'm going to move to strike. This is hearsay. I'm going to strike that answer. Um, so, judge is a statement of a child about his mother's condition. Oh, we didn't get it. You didn't lay that foundation like that. She just made the statements. So, um, if you want to start over? I'll let you start over. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. DeFazio, once you read the letter and it said something about Julie being sick, um, did you then talk to David? Yes. And when you were talking to David, um, was he expressing concern about his mother? Yes. She was coughing so hard. He wanted to go and say goodbye to her before school started. And I still move to strike his hearsay. Well, I believe the foundation is laid about David Jensen expressing concern about his mother. Concerned. Go back in a jury room, folks. You can just stay there. You're fine. All right. The jury's outside the uh, courtroom. Go ahead, Ms. Crosby. But what's your objection now? My objection is that it's hearsay, and being concerned is not a exception to the hearsay rule. And they can call David Jensen, who can testify to what he said. Well, we know it's hearsay, so what's the exception? Um, so I believe it's an excited utterance because it's a description by a child of a significant medical condition of his mother, and this would have been within a couple hours of seeing her. Um, and under the law, there's a uh, greater latitude for statements by children being excited utterances. Um, commonly, it comes up in different kinds of cases, but I believe it would apply to this situation. Well, I know the exception excited utterance, but I didn't hear anything to 
tie that up as an excited utterance. I know it's a child that's talking to the teacher, but. Okay, so Judge, are you saying that if there's a more information about how David appeared or looked right. or was expressing this? Okay. So the, as of now, the objection is sustained. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bring him out. All right, for now, the uh, objection, objection has been sustained, so go ahead, Ms. McNeil. Did you make any observations about David when you were talking to him about his mother's condition that morning? Well, he's a little upset. He said, uh, um, I, Judge, want I still object as to what he said. <laughs> Same grounds. So, Ms. DeFazio, if you could just tell us what you mean by upset, just what you saw in his demeanor. He was worried that his mom was sick. Okay. And so um, when he was expressing this worry to you, what did he say about that? Objection, hearsay. I think that's sufficient. I'm going to sustain it. <clears throat> did David Jensen ever tell you anything that his father had said to him that morning? Objection hearsay. It's the statement by the defendant. Through Overruled. a different witness. What's that? Through a different witness, Judge. They can call David Jensen who can testify to that statement. Sustained. Now, that note that you have described indicating that Julie Jensen was sick, um, did it also say anything about uh, where David Jensen would be going that afternoon? Yes. Uh, it asked if David could go home with his friend Eric Shore and walk over to his house instead of taking the bus. And they have to have permission to do that because of, you know, liability, making sure the children are safe. So there has to be a note if a student is not going to their own home. Right. And uh, for David, the note was to go to his friend Eric Shore's house? That's correct. Now, is this something that was happened on every Wednesday that no. David? No, he never went with anyone else before. Okay, so that was an unusual part of the note as well? Yes. Now, I just have a few other questions about things that Julie said to you before that you learned that she died. Did Julie ever say to you whether she had expressed her concerns about Mark Jensen wanting to kill her to anybody else? She told a police officer. She said it was a friend of hers. Objection, Judge. This is Julie's statement, right? Right. All right, go ahead. Uh, she said she uh, told Lori, or I think her name is Laura, her sister-in-law. And uh, her sister-in-law told her that... Um, move to strike is hearsay. 
So right now the question is just who did Julie say that she told? So you've mentioned the police officer yeah. and her sister-in-law. Do you recall anybody else? And her friend, the neighbor. Now, finally, going back to this affair that Julie had, um, did she ever say anything about how her husband reacted to it? She said he was angry and and he just started being more controlling over her, wanting to know where she's going, what she's doing. Did she feel that he had ever forgiven her for the affair? I don't know if she said anything about that. Now, regarding that point, would it refresh your recollection to look at a, a prior statement that you made? No, I don't think so. So if you looked at something you said in the past, that would not refresh your recollection? No, because that was 25 years ago. It's, you know, it's written down that if I said he didn't forgive her, then that's true, but I have no recollection about that. Okay, so regarding your lack of recollection on that issue, um, I'm going to show you um, what is a statement from a prior hearing. Okay. Judge, I object. She just testified that it wouldn't refresh her memory. I agree. She of. just said it's not going to help her. So, Judge, um, if a witness testifies to lack of recollection, then the hearsay exception would be for the prior testimony of an unavailable witness. understand, but you just said it's not going to help her. Right, but this is not to refresh recollection. This is the prior statement of a witness who now cannot remember. So the You said it's not going to help her. So Let's move on. Now, Ms. DeFazio, this is what we've been talking about is December 2nd of 1998. Yes. And so um, did anything uh, in terms of the next couple of days, did you learn that Julie Jensen had died? Yes, I found out on December 4th, a Friday, right before school started. And do you recall how you found out? Um, Mrs. Ashley, Carrie Ashley, she came up to me. She's one of the parents in my room. Uh, and she came up to me and said, um, did you hear Julie died? There's a whole bunch of police around the house and, uh, and yellow caution tape, she said. And so when you had heard that, what was your reaction? Well, right away I thought, oh my God, what is going on here? I remembered our conversation about her saying that he was going to try to kill her. So I sent a note down to the principal. It was just, the bell had just rung to start school. So I sent a note down to the principal saying, I need to talk to a police officer right away. Did you hear Lou, Julie Jensen died? So she arranged for the officer Ratzberg to come in and uh, talk to me after she got somebody to watch my classroom. Um, and so is this something happening that very Friday? Yes. Um, and so after you spoke with Detective Ratzberg, um, did you also write something about what your recollections were? I did, but he told me to write a general summary because he had taken extensive notes and went through a lot of questioning. And my principal was there, too. She took extensive notes. Um, and uh, he said, I said to him when he asked me to write the summary, I says, well, do I have to write every single detail I just told you? And he says, no, just write a summary of this, of what you remember about the, um, what Julie has told you in your conversations and what she had said to you about the, um, uh, her feelings about her husband. And so that's what you did on December 4th of 1998. Is that accurate? That's right. I did it at home. Um, so, Judge, is it possible to take a break at this moment? How long do we need to take up outside the presence of the jury, Your Honor? How long do we need a break? Um, five minutes. Five minutes? You heard them, folks. Five minutes. We'll be back.
We're in recess. An evidentiary matter outside the presence of the jury. That's the reason that we needed a, the recess was so that the jury would be excused so we could have this legal discussion outside the presence of the jury. What, what are we going to argue about? Um, the issue was the court's ruling on the admissibility of, um, of the ability to have this witness testify about prior testimony or admit the prior testimony of this witness. I denied now, it. I know you did. And you We're denied the jury back. Judge, you denied it, but you didn't allow the state to make its argument. So your, your counsel made her argument. Your Honor, you, did, you denied your it. Your counsel made your argument. Bring the jury back. Your Honor, it's prior testimony. It's not a prior, it's not being offered to refresh a recollection. It's prior testimony. It's admissible under 908.045 of the Wisconsin statutes. This witness is unavailable on that particular issue. We deserve to be heard on this, Your Honor. It's a first degree murder case. We, we should be following the rules of evidence. The rules of evidence indicate this testimony is admissible. And it's an important part of this case. The jury probably could hear you yelling. Well, Your Honor, Please, the state is entitled to make an make argument your record. on evidentiary issues. Go ahead, make your record. Under 908.045, with stats, subparagraph, uh, I'm sorry, under 908.04, a witness is deemed to be unavailable if she testifies to a lack of memory on the subject matter of the, de of the declarant's statement. That is this, what this witness testified to. She does not remember this statement. She said looking at the statement would not refresh her recollection. So it's not available to refresh her recollection. However, she's an unavailable witness, as defined by Section 908.04 on this particular issue. And then when you look at 908.045, subparagraph 1, former testimony, the following are not excluded by the hearsay rule if the declarant is unavailable as a witness. Paragraph 1, former testimony, testimony given as a witness at another hearing of the same or a different proceeding at the instance of or against a party with an opportunity to develop the testimony by direct, cross, or redirect examination with motive and interest similar to those of the party whom now offered. That is exactly what we have here. It's her prior testimony on an issue that she's now said she no longer re recalls. Therefore, her prior testimony is admissible in this proceeding under 908.045, subparagraph 1. Want to say anything? I think the Please don't yell at me. I won't judge. I think the issue is that they were attempting to refresh this witness's memory and she advised everyone that that would not help. That's the concern is that the prosecution attempted to refresh. That's not the statute that was just discussed. Um, and this witness said, no, I'm sorry, that would not refresh my memory. If they want to impeach their witness with a prior inconsistent statement, that's different, but that's not what they attempted to do. Your Honor, counsel specifically indicated it's prior testimony. That's she. She indicated that she was offering this as prior testimony. Those are the words right out of her mouth. The words were, will this refresh your memory? Ms. DeFazio said, no, if I show you this testimony, it's not you were, you testified on this day, you gave this answer. That's not the question that was asked. It was, will this refresh your memory? And she said, no. Those are two separate sections of the hearsay. So and I, then after the witness had persisted in saying it would not refresh a recollection, then counsel, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, McNeil was going to ask her to read this prior question and this prior answer as prior testimony. And that's it. those are the words that she used, prior testimony. And at that point, it was the court sustained the objection. This is admissible as prior testimony under 908.045, subparagraph 1 of the Wisconsin statutes. And then, Your Honor, with respect to the issue of the statement that the child made to Ms. DeFazio, it is admissible as an excited utterance. I understand the court can rule against us on that point, although we did lay the groundwork under the, the broad, uh, broad allowance that the, the courts have developed in the state of Wisconsin and actually across the country about the admission of prior statements by child witnesses. But it's also the Wisconsin Supreme Court and State v. Dorsey said the court should consider the admissibility of children's statements under the residual hearsay exception as well because there's an intrinsic trustworthiness of small children on such issues. So when you look at the statement that David Jensen made to this witness on December, on the morning of December 2nd, 1998, when she indicated he was expressing concern about his mother's health and he had provided her this statement, this, this um, note that Ms. Jensen had provided to his, to his, uh, his, her son. 
that, that is sufficient under the excited utterance standard, but it's also sufficient under the re residual exception hearsay, which the Wisconsin Supreme Court has strongly endorsed courts should consider when considering the admissibility of child witnesses. Thank you. I'll give you one chance to respond. Thank you, Judge. Um, I think the problem with David Jensen's specific statement is that Ms. DeFazio doesn't say anything about him being excited. In fact, what she testified to is she was surprised that Julie wasn't there at 9 o'clock, so she went to David and said, hey, your ma's not here. What's going on? And he said, oh, I forgot to give you this note. That doesn't sound excited. Well, I ruled it wasn't an excited under Correct. utterance. Correct. So I don't have anything to add to that. I think they can call that witness and he can testify to it. Um, as to the impeachment of their own witness, if they lay the foundation correctly and don't try to refresh her memory, then I think they can do that. But they can't try to refresh her memory. That's the problem. Well, the, the problem I have is what this witness said on her oath, that it's not going to help her. Correct. So we're not going to go in that area. So if you want to try to get it in some other way, you can. So bring the jury back. All right, the witness is still under oath. Um, go ahead, Ms. McNeil. So, Ms. DeFazio, you expressed um, that you did not recall uh, Julie Jensen making any statement about whether her husband had forgiven her for this affair. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, now, Ms. DeFazio, you have also testified at a prior hearing on these same topics. Is, is that accurate? Yes. All right. So I would direct uh, the court and counsel's attention to the January 10th, 2008 uh, transcript. I'm referring to page 156. All right. I have to uh, get there. There's only about 1,500 documents on this case. <laughs> um, so this is January 10th, 2008. What page? Is there, is there a number? Because each one should be numbered. Um, so this would be document 26-5. Is that what you're looking for? Uh, each one has a number. What was the date of the filing? So the transcript itself is from January 10th of 2008. Let me see if I can find the document number. Uh, each one has a document number. Did you say January 10th, 2008? That is accurate. And what, what page? 156. 156. And I am referring to lines. Let me get the correct lines here. Um, it's right in the middle of that page. So 
So can everyone see what I'm referring to? All right, go ahead. So um, I'm, I would ask the record to reflect that on that date, Ms. DeFazio was asked the question, did she ever make any statement to you about how he never forgave her for that affair? The answer was, quote, oh, yes, she said he never forgave her for that. He felt that was a terrible, terrible thing she had done he would never, ever forgive her, unquote. Um, and so I'm just moving that portion of the transcript into evidence. Can you mark it as an exhibit or? Um, I mean, how is somebody who is eventually going to look at this case in the future? It's not going to be easy to find the way it is now in the record, is what I'm saying. So for the record, this will be State's Exhibit 6 that the state is moving into evidence. All right. It'll be received subject to cross. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Um, Ms. DeFazio, I want to talk to you about some of the statements that you said um, you had discussed with Julie Jensen. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you said that Julie Jensen said her husband knew a lot of people. Yes. And you knew that Mr. Jensen was a businessman? Yes. Did you know he was a stockbroker? Yes. And he lived in Kenosha? Yes. And worked in Racine? I didn't know where his office was. You just knew the, the type of work that he did? Yes. Um, you also knew that Ms. Jensen knew a lot of people? I didn't know. Did you know she grew up in Kenosha? Yes, I did know she grew up in Kenosha. Went to school in Kenosha? I probably, we didn't ever talk about her schooling. 
And she did talk, though, about knowing um, some law enforcement in Pleasant Prairie. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one of the people she talked about was a friend. Yes. And she described um, this friend, Detective Ronald Cosman. I don't know if she told me the name of the officer. I can't remember that. She just might have said, I have a friend who works at the Pleasant Prairie Police That's Department. That's right. And did she make it sound like that was the friend she was talking to when she told you that she had talked to a friend at the police department? She said that was one person she had told. She called him a friend. And I think she called her neighbor a friend. Thank you. You also testified that she said Mark was controlling. Yes. And that he became controlling after the affair. Yes. And one of the ways that she was controlling, or that Mark was controlling, is he didn't want her to get a job. That's correct. She told you she wanted to get a job. Yes. But Mark wouldn't let her get a job. Right. She said another way that he was controlling was Douglas being in daycare. She didn't want, if, she said that Mark did not want Douglas in a longer daycare than he already was in. And he was like in a morning daycare. Right. And Mark didn't want any longer daycare for Douglas. That's what she said. Um, and she said that she actually wanted to put him in like a day-long school program. It's a special, yeah, special needs program where he'd be the, the like the, the model for the other children who are unable to do things. And that was kind of through the school district. Right. So she wanted to put Douglas in that type of program. Yes. She hadn't done it yet, but she was going to. One of the other things she talked to you about was that um, she didn't know how to use the computer. Yes. Did Ms. Jensen tell okay. you that they've had a home computer since 1995? No, she told me that she just got a new IBM computer so when school said, started. So when school started, they had just gotten a new IBM computer. That's what she said. Did she tell you that she had previously worked with stockbrokers? No. And did trading with stockbrokers? No. Another thing she told you is that when she would come into the home computer room, Mr. Jensen would cover up the screen. Yes. Um, or turn it away, so or turn it off so she couldn't see it. That's correct. And when she asked him why he was doing that, he's like, I'm done with work for the day. Yes. That's what she told you. Well, I'm done with what I was working on. Okay. So yeah. I'm done with what I was working on for yeah. the day. Mm -hmm. She never said that he yelled at her when she came into the computer room. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think he, she used the word yell at that time. She also never told you that he'd just leave the computer on so she could randomly come upon whatever was on the screen. No, she didn't say that he left it on. He would either turn it off or turn it away. Right. You also talked to Ms. Jensen about looking at computer history. Yes. And she said she didn't want to do that. She didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the information you got from her. Yes. You never had a conversation with Mr. Jensen about any of your concerns. No, I did not. You never had a conversation with Mr. Jensen outside of the parent-teacher conference. That's correct. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the parent, the, the source of the information that you kind of got as related to the Jensens. The source of Ms. Jensen not being able to use the computer was she told you that she couldn't. Yes, and his son, her son also told me that. In the he said, David told her, told, there's a day in school where we were talking about going into things in the computer, and David said, he was talking out of turn, which is, you know, I say children should wait their turn, but she, he blurted out, oh, mom doesn't know how to use a computer, I'm teaching her how, she doesn't even know how to turn it on. So David was basically saying that he was teaching her how to use it. Yes. And this was in that school year. Right. And we had a discussion 
with since other students heard him say that, I said, I turned to the students. I said, Well, do you have parents that don't know how to use a computer also? And they all raised their hands or said yes, because at that time, having a home computer was a new idea. And you weren't aware that the Jensen's have actually had a home computer since 1995? No. And you weren't aware that Julie Jensen used a Quicken program on a computer to balance their checkbook? No, I do not. She never talked to you about that? No. Never gave you that information? No, I did not get that information. Outs Sorry, ma'am. Your relationship with Julie Jensen started in September of 1998. Well, it, the open house was August 31st or something, so it was August, end of August and September, yeah. Right before school started. Right. You had never met her prior to that. Right. Never had conversations with her prior to that. Correct. The other thing that Ms. Jensen talked to you about was that she um, recognized your last name, DeFazio. Yes. And she asked you if you knew Paul DeFazio. Yes. And you did know Paul DeFazio. Yeah. He's your brother-in-law. Correct. You know him to be a psychotherapist? That's correct. And what she told you was that she saw him as it related to marriage counseling. Yes. She never said she saw him as it related to depression. No. She also said that she was unhappy with the counseling with your brother-in-law. I don't recall her saying she was unhappy with it, just that uh, it wasn't helping them. She was unhappy because Mark Jensen, I think you testified on direct, was making lies up. Oh, okay, yeah, that, you're right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she was worried about was that Mark Jensen was going to make her look crazy. Yes. And that was like in 1991. Oh, I didn't know what year it was that... He, that she said that I thought it was recently that she'd been going to counseling with Paul. So she didn't tell you that the counseling she had with your brother-in-law was seven years earlier? She said it was related to the affair she was having, but I didn't know what year the affair was. And it'd be fair to say, Mr. Fazio, that your husband's also a psychotherapist. That's correct. At any point did you counsel her about, like, the professionalism of psychotherapists and their ability to really understand what's going on in a relationship. I'm uh, objecting to the relevance of this. And what? Where are we going with it? For relevance. The only question I was going to ask her on that. We'll let you ask the one question. Thank you, ma'am. Did you ever counsel her on psychotherapists and their ability to really understand what's going on? No, I didn't counsel her on that. During the conversation, I think you said this conversation was on November 25th? Yes. And that was the conversation that you had about DeFazio and brother-in-law and all of no, that? No, the DeFazio she mentioned to me back in October or September. It was earlier on. That's when she had mentioned that she was seeing, she had seen or was seeing your brother-in-law. Right, because now she had been with me a few, year, a few weeks then, and I think it was like in probably the end of September she brought that up to ask me. One of the things she did talk to you about is that she had an affair. Yes. And she told her husband about it. Yes. And there was a conversation about them having a divorce. Yes. And at that time, David was a young child. Yes. Ms. Jensen didn't tell you that she had previously been treated for depression. No, we never talked about depression. And in November during these conversations, she actually never told you all about seeing a family doctor about depression. I'm objecting. It doesn't align with the time frame that... I'll be more specific. Go ahead. Rephrase the question. After, after August 31st mm -hmm. of 1998, Ms. Jensen did not tell you that she had been seeing her medical doctor and discussed concerns about depression. Not that I recall, no. I don't remember ever having a conversation about depression with her. Okay. 
You testified a little bit about Julie Jensen making statements to you that she was afraid her husband would make her look unstable. Yes. And she was afraid of losing her children if her husband made her look unstable. Yes. Again, this information came from Julie Jensen. Yes. Mr. Jensen never said this to you. No. I want to talk a little bit about David Jensen. Okay. Um, he was in your class the entire year? Yes. Um, he was a good student? Excellent student. No behavioral problems? None. He did his work? Yes. Didn't get in trouble? Nope. Um, what you would talk, talk about is like a exemplary student. I had a lot of exemplary students that year. That's great. And he's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at some point you saw the ticks. Yes. And it seemed that it was like if there was a test or he was under stress. Whenever there's a test coming up, definitely I saw the ticks more often than any other time. And at some point you talked to Julie about the eye ticks. Yes. And did she, prior to the conference, did she ever say she had a conversation with her husband about the eye ticks? I don't think she did. Did she ever say whether they had talked to the family doctor about it? No. And what she told you, though, is that she was concerned about you bringing it up at the conference. That's correct. Because of something that happened at a second grade conference for David. When she got home, something had happened, yes, that he got upset. Based upon something that was said at the second grade conference. Correct. Did you ever talk to the second grade teacher about issues that David might no, have No, I did not. You also continued to teach David Jensen after Ms. Jensen passed away. Yes. And at some point in early 1999, just a month or two after Ms. Jensen passed away, David Jensen's ticks started to diminish. Yes. And by the end of the school year, they were very slight. Correct. Would it be fair to say that it was a sharp contrast between what you saw between September and November of 1998? I wouldn't say a sharp, no. Um, it was something gradual. I meant the difference between the end of the school year and the beginning of the school year. Was there a contrast there? Could you tell the difference? It, a slight difference, yes. And do you know whether he was ever treated for those ticks medically? I, after that conference, we never talked about the ticks again, except to say that Mark gave her permission to call the doctor and to get an appointment so that they could discuss the ticks. But David Jensen continued to be in your classroom. Yes. You would have continued to have conversations with Mark Jensen about his child. I never called the home to talk to Mark. He never came to school except for the conference. Um, but if you had seen the ticks continue. I didn't have really much of a chance because that was the last time I saw her was November 25th. And after. Ms. Jensen's death, you would have continued to teach and have contact with Mr. Jensen. I, he never contacted me after that. The only time was at the wake I talked to him. And my question is, you don't know if David Jensen ever received medical treatment for the ticks? No, because the conversation was not ever brought up again because I didn't see Mr. Jensen. Okay, thank you. So I want to talk about this conversation at the conference. Mr. Jensen was present? Yes. Ms. Jensen was present? Yes. And you were really careful about how you brought up that tick conversation? Correct. And that's not because of what you saw in front of you, but, but what you heard from Ms. Jensen? That's right. And when you brought it up, Mr. Jensen responded, we'll have him go to the doctor. He didn't say that. I had to pull it out of him. When we were at the conference, he was very silent and didn't converse with me at all when I was, you know, usually when you have parent-teacher conference, there's a two-way street and you're talking to both parents. He did not respond at all. So then when the tick question came up, or problem came up, 
I looked at him to see what his response was, and he still just sat there. And then I finally, after we were almost at the end of the conference, uh, I, I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, so are you going to take him to a doctor about the ticks? And he didn't move at first. He just sat there, and then all of us, I asked him again, and he went, he shook his head yes very slightly, and that's all he said. He didn't seem upset. He was just very calm the whole and quiet the whole conference. And when I mean he didn't seem upset, when you brought up ticks of his son, he didn't, like, yell at you. No, he didn't say angry, a word. Didn't get angry with you? No. And sometimes you can tell when someone's angry, even if they don't say a word, maybe by the look on their face. Mm -hmm. or th is that a yes? Yes. Or their face might get, like, red or flush. Yes. Those aren't things you observed on Mr. Jensen? No, he just was sitting there quietly the whole time. And you don't have any knowledge of any conversations, except for what Ms. Jensen told you, about any conversations between Mr. Jensen and Ms. Jensen about their children's ticks or David's ticks? Just that, that conference at the end. Did Julie talk to you about her family, her immediate family, no. her home life? No. On December 2nd, you realized Julie Jensen had not come to school at the 9 o'clock that she generally shows up at. Right. And at that point, you went up to speak to David. No, I brought, he called him up to my desk. So you said, David Jensen, please come up here. Yeah. And you asked him why his mom wasn't there. Right. And at some point after that, he produced this note. He, yeah, he said, oh, I forgot to give you a note. Um, and... It was with the note that you found out why Julie Jensen wasn't going to be there. Right. And you recognized the handwriting of Julie Jensen. Well, it was printed, and usually in his, um, you know, they had assignment notebooks at that time. She, if she had anything to say in the assignment notebook, she always wrote in cursive. And that note was just printed. You recognized the handwriting. I figured it was her because I didn't know any better. Ma'am, you um, already testified that you gave a statement on December 4th, 1998. Correct? Yeah, you spoke so. to Detective Ratzberg? Yes, I spoke to Detective Ratzberg. And you testified on direct that you, after speaking to Detective Ratzberg, he asked you to write up a summary of what you remembered. Right. And one of the things you did write in your summary was about Julie Jensen's handwriting. He had asked me if I th thought it was her handwriting. And what you told him, or what you wrote in your own summary, mm -hmm. not what you told Detective Rasberg and he put in his notes, but what you wrote in your own summary when you had time to sit down and think about it, was Julie's handwriting looked normal. By that, I mean it didn't look different in any way. And I was referring to... My question is, is that what you wrote? Yes. May I explain, though, what I thought normal meant? I oh. didn't ask that, but I might. Oh. But if you could just wait a second, please. Judge, I'm objecting to that. The witness has said she's going to tell the whole truth, and she's trying to do that. Well, she did answer the question, though. Well, I believe she doesn't think she's answered No, that. I don't. Well, feel then that. you could, you have redirect, right? We still have that. Yes, I do. All right. So make a note for yourself. Ask question. Ma'am, you also testified on August 30th of 2007. If that's the correct date, I The I first time you testified in this case. Is it, okay, was that the date? Yes, and on page 4, line 18, I don't know the document number, Judge. Is it marked as an exhibit? It's not, because I'm just going to cross her on it. All right, let me, uh, any idea when it was filed? August 30th, 2007. Counsel, did you say August 30th? Yeah. Okay. August 30th of what year? Is 07. It 2007, Judge. In the, uh, is it in a transcript? Yes. And what's the date of the transcript? 
Like the date the transcript was filed? No, the proceeding. August 30th of 2007. August 30th of 2007. Was it a motion hearing? I can show the court if the court would like. Yeah, I believe once. it was filed on January 10th of 2012. January 10th of 2020? Of 2012 document. Oh, never mind. My apologies. That's the federal. Ma'am, you were asked, and the handwriting looked normal, like, and you answered right, like it had looked before. Your answer was yes. Okay, I don't remember, but normal to me meant I was, I thought if she was sick, when I'm writing when I'm sick, I don't write as clearly and nicely as I would if I'm sick. You, it didn't look shaky to you? Right. She was coherent in the note? The note was, looked like it was a, Easily to be read, very simple. Gave directions on where she wanted her son to go after school. Yeah, if she wrote it. And um, where, um, what child she wanted her son to go home with. Correct. And after you received the note, you Ms. Jensen. No. Didn't call her on the phone. No, didn't have time. I want to go to that conversation that you had on November 25th when she made this statement to you that she thought her husband was going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Is, okay. Yes. Okay. At some point she said that she saw a list. Yes. Just sitting out next to the computer. Yes. And on that list it had information uh, or listed drugs. Yes. And syringes. Yes. And I think today you added needles. Yeah, I, I remember that she had said needles. I don't remember putting that in my summary, though. And she said that her husband doesn't use drugs. That's correct. At least um, she didn't think he did, she said. Did she talk to you about his use of prescription drugs? No. And based upon the statement she made to you, you suggested she contact law enforcement. Yes, and she told you she has this friend that she's talked to at the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. Correct. You also discussed with her going to a woman's shelter. Yes. And she said no. That's correct. She couldn't go without her kids. Right. And you said that's okay because you can take your kids. She says I'm worried about them being in, an, in a place like that. She didn't want to bring them there. I get that. But you told her that don't worry, you can take your kids. I did. And she said she was working on a different plan. Yes. And that plan was offered by a friend. Yes. And that was for her to go someplace to hide out. Correct. She didn't have the place yet. No. He the friend said was still working on it. Was working on it. And it was going to be in Illinois, she said. And they were going to find a place in a week or two. Correct. She also said that, um, I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, did she tell you that her friend had offered her money? No. Did she tell you that her friend had already offered her a place and she turned them down? No. This list that she said she found, I think you described it like a grocery list. Yes. Things to buy. Correct. And she said she found it in the computer room. That's right, next to the computer. Um, she didn't tell you the name of any drugs listed on it. No, she didn't. She didn't tell you the list had aspirin written on it. No. She also didn't tell you that the list had razors on it. No, I don't think so. Did she tell you that it had lists of last names on it? No. And when she was talking to you during these kind of confidant meetings that you had in the 
side room. Side room. Yeah. Um, she didn't tell you she had gone to nursing school previously? No. Not that I recall. Judge, can I have one moment? Um, I just want to touch base on one of the concerns that Julie talked to you about on November 25th. She said that she was really worried Mark Jensen was going to have her seen as crazy. Yes. And unstable. Yes. And as if she had mental problems. Correct. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Any redirect from the state? Um, yes, just a few things to clarify, Ms. DeFazio. Um, when Ms. Jensen was describing for you um, this plan that she was developing, um, was that a plan in contrast to running away to a women's shelter? Yes. And so did it sound to you that it was more orderly or organized? That's what she had said. I want it to be more orderly so I can make sure the children are going to be okay with everything. Um, and also, it looks less crazy, right, than running away all of a sudden to have a plan? Objection, right. speculation. Overall, go ahead. Let's finish up. So you may answer that question. Yes, she thought that if she had a plan, it would be a more stable thing to do instead of, like, running off because then that would look like she's just thinking in the moment and not thinking about the future. Now, Ms. did Ms. Jensen express fear to you that Mark Jensen would find her in a woman's shelter? Yes. Are you familiar at all with Mark Jensen's handwriting? No. Now, it sounded like you wished to explain yourself when you were questioned about whether your description, what your description of Ms. Jensen's handwriting or the handwriting you saw on December 2nd in that note. Uh, so just please explain yourself on that. Well, when I said normal in my summary notes, um, I meant it wasn't shaky because it could, uh, when someone's sick, as, as much as she was coughing so hard, when you're coughing, you're going to jerk with your handwriting. Thought maybe, I didn't see anything jerky like that. Um, I noticed it was printed, and she normally wrote in cursive in the assignment notebook, but um, I figured it was a note from home. I didn't, I assumed it was from Julie. It could have been Mark that wrote it. I don't know. So just as you sit here today and you're recollecting that note, you cannot say that you believe Julie Jensen wrote that note? Yeah, I can't be sure. Now, in the course of knowing Ms. Jensen, did you ever see her use a computer? No. And when you were uh, asked on cross-examination about uh, this conversation with Ms. Jensen about computer history, who brought up the idea of computer history? I did. I said uh, at that time the Macintosh had what they called a cache, C-A-C-H-E, I think it's spelled. And it's like today on your computer you have a, one of the tabs that says history, and you can go back and look in to see where you've been if it isn't deleted. And I, so I suggested her if she was worried about him being on the computer and she didn't know where he was going, she could look up the cache. At, I said th that word at that time. She did not know how to do it, and I not, was not familiar with IBMs. IBMs and Macintosh were completely different from each other at that time. They weren't that, that uh, the same like they are now. You can go to any computer and they're pretty much the same. But at that time they were different. And so I did not know how to tell her to go into the history at all. Okay, so you bring up this idea and Ms. Jensen's response is confusion? Right, she did not know what to do. Now one other thing about Douglas, can you describe for us what this program um, Ms. Jensen wanted him to do at the school? We have a preschool program at that time at Southport where um, three and four-year-olds could be in a classroom with special needs children. You had to apply for it, explain how your child was, if you wanted your child to be a mentor to the children who had special needs. 
it was a kind of a new idea at that time to bring two kinds of children together into a classroom at three, the age of three. Dougie had, was not three at that moment. He was about to be three. And so she uh, was going to try and get him in once uh, th he would be turning three. Um, so this is not daycare? No, it's not a daycare. It is an actual preschool classroom type of situation. And so Ms. Jensen, did she express to you that she wanted to do this with Dougie? Yes. She thought if she only went in with the two and a half hours that they give you at a preschool, at that time you didn't go for a whole morning or a whole afternoon. You went for like two and a half hours. And she'd ha she had to leave by 11 when we were talking that day to get home or get to the school to pick him up. Um, I don't know the name of the school he was at, I forgot. But she said, uh, that's not enough hours. Nobody will hire me for two and a half hours. She said, so to get a good job, she needed him to be in a, a situation where he'd be all day. And then she wouldn't have to worry about going after two and a half hours to pick him up. And so Ms. Jensen's idea was not more daycare, it was this program. Correct. And did she ever express to you uh, what her husband thought about Dougie being in this program? She said that he didn't want her, it, he did not want Dougie to be in a school that long of the day. That long it was too much. I have no further questions. Thank uh, you. Recross. Very quickly. Ms. DeFazio, what Ms. Jensen told you was that she, her husband did not want her to get a job. Yes. And he did not want her to put Douglas in anything longer than what he was already in. Yes. Thank you. That's it? That's it. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, there's a there's an issue that the par state would request be, we be allowed to take up outside the presence of the jury before the next witness is called. Go take. We'll take our break then. Uh, we'll, we'll bring you back at three o'clock. Okay. All right, the jury is outside the courtroom. Which witness are we talking about, Mr. Uh, the Jim? The next witness, Your Honor, would be Eric Schur. What Eric number is he on the list? Um, um, I'll get his number. 65. 55? 65. 65, Your Honor. 65. All right, I got him. It says Eric Schuler, Charleston, South Carolina. Yes, but um, in... 1998, Your Honor, he was David uh, Jens Jensen's best friend in the third grade in Mrs. DeFazio's class. And the reason I wanted to take this up outside the presence of the jury because there's, there's an issue has come up about the admissibility of David's statements to various people um, in and around the first part of December. Um, and so I wanted to explain the state's theory of the admissibility of David's statements before I put Eric Shure on the stand. So he is here to testify. Eric Shure is here to testify, yes. Um, David Jensen, to our knowledge, is not here. Um, this, this, this statement, these conversation, this conversation between Eric Shure and David Jensen occurred according to Eric Schur, either on the morning of December 2nd or the morning of December 3rd. But according to Mrs. Schur, she believed the conversation occurred on the morning of December 3rd. And the conversation was something like this. Um, David had come to school and he was telling Eric, his best friend, that his mother was sick and his dad wouldn't take her to the hospital. And David demonstrated to Eric how his mother was breathing, and he gave a deep, rasping, 
breathing sound. It's something like this. <sighs> now, at the time of the last trial, there was an, ex there was, uh, an objection on hearsay grounds, and it was overruled on hearsay grounds. Um, even though David, uh, Eric Shore didn't testify that David appeared upset or anything like that, it was uh, the judge, Judge Schrader at that time it was admissible as an excited utterance nonetheless, given the greater latitude standard that applies to, um, to children. Uh, since that time, Your Honor, there's been a United States Supreme Court decision about statements that children make. That's called Ohio versus Clark. That addresses the Confrontation Clause issues. And then there's been a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision pr called State versus Mercado, and that deals with applying the residual hearsay exception to the statements of small children. In Mercado, it was a sexual assault case, and the children were aged four to seven years of age. And so we go first to um, section 908.0, section 908. I'm just gonna stop you. Did this court talk about an excited utterance in that decision? That you're no, no they, they talked about the exception under the residual hearsay rule. Okay, that's what I need, what yeah, I wanna know. It's, so the, Section 908.03 reads that the following are not excluded by the hearsay rule, even though the declarant is available as a witness. And then you go down to sub 24. And sub 24, which is known as the residual hearsay exception, but in the statute on parent 24 reads other exceptions, a statement not specifically covered by any of the foregoing exceptions, but having comparable circumstantial guarantees of trustworthiness. Now, the Wisconsin, oh, Wisconsin Supreme Court in State v. Mercado, 2021, with second, 296, and the, um, the Northwestern site is 953 Northwest 2nd, 337. Now, at page 350 of the Northwest version of this decision, the Wisconsin Supreme Court addressed the applicability of um, the residual hearsay exception uh, to the statements of children. And it's sub D of the decision, actually that starts at 349, and 349 paragraph 54. Um, they are, they're talking about the child's statement at a video recording, but what they say is, we address the admissibility of NG's video recording under the residual hearsay exception 908.03 sub 24 with stats. And then in determining the admissibility of a statement by a child under the residual hearsay exception, the court applied the file following five factors. And um, they indicate we have set up five factors that the court looked to in determining whether a video recording of the child's statement meets circumstantial guarantees of trustworthiness. First, the attributes of the child making the statement should be examined, including age, ability to communicate verbally, to comprehend the statements or questions to others, to know the difference between truth and falsehood, and any fear of punishment, retribution, uh, and, um, such, and uh, such as close familiar relationship with the defendant expressed by the child, which might affect the child's method of articulation or motivation to tell the truth. Second, the court should examine the person to whom the statement was made focusing on the person's relationship with the child, whether that relationship might have an impact upon the statement's trustworthiness, and any motivation of the recipient of the statement to fabricate or distort its contents. Third, the court should review the circumstances under which the statement was made, including relation to the time of the alleged assault, or in this instance, the alleged incident, the availability of a person in whom the child might confide, and other contextual factors which might enhance or detract from the statement's trustworthiness. Fourth, the content of the statement itself should be examined, particularly noting any sign of deceit or falsity and where the statement reveals a knowledge of matters not ordinarily attributable to children of a similar age. Finally, other corroborating evidence such as physical evidence of assault or statements made to others, an opportunity or motive of the defendant should be examined for consistency with the assertions made in the statement. Now, when you consider those five factors in this, within this context, for I believe that um, first of all, David Jensen's statement to Eric Schur is admissible as an excited utterance, as that term has been traditionally applied 
in the Wisconsin courts to statements by child witnesses um, since approximately 1895 in the case of State v. Proper, uh, but culminating in State v. Mercado. Um, but secondly, it's also a, it meets the criteria for admissibility under the residual hearsay exception. That is, David Jensen had no motive to lie to Eric Shure at the time that he was telling his best friend in the world what was going on in his life at that precise moment. He just got into school and he was telling Eric, my mom's really sick and my dad won't take her to the hospital. And then he showed Eric how, how his mother had been breathing. Now, um, this statement was made, uh, we believe, on the morning of December 3rd uh, because um, Mrs. Shore, Eric Shore's mother, will testify that Eric relayed to her the statement that David had made to Eric the previous morning. And she said that that occurred on Friday morning, that David, Eric told her about David's statement on Friday morning, which was the morning after Julie's death. But Laura Shore had not yet heard of Julie's death when she, when her son first told her about this. So, the state believes that um, first of all, I believe if you apply the the sub 24, and you apply the excited utterance standard to the statement that that David Jensen made to Teresa Tafazio on December 2nd it qualifies as both an excited utterance, but it also qualifies under the residual exception of the hearsay rule. What's the Wisconsin site on this case that you keep talking about? State v. Mercado, it's 2021, WIS 2nd, 2. It's just WIS 2. No, just uh, I'm sorry, yeah, W, I'm sorry, WI 2, I'm sorry. It's 2021, WI 2, 395, WIS 2nd, 296. 297? 96, 96. All right. 953 Northwest 2nd, 337. But it's 395 Wisconsin 2nd, right? Yes, Your Honor. If you've got the hard books back there, it's 395. I, I still keep the hard books. Uh, I'm old school. I, I wish I could find a place that had them. Um, here's what happens in trials. Uh, we have issues that come up that nobody uh, can predict, uh, and they're based upon rulings and how cases are coming in. And then um, the attorneys argue and they cite cases. And I think the prudent thing for the, the court and myself is to read that case and give the defense an opportunity to come up with some sort of response. So we're going to call another witness. I'll make a decision in the morning before we start as to this witness. So, Judge, then this does affect our plan because this affects two different witnesses. Um, so what we would like to do is we have one other live witness um, who we can call right now, and then I think we should probably get into the videos that we can play. That'd be wonderful. Okay. And so I think we should probably just address this before we bring the jury back in. We have a proposed instruction to read to the jury before the videos. Have you shown played. it to the defense? Is there any objection? Can I have the instruction? Absolutely. So do we have it printed? It's right here. Okay. Is it printed? It's written out. You can read my handwriting. He gave me one. Okay. All right, so we have an agreement what I read to the jury before you're going to do the video testimony, correct? Yes. All right. That is accurate. And, Judge, I'm... I would just like to, because our next witness, I think, is not very long. So what I would like is to technically make sure it's going to play. Sure, because we're going to take, we got to take our break yet. I mean, I'm not a camel. Okay. <laughs> it was out on the record, Your Honor. <laughs> so we'll take a break, and you can work on the video. When would you be back, Your Honor? Uh, we'll give you 10 minutes, 10 after 3.
Yes. Number two. Two? Yes. All right. All rise for the jury. All right, we're back on the record on uh, Mark Jensen. The appearances are the same. The jury is back in the courtroom. Um, sorry for the longer delay, but we, we were working out here when you were in the back. I just want you to know that. But that's not unusual in a trial. Things It's like live TV that's happening. We don't know what's going to happen, and we try to address it as quickly as we can. So with that, Ms. McNeil, who's your next witness? The state calls Carrie Ashley. All right. You can come up here, ma'am, all the way up front, and you remain standing and raise your right hand. When you come up here, I will swear you in. You solemnly swear the testimony of this man to be the truth, whole truth, no, nothing but the truth to help you, God? Thank you. Try to get as close as you can to the microphone. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. C-A-R-R-I-E, Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. M Ms. Ashley, um, can you tell us, back in 1998, where were you living? I was living 9025 Lakeshore Drive in Pleasant Prairie. Okay, and is that in Kenosha County, Wisconsin? Uh, yes, it is. Now, is that sometimes called the Carroll Beach neighborhood? Yes. Um, and is that located near Lake Michigan? Uh, yes, we live directly on Lake Michigan. So if you walk too far in your backyard, you're in the lake? Yes. Now, can you tell us about, um, by 1998, how long had you lived there? We moved um, in spring of 1992. So when you moved into this Carroll Beach neighborhood, did you meet a person by the name of Julie Jensen? Uh, shortly after we moved, yes. Um, she came over to introduce herself. And where did Ms. Jensen live in relationship to you? Directly across the street. Um, and so is it correct that she was living in her home before you lived in your home? Yes. Um, and when you moved in, you said she introduced herself? Uh, yes. And so during this time period that we're talking about from 1992 when you moved in until the end of 1998, how frequently would you see Julie Jensen? We were in the same book club, uh, so every month, and our sons were good friends, uh, both in the same classes at school, same age, um, and then so whenever they had play dates and whenever we were outside playing with our kids and we saw each other outside, we would join each other. So I've, I guess it would depend on the time of year a lot more frequently in summer when everyone was outside. Uh, otherwise, definitely once a month at book club. Now, you said uh, that you had a son that was the same age as one of Julie's sons, is that uh, correct? Yes, actually, um, two were, um, Andy and David were in the same grade, same age, and Douglas and my younger son were, um, they were three, three years old at that time, three, four years old, uh, so they hadn't started school yet. And so would the children play together? 
Uh, David and Andy would, yes. Uh, the younger two, no, not so much. Um, and when uh, David and Andy would play, would you uh, often see Julie Jensen during those times? Yes. And uh, just to be clear, your son Andy, did he go to Southport Elementary School? Uh, yes, he did. Now, can you describe in general uh, Ms. Jensen's interactions with her children, just describing her as a mother? Well, she was a stay-at-home mom with them all the time, adored her kids, um, played with them. I mean, they were together all the time. Um, and did you notice anything um, different about that at any point, or was that consistent with Ms. Jensen? I did not notice anything different at any point. Now, um, I want you to think back to 1998. Do you recall the book club that would have occurred in November of that year? Uh, yes, it was always the second Tuesday of the month, and Julie was the host. And so she, um, everyone went to her house for the book club. Um, and when you went to that book club, about how long would it last? It was typically two to three hours um, from 7 to 8.39. Um, sometimes it would go longer, but usually in that time frame. And so do you remember anything about Julie hosting that book club? Was she a good host? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, the host always had food and beverages, and um, there was nothing different about that. She was a good host. She was a good bake, bake um, loved to bake. So. so I want to direct your attention to the time period after that November book club um, and approaching the time of Julie's death, um, do you remember Ms. Jensen um, ever talking about looking for a job? Uh, there was one instance I remember. Uh, it would have been um, m Monday of the week that she died. I was coming home from running errands and she was outside with another neighbor and she was visibly upset. So I went over and joined the conversation and she said that she would be looking for a job and that Douglas was um, put in daycare. Um, so at that time, based upon what Julie said, your understanding was Douglas was in daycare? Yes. And do you know whether that would have been full-time or part-time? Uh, no, I do not. Now, you mentioned um, Julie had some hobbies and she was a good baker. Um, did she also like gardening? I would say that gardening was probably her passion. She was always out in the yard in summer and spring and summer. Um, and so is that one of the reasons you would frequently see her outside? Uh, that and playing with the kids. Mm -hmm. And would you also see her outside in connection with the kids playing at the pool? Well, the pool was in the backyard, so um, I would have to say no to that, but they would be in the driveway playing with bikes and that kind of thing. And did your kids ever play in the pool? Yeah. Um, in, uh, typically, um, Fridays were my days off, so if we were to go to the pool, it would be on, on a Friday. Now, I want you to specifically think back to December 2nd of 1998. On that day, did you have a conversation with the defendant, Mark Jensen? I had a mutual friend who had had a baby, and I had called the Jensen home um, later in the day, and Mark had answered the phone. And so just, just so I'm understanding this correctly, you were calling the Jensen home because a friend had a baby? I wanted to let Julie know that our friend had had her baby. And do you remember who that friend was? Uh, yes. And who was that? Um, Angie Barron's at that time. I mean, she's... 
So you heard the news and your intention was to share that with Julie. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And so what happened when you called the Jensen residence? Uh, Mark, Mark just said that Julie was sick in bed and had, she was sick with the flu and couldn't come to the phone. So I asked him just to relay the message to her. And you said that he said she was sick with the flu? Mark had indicated that. And she could not come to the phone? Correct. So fair to say on December 2nd of 1998, you did not talk with Julie Jensen? No. So now I want to direct your attention to the very next day, December 3rd of 1998. Um, was there anything that occurred on December 3rd of 1998 that you saw that caused you concern? Uh, when I came home um, from work, there was a lot of rescue squads and fire trucks out on the road, flashing lights. So yeah, it was a little disheartening to come upon that. I hadn't known what had happened, but um, there were some neighbors in the yard, so I quickly got out of my car and was told um, what had happened. Okay, so you're basically driving up into this? Mm -hmm. Yes. And because your house is right across the street, you have to go right to where these vehicles are? Yes. Um, and so then when you got out of your car, what were you thinking? Um, I, I guess I initially thought that maybe there was an um, accident with one of the kids possibly hurting themselves. I, I just wasn't sure. Um, and so how did you find out what happened? Uh, truthfully, I, I, at, at some point I know that Mark had come across the street and, and told us um, that Julie had passed. Um, I, I don't know if that was the initial time I had found out or if someone told me as I exited my car. I, I just can't remember which one it was first, but I do remember um, talk, speaking briefly with Mark. All right, and so during that conversation when uh, Mark Jensen came over, can you describe what you observed about his demeanor? Uh, just, I guess, very anxious. Um, that's, that's about it. And would you describe him as upset or crying? Did you notice anything like that? No, I would say no, he was not. Um, do you recall whether he was smoking at the time or not? Um, I don't recall. Um, I know he smoked, but I, I don't remember. Um, now, did you also end up attending um, Julie Jensen's wake or visitation, sometimes yes. people call it. Mm -hmm. You did. And do you have an estimate about how soon after her death that occurred? It, it had to have been a few days, um, four, four or five days. I mean, it was, it was less than, than a week, so very quick. And um, at the wake, did you see Mark Jensen? Yes, I did. And uh, did you make any observations about his demeanor at the wake? Uh, we were waiting in line at the wake, um, just waiting to, to speak with the family. And um, I, I, I guess I would just say that, I mean, as he was talk greeting the guests, he just did not seem upset, um, more laughing and, and carrying on with the people he was talking with. Now, I'd like you to think about after the wake, um, first of all, in that neighborhood, when was the garbage collected? Do you recall what day? Uh, it, it was Mondays. All right, and so um, at some Monday after the wake, um, did you notice anything particular about the garbage outside the Jensen home? 
There was just a lot more garbage bags, some um, big hefty bags out in the um, in the on the curb to be picked up, and there was some of Julie's belongings that weren't in bags that were more spewing on, on the top, I guess. And so can you give us an estimate of the time frame, how soon after the wake this was? Uh, it would have been soon, so probably the next Monday. Um, and so you specifically described, was it more garbage bags than usual? Yes. Um, and did you say you specifically saw some of Julie's things? Uh, yes. And what can you remember about Julie's things? I don't remember exactly. It just, there was, whether they were sweaters or dresses or, or what, but they were definitely women's clothes out in the garbage. And so um, when you saw that, you recognize, recognize those as Julie's? Well, they were women's clothing, so. Now, at some point after Julie Jensen's death, did you uh, come to be introduced or to know a woman, um, Kelly Labonte? Uh, yes, I did. And about how soon after Julie Jensen's death did you see her at the Jensen residence? It's really hard for me to pinpoint exactly how long, um, but I was told that she was helping out babysit, and so I would say within the month. Um, now I want you to think to the time period of January of 1999. Um, do you recall anything about um, any birthday party during that time period? At the Jensen household? That Correct. would have been David's. Okay. And so his birthday would have been around that time period? Mm-hmm. And so do you, do you have any recollection of whether Kelly was at that birthday party? Uh, no, I do not. Do you know if your son attended that birthday party? Uh, yes, he did. And um, your son was in the same class at Southport Elementary? Yes. As David Jensen? Yes, yes he was. Okay. Now, can you just tell us... Um, would the kids generally get on the same bus together? How would they get to the school? Uh, they took the bus um, in the morning together, and it was, uh, they usually would wait in our driveway for the bus. Um, if it was cold or um, rainy, they would wait in the garage, sometimes inside. Okay, and in the morning, that's what they would do? Yes. Okay, and then obviously in the evening, they just go to their home? Well, I was a working mom, so um, some my kids would go to daycare after after work a few days a week. Otherwise, they would take the bus home. And no further questions. Thank All right, you. we can do the cross. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Ashley, shortly after Ms. Jensen's death, you were contacted by Detective Paul Ratzberg. Uh, I, shortly, I, I don't know exactly how long, but at some point I was, yes. It wasn't like a couple of years later. It was within mm -hmm. a normal amount of time after her passing. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. And you spoke to the detective who came to your home? Uh, yes. And he wanted to talk to you about some of the medication that Julie Jensen had been taking? Mm -hmm don't remember that um, and do you remember telling him that Julie Jensen had been taking sleeping pills I wouldn't have known that so no that's I, fair I would have thank never you said that <laughs> did you tell detective Ratzberg that you knew little about the Jensen's except that the police had been in contact with your family about prowlers around the Jensen home I would have never said that either because I, you knew the Jensen's exactly and they were your neighbors Correct. So if Detective Ratzberg put that in his report, that would be incorrect. 
correct. It would have been that I wouldn't didn't know anything about the prowlers. Right. But. You knew about them. You just didn't know about the Jensen prowlers. Correct. And if he wrote that in his report, that just would have been wrong. Yes. Correct. Wrong. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the people you spoke to after Julie Jensen's death. Okay. You knew Teresa Fazio. Yes. She was your son's teacher. Yes. She was also a neighbor. No. Did she live in the same neighborhood? No. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so you just knew her from your son's school? Yes. And it'd be fair to say that you spoke to her about Julie Jensen? Uh, I went to school that I drove my son to school the following day and I told her what had happened and that was it. And you talked to her about what you saw? No, I just told her that Julie had passed. You didn't tell her that you had seen like ambulances or anything like that? You just said Julie Jensen's passed away? That's as far as I remember, yes. Thank you. And did um, Ms. DeFazio tell you about conversations she had with Julie Jensen? She made a brief statement. So she did tell you some stuff about what she's, what Julie Jensen told her? Very brief, yes. You also um, were neighbors with the Voights? Correct. And you would have talked to them about Julie Jensen's death? Brief conversation, correct, yes. And were those conversations also one or two days after Julie Jensen's death? Mm, I. I can't answer that. I don't remember how soon after. And they told you about what Julie Jensen had said to them during this brief conversation. They told me that they had a conversation with Julie. They didn't, at that time, they did not tell me exactly what was the conversation. You had testified earlier that you had gone to a book club in November. Yes. And that was at Julie Jensen's home. Yes and there's usually food and drinks. Correct. Julie Jensen didn't express any concerns about eating or drinking anything at her home? No. Julie Jensen never expressed any concern or told you that she was afraid of her husband? No. You never saw anything going on in the Jensen home that would cause you concerns? No. When you talked about seeing Julie outside with the boys, you also saw Mark Jensen outside with the boys? Yes. Playing basketball? Yes. Walking the dog? Yes. Hanging out in the front yard? Yep. Now, you and Julie Jensen were neighbors for a number of years. Yes. And also attended a book club together. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, your families didn't vacation together. No. You would hang out if you were outside. Correct. Um, but it's not like you would go on trips together. No. She did talk to you about someone who was harassing her. Yes. Do you remember that? It was a very brief um, discussion and she said that um, she believed that someone was breaking into her home to harass her. And she told you that was a gentleman by the name of Perry Tarika. She never said any names, so I don't know. That's fair. Did she tell you that's an, in, that the person she believed was harassing them was someone she had had an affair with? A brief affair, yes. Outside of the conversation about the affair, you didn't talk to Julie Jensen about any issues in her marriage? No. She didn't tell you her marriage was in trouble? No. She didn't, did she tell you if she, did she tell you she thought her husband was gonna divorce her? No. She did say she didn't want to get a job. Correct, she wanted to stay at home with Douglas. And that day you spoke to her, the Monday before her passing, she was upset. Yes. Because she didn't want to get a job. Correct. She didn't want Douglas to be in daycare all day. And that's what she indicated, yes. And she wanted to stay at home with him. Yes. You were asked a little bit about the bus schedule, and I think your testimony was you saw them in the morning, but not the afternoon. Not all afternoons, correct, but. You were working. Three to, three to four days a week, yes. 
So during the days, three to four days a week, you were at work. Yes. You weren't watching what was going on at the Jensen home. No. You weren't watching who was getting on or off a bus. No. You weren't watching to see who was picking up or dropping off children. No. You testified that a week or two after Julie Jensen's funeral that there was more than normal amount of garbage bags outside. Is that correct? correct. And you were aware that family was staying at the Jensen home um, that had come in from out of town? No, I was not aware of that. You don't know if they were working to clean up the house? Yeah, no, I was not aware, so no. You didn't, don't know if they were packing up some items in order to donate to Goodwill? No. You wouldn't have been home to see, like, St. Vincent de Paul pick up items? No. You didn't see any. Oh, you have to use the microphone a little bit more. Oh, yeah, sorry. it's okay. Sorry. Um, you didn't see any keepsakes outside. No. You didn't see any photos. No. Miss Ashley, you spoke about seeing Mr. Jensen at the funeral. Yes. And you also spoke about seeing him on December 3rd. Yes. You weren't with Mr. Jensen when he found his wife. No. You don't know his reaction. No. You weren't there when the police told him that his wife had passed. No. You didn't see that reaction. No. You said you saw him talking at the funeral, to visitation, sorry. Yes. And that was to people that were paying their respects and coming up to talk to him. Yes. You don't know what their relationship was with Mark Jensen? Correct. Or Julie Jensen? Correct. You don't know if they were telling stories about a childhood memory or something that happened in college? Correct. It'd be fair to say that sometimes people reminisce at visitations. Yes. People laugh. Yes. People cry. Correct. And some people cry in their own way at their own time. I'm objecting. This is argument. Why don't we ask another question? You made your point. Thank you, Judge. I have no further questions. Hang on. Having a hard time hearing her. Right, can you get closer to the mic, ma'am? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm all finished, Judge. Thank you. Any uh, redirect? So I just want to clarify um, the prowler issue. Um, so is it true that the police did ask you um, at some points about prowlers being around the Jensen residence? Yes. And you knew little about that, correct? Correct. I had never seen anything suspicious in the neighborhood. And what you knew is what Julie had told you where she suspected it was this man she had an affair with. Correct. And so that's what you knew little about. Yes. Okay. Um, I have nothing further. Anything on those brief questions? No, Judge. Thank you. All right, you're excused. Thank you. Have a good day. Does the uh, prosecution want me to read the instruction on the recorded testimony? I do. Thank you, Judge. And the defense have an objection to the reading? All right, the attorneys have agreed to this instruction now. I'm going to read it to you, and hopefully everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, raise your hand, okay? Or throw your pencil this way. That'll, that'll be the signal. All right, jury instruction regarded recorded testimony. You will be hearing and seeing previously recorded testimony of witnesses who are no longer available to testify in person. You are instructed to ignore the logo which may appear on these videos because it has no relevance to this case. You are further instructed that this recorded testimony is evidence and should be evaluated the same way as the witnesses who testify in person. So with that, can we have the videos? 
Yes, Judge, this is for the record, this is going to be state's exhibit number seven. Um, so that would be the recorded in or the recorded testimony of Margaret Voigt. Um, and is she listed as a witness? She is listed. Let me give you her number. It's towards her, the end. Her first name is looks different than that, Judge. Doesn't say Margaret. What number is it? She is number seventy-four. Seventy-four. All right. Um, and Judge, I would just ask um, if this is another volume issue. If the volume is problematic, I would just ask that the jurors notify the court. They are ready to roll, uh, throw their pencils. I think it should work, folks. So now the volume is not working at all. Let me try to fix that. It's because my computer's muted. Right. Your marriage attack? Yes. Um, For the record, will you please state your full name and spell your name? Uh, it's Margaret Voigt, W-O-J-T. And um, Mrs. Voigt, you're married to Ted? Yes. Um, how long have you and Ted been married? Uh, over 25 years now. At some point, did you come to move uh, in next door to the Jensen's? Yes, we moved from Chicago. And when was that? Uh, I would say 93, 94. Can you, um, do you remember the first time you met Julie Jensen? Well, I seen her when we were building a house across the street. Uh, probably spoke to her a few words, uh, but then we um, talked more when we purchased the uh, property next door to them a lot, and which we built a house. And then we met at the um, closing. Um, so, Judge, the volume was a bit low for the witness, so I'm just going to restart it. The defense and I are agreeing to that. Right. Is everybody hearing the witness that we're trying? To... Yeah. yeah. Everybody's saying yes, so um, who's having the issue? Oh. <laughs> Bridget wants to hear him, too. So. All right, well, we'll restart it then, and hopefully uh, we will finish it. It will, it will take us till 5, and then that's the end of this video, Judge. For the record, will you please state your full name and spell your name? Uh, it's Margaret Voigt, W-O-J-T. And um, Mrs. Voigt, your marriage attached? Uh, in next door to the Jensen's? Yes, we moved from Chicago. And when was that? Uh, I would say 93, 94. Can you, um, do you remember the first time you met Julie Jensen? Well, I seen her when we were building a house across the street. Uh, probably spoke to her a few words, uh, but then we um, talked more when we purchased the uh, property next door to them a lot, on which we built a house. And then we met at the um, closing. And then you moved in next door to them? Then we moved next door to them. When did you move into that house? Uh, 94. And um, did you come to know Mark and Julie Jensen? Yes. Yes, we send them on a regular basis. Did you and did your two families socialize together on occasion? Yes. Tell us some of the circumstances under which you might get together and socialize with the Jensens. Oh, at that time we had two daughters, and uh, they had only Douglas. Uh, I'm sorry, David. So the kids would play with each other. Um, the Jensen's, they had a swimming pool, which my girls really liked. So they would be invited over to use it. And uh, on other basis, we would, uh, with Julie, we would go, we take the kids to Great America, we'd take them to the zoo. Um, when the kids were little, we would have birthday parties together. Uh, 
as a family go out for dinner a few times, have a dinner at their house. So do you feel you came to know Julie Jensen pretty well over the years? Yes. Did you consider her a good friend? Yes. Tell the jury um, your perception of what kind of a person Julie Jensen was. Well, first of all, she, she was very caring. She loved her boys. She would do anything for them. And uh, I, I always trust her. I would always go her with any question or um, if I had some kind of problems, you know, as far as finding maybe a doctor or a dentist or whatever, because we just moved into the neighborhood. She would be the one that would, I would go and, and talk to. You trusted her judgment? Yes. Um, did you, were you familiar with any of Julie's interests or hobbies? Yes, I knew she, she, oh, for, she loved her garden. She was, she was good at sewing and uh, crafts and uh, baking. She, was, she baked very good whenever she had anything. It was just. Did you have any of the stuff that she baked? Yes. Was she a good baker? Oh, yes. I mean, some people enjoy it and they're not good at it, but she yeah. was pretty good at it? She was, and she gave me a few recipes, too. Um, did there come a time when you, or when Julie ever confided in you that she was having problems in her marriage? Uh, closer to uh, her dad, I would say I heard from my husband sooner than I heard from her personally. So maybe like a couple of weeks before her dad, she would actually tell me a few things about the problems in the family, in the marriage. But your husband had been talking to you before that? Yes. And, and um, did you give your husband any advice when he was telling you about the problems at the Jensen, in the Jensen household? Actually, I did. I, I told him not to get involved. Um, so then a few weeks before Julie's death, um, tell us about the conversation that occurred between you and Julie. Oh, uh, we met. We met quite often, but not the whole conversation wasn't only about the problem in the family. We would talk about the boys, about the, uh, different kind of things, and then she would say something like, one time she said that it was very strange that Mark would ask her how she felt after the miscarriage and he would make a note about it. And she didn't know what that was all about. She was getting scared that he's planning something and she didn't know what. When was that uh, conversation, if you can recall? I would say within two weeks before prior her Julie's dad. So maybe mid-November 1998? Yes. Do you, did you know that Julie had had a miscarriage? Yes. When did she have her miscarriage? I don't remember, but I remember uh, Mark bringing David over to my house that morning. And David, I had to take him to school later because he was taking um, Julie to a hospital. Do you remember, was, this, was that the same year of Julie's death, or was it a year or two before, or don't you remember? I, I don't remember. Okay. And um, did, she, did she tell you why she thought it was, stra was strange that Mark would ask her how she felt uh, after the miscarriage? Well, because he never done anything like this before. He would, and it sounded like he never cared how she felt. So that was strange that all of a sudden he wants to know how she felt, you know? And then he'd make a note of it? Yes. Um, now, was that the first time that Julie had related to you her, that she had some concerns about Mark, or had there been other times? This probably was one of the first times. And then um, another time I spoke to Julie relating the problems was that week before her death, like Monday and Tuesday. And um, one of the things was... Um, I mean, we mentioned, somehow we mentioned the divorce, it came up to it, and I said, um, why don't you divorce? And she said that Mark would kill me first before he divorced me. What, uh, now you said that was the Monday before her death or the Monday of the week before her death? That was Monday or Tuesday of that week before her death. So it was the same week of her death? Yes. 
And when you had that conversation with her, were you talking to her outside or talking to her on the outside. phone? How long was that conversation and how did that issue come up? I, well, another question was, um, I asked her, we talk about the job at the same time because I knew she was applying. So she said she hadn't heard from any of the places that she had applied. And also she talked about Douglas being in the daycare all day that upset her a lot because she wanted to stay home with him till at least he goes to kindergarten, you know, full time. In that week, um, well, during the time that you're having this conversation with Julie about Douglas and daycare and so forth, about how old was Douglas at that time? I think he was probably four. And Julie seemed committed to staying home with Douglas? Oh, yes. Yes, she loved to stay home with her children, with her boys. Um, this conversation that occurred with, uh, between you and uh, Julie on the Monday or Tuesday of the week of her death, um, how long was that conversation, would you say? I remember talking to her a few times. So maybe like at one time, you know, it was five minutes, another time maybe ten minutes. So it was few conversations the same day. And um, did you know where Douglas was at the time that she was having this conversation with you? Douglas wasn't there, so I'm assuming that he was at the daycare, that all-day daycare that he started that week. Well, tell me, um, did you know when uh, Douglas started going into daycare? That week of Julie's death, he's supposed to start it on Monday or Tuesday. And you heard that from whom? Julie. Um, had he been attending any daycare in the weeks preceding that? Yes, but it was only uh, half day. What, uh, what part of the day was it, do you know? Uh, no. Do you, you know if it was in the morning or in the afternoon? Or? I would speculate. I would, if, I would if you don't know, if you don't know. I don't know. Okay, no. that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so how many conversations did you have with Julie in the two weeks or so preceding her death where she had made reference to the status of her marriage? It was quite a few. I, I cannot give you a number, but I seen her here and there and she would tell me things. But like I said, not every time when we talk she would say about her problems because she knew that I already know from my husband what's going on. So. Um. So are there any other things that you can remember that Julie told you in the weeks preceding her death concerning the status of her relationship with her husband? Well, I remember just, I remember one more thing. Um, I, Tuesday, uh, standing there, I actually asked her, um, first of all, I said, Julie, I know um, I didn't want to be involved, but I feel like I'm already involved. And then I said, um, I asked her, do you really think that Mark would do something to you? And she said, yes. Did you ever offer Julie any advice? Um, no. You never suggested to her she should do one thing or another? No. Um, the, you were talking about this conversation on Tuesday. That was the Tuesday before her death? Yes. And where did this conversation occur? That was on her driveway. I remember she came home um, right from grocery shopping. Did she ever talk to you about going to a doctor at all? Yes, she did. As what, a matter of fact, that was that same day. What did she talk? To, what did she say to you about going to the doctor? She just said it. I went to the doctor, and uh, she never said why, and she never said that you know she's not feeling well. She just said I went to the doctor, so I, it was kind of strange. I didn't, I didn't know why. Well, um, would. Would it be fair to say that you saw Julie on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, in the weeks and months preceding her death? Yes. Uh, did you notice any change in her physical condition in the months preceding Julie's death? I, I really didn't. Maybe because I knew, you know, that she's being sad and, you know, that what's going on with all the problems. So I really didn't notice anything. Um, 
So the last time that, when was the last time that you spoke to Julie Jensen uh, person to person where you could actually see each other face to face? Tuesday. And about what time of the day was that? Uh, it was before the boys came back from school, so it had to be before 3 o'clock. And did she, is that when the conversation with the doctor came up? Yes. And um, did she tell you anything about her visit to the doctor? That's all she said. She said, I went to a doctor, and that's all. Um, that's the last time you saw Julie Jensen alive? Yes. Was that the last time you ever talked to her? No. I spoke to her on the phone. When did you speak to her on the phone? On Wednesday, the day before she died. What time was it that you spoke to her on Wednesday? I remember it was around 10 o'clock in the morning. I was in the kitchen. I saw Mark leaving. I saw his car pulling out of the garage. He left, and just as he left, she called me. So she initiated the phone call to you? Yes. Tell me about the, tell me everything you can remember about the phone conversation that occurred between you and Julie Jensen on Wednesday. Okay, she said, hi, it's Julie. Uh, the reason I'm calling is because you're not gonna see me outside today, and I know if you don't, you're gonna worry that something is wrong. And I already knew something was wrong because her voice was very shaky and uh, it sounded like she was drunk. And so I knew something's going on. So I asked her, Julie, what's wrong? And she said, oh, she said, um, whoa, the medication I took, I didn't know they were going to have such an effect on me. But she never indicated what medication, and I, I didn't ask her. So I keep asking if she needs any help. And uh, she said, no, Mark is being good to me. Mark took the kids to school, and uh, he's going to a doctor for me. Uh, and I keep, I keep asking, I keep asking, um, let me do something, you know. Um, and she just keeps saying no and, and repeating that Mike, Mark is being good to her. And that's the last time you ever spoke to Julie Jensen? Yes. How long would you say that conversation lasted? I would say it was probably 15 minutes because I keep repeating. I, I, I didn't want to hang up. Why not? I, I felt something's wrong. How did Julie sound, aside from the sound, the, the, the fact that her voice was shaky and it sounded as though her speech was slurred, how did Julie sound in terms of her emotional state? Did she sound concerned? No. No, she did not. But she, she said, I'm okay. But she didn't sound like okay. Do you remember anything about December 3rd, 1998? Yes. Uh That was the day that Julie died. What can you remember um, about that day? How was it that you came to learn that Julia died? I went to pick up my daughter from school, and she goes uh, to the scene. So, uh, by the time we got home, it was uh, a little bit after four o'clock. And as I was getting closer to the house, I saw all the police cars, the ambulance. And I already knew something pretty bad had happened.
What did you do then? I went in the house and I saw my younger daughter and my husband sitting on the couch. My daughter was crying. My husband was very, very upset. He was upset at me too. He said, you told me to stay away. You told me to not get involved. And look what I have done. Did you see anything else happen that night? Did you make any observations of what was going on in the neighborhood? I see neighbors gathering outside, but we just, we didn't go outside. We just stayed there. It was very hard for us to deal with it. <clears throat> Do you remember um, seeing anything the next day on December? Fourth. December fourth. Yes, I I saw Mark on December fourth. I saw him outside. What time of day was this? It was afternoon. I saw him on the on his driveway by the garage, and I saw his dad and. Uh, they gave each other a high five, and they were happy, they were smiling, and that was very strange, because I thought, you know, your wife just died yesterday, why are you so happy? Oh. Um, did you attend Julie Jensen's wake? No, I did not. Did you attend her funeral? Did you um, make any observation? Do you know what day of the week it is that uh, the garbage is picked up in your neighborhood? Every Monday. Uh, do you remember seeing anything in the Jensen driveway on the Monday following Julie's funeral? Yes. I remember seeing uh, it was a lot of garbage, more than usual, and a um, lot of stuff inside, black garbage bags, but there also was uh, loose things that uh, I could tell there were uh, Julie's personal things. Can you describe some of the personal things of Julie's that you saw in the driveway? Uh, the one thing I saw, it was her red jacket that I seen her wearing recently. And then I saw um, some craft and sewing boxes. That's what I remember. Do you remember um, at some point, what, do you remember what kind of car Julie Jensen drove when she was alive? Uh, she drove a uh, Toyota. Um, I think it was like the station wagon, kind of reddish, burgundy. And where would she normally park that car? She would park inside the garage. At some point after Julie's death, did you see that Toyota parked anywhere else in the residence? Uh, Actually, yes, it was um, outside on a, a driveway, which, yeah, we noticed that right away. It was kind of strange to see Julie's car outside. How much time elapsed between the point of Julie's death and the point where you started seeing that her car was parked outside? Julie's car parked yes. outside? I think Julie's car, I would say within two days, it was already outside. Did you see what, if any vehicle was being parked in the garage where her car used to be parked? Did you ever okay, see the car? I saw a different car. Yeah, I saw a different car on the driveway. Okay. Did you ever see a different car inside the garage where Julie usually parked her car? I personally, I didn't see it. Okay. Um, were you ever introduced to a person named Kelly Labonte or Kelly Greenman? No. Did you ever see a person uh, around the residence that you later came to learn was Kelly Labonte or Kelly Green? Yes. How much time elapsed between the point of Julie Jensen's death and the point where you can first recall seeing Kelly Greenman or Kelly Labonte around the house? I, I, I seen her within two weeks just going in and out briefly. So. What time of the day was it that you'd see her going in or out? 
uh, around dinner time. And you didn't see where she parked her car? No. At some point um, in the time preceding Julie's death, uh, had she ever given you anything and asked you to hold on to it? Yes, she gave me a few rolls of film. When did that happen? That would happen, uh, I would say, yeah, like two weeks before her death. What did she say to you, and where did this trend, where did this transfer take place? Where she gave you the two, the the, the film. She came to my house, and uh, she just gave it to me and asked me to hold it for her because she didn't want to leave it in the house. She didn't want to keep it in the house until she's going to come back and pick it up for me. Tell tell us the form that this was, and what did you receive from Julie exactly? Oh, they were loose. They were like maybe three or four, and she just brought it like this in her hand. Three or four what? Rolls of film. Were they in these little plastic containers? Yes. It? Okay. And she just, what did she, did, when she gave them to you, did she tell you what they were? Actually, I already knew because my husband told me that Julie's going to bring the rolls of film. So I expected it. And, you, and do you remember what day of the week it was that she delivered those to you? No, I don't. Um, did she ever come back and ask for those rolls of film back? Yes, she did. And how much time elapsed between the point where she gave you the rolls of film and the point where she asked to have them back? Within two days. Um, so tell us about when she asked for the film back. I was... I was in the kitchen that moment and I saw a police car pull over on her driveway and I knew right away, you know, that that's what he came for and I was expecting Julie to come to my house. So I already had them ready for her when she rang the doorbell. I just opened the door and gave it to her and she smiles and she left. Were you um, present when that, or do you know whether that officer ever came back after having the film developed? I seen him, uh, I seen him, and I think it was the Monday, the week of when Julie died. So tell us about that, tell us what you saw. I just briefly saw him on the um, pulling in and that's about it. So I didn't see Julie or I just saw him so I know he came. But And that was the, the Monday of the week she died? Yes. What time of day was it, do you remember? Uh, in the morning. Do you remember how much time elapsed between um, the point where Julie gave you the film canisters and the point where Julie died? Uh, I think she gave me the film on November 21st. Had Julie ever spoken to you about becoming physically ill at any time in November? Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Good morning. Good morning. You live next door to the Jensen's for, you, you think you moved in in 94, is that right? Yes. About pretty close to five years? Yes. You were very friendly with Julie? Yes. You were very friendly with Mark? Yes. You had 
hundreds and hundreds of contacts over the years with both of them, yes. right? Yes. Uh, you had a chance to observe Mark here with his kids. Yes. Right? You saw him playing with them in the pool. Yes. Saw him shooting baskets with David. True. Right? Saw him go for walks with the dog. True. You were aware that Mark would go on fishing trips with his sons. Yes. Right? Uh, you saw Julie and Mark together in the yard working on projects together? Yes. You thought it was a a great marriage? Yes. And then your views began to change in about October of 1998? Yes. Uh, a month or two before Julie passed away, right? I'm sorry? A month or two before Julie passed yes. away. Yes. <laughs> And your views changed initially because of things your husband had told you, right? Yes, and later Julie. But Julie, just so I'm clear, Julie didn't start talking to you until about a week and a half or two weeks before she died, right? Yes. She didn't say anything to you before that time, no, correct? she didn't. And over those years, those five years, you and Julie generally didn't have very private conversations about your marriages, right? That's correct. I mean, she wouldn't tell you deeply personal things, correct? Correct. And after your husband told you some things that Julie had, had said, your feelings started changing about Mark, true? Oh, my feelings start changing about the marriage and, yeah. Not you, only, I mean, the whole situation. And during, during November of 1998, you found yourself kind of avoiding Mark? Uh, that's not true. Because it wasn't, it's the, situa the whole situation has changed it. Um, Mark wasn't outside like he used to us. Mark wasn't coming over and talking to us like he used to us. So it wasn't avoiding. It just, it just the whole thing changed. Mark changed too. He acted differently. Well, <clears throat> you indicated that you didn't, you wouldn't see Mark as much because it's later in the fall months, correct? Well, I pretty much just saw him going to work and coming back. And that's about it. Right. You wouldn't see him outside to the extent that you would in July when they're out in the pool or doing yard work, correct? Right. And based on what your husband had told you, you didn't particularly want to talk to Mark, fair to say? Uh, like I said, it, it was just different situation. It wasn't comfortable like it was before when he was out there with the boys playing. It just, the whole thing has changed. Well, do you recall, you testified in this case back in July, correct, Mrs. White? Yes. On July 12th, 2007, and at page 42, line 20, I asked you, well, can you think of any times when Mark avoided talking to you? Excuse me, counsel, I was looking for, what was the page number? Page 42, line 20. Thank you. I asked you, well, can you think of any times when Mark avoided talking to you? And you answered, well, to tell you the truth, I don't even want to talk to Mark, so I think it probably would be me avoiding him if I would see him. You yeah, recall I that? remember saying that, but uh, now I know not, that's what I'm trying to correct myself. That was the, the reason, because he acted, when I thought about it more, yeah, it was hard because he just acted differently too. He wasn't as friendly as he was before. Do you think maybe, maybe he sensed a different attitude on the part of you and your husband? I don't know. You acknowledge that you had a little bit of a different attitude, right? Well, I'll probably, probably I act differently too, knowing what's going on, that they have problems. Sure. Uh, did you have a chance to talk with your husband last night about his testimony yesterday? No.
You mentioned this uh, phone call, this is Voight, that took place on December, <coughs> December 2nd. Julie passed away on December 3rd. Yes. It was the day before on December 2nd. Yes. And uh, your best memory is around 10 a.m.? Yes. Uh, could have been a little after 10, could have been 9.45, could have been 9.30, right? If that's around 10 a.m. Right. You're not, you're not telling me that when she called, you looked at a clock and, and made a note. It could have... Could have been I kind of just sometime plans. around. That's there. why I said it was around ten because I saw Mark leaving and that was late for him to leave for work. That's why I said around ten. And Mark had already Mark had already left, right? Yes. And do you recall? Uh, you acknowledge it could be nine forty-five or nine thirty, right? If that's around ten o'clock, yes. Uh, you do agree, correct? Well. I said around nine o'clock. I'm sorry. I said around ten o'clock. Okay. So I don't know what's around ten o'clock. Okay. That's that's my memory. That's what I remember. That's what I said before. Around ten o'clock. Sure. You wouldn't be surprised if it turned out to be nine thirty, though. I, I think it would be too early. I yes. would be closer to ten. Now, at that hearing on July twelfth. You were asked to I pay. Know. And I said it could be 9.30, but now I'm okay. saying it probably be closer to 10. And how many, have you met with the prosecutor since July 12, 2007? Uh, no, just saw Mr. Jumbers yesterday and today, this morning. But Wait, you spoke with him yesterday? Just say hi, and not really much about anything. Okay. And you read your testimony? Yes, I did. You read your husband's testimony? No. Did you have your husband's testimony at home? Yes, we do. And do you know if he read your testimony? I read mine. No, do oh, you know? if he did? Yeah. No, he did not. And so Mark left on this Wednesday morning, December 2nd, and then Julie called you. Yes. She was home alone. Yes. She didn't say she wasn't feeling well, right? She actually said, when I said, are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. And at no time did she say she wasn't feeling well, right? Uh, actually, no. I don't remember her saying I'm not feeling well. You agree. You, don't, you have no recollection of her saying I don't feel very well. Yeah, yeah. just the fact that about the medication that she didn't know that it would have that effect on her. So I don't know if that would consider not feeling well. But she expressed it in terms of feeling a little woozy. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, she, her voice was like she was drunk. You talked to her for 15 minutes? About 15 minutes. She expressed no fear of Mark during that conversation? She said Mark is being good to her. She, ex she expressed no concerns about her safety, right? Yes, correct. And you asked her several times if you could help her, right? Yes. And she said no every time, correct? Yes. And every time I ask her, she keeps repeating, Mark is being good to me, Mark is taking care of me, Mark is taking the kids to school. She told you that there was nothing that she needed help with, right? Correct. She called, it was Julie that called you, right? Yes. And she said, don't worry if you don't see me outside, right? Yes. And she told you that you didn't need to stop over, right? There wasn't anything about coming over or not coming over. <clears throat> she told you that everything was handled, no help was necessary, she was going to be fine, right? Uh, she didn't say I'm going to be fine. She just said, Mark is taking care of me. But that Had Julie ever told you that she feared being poisoned? Uh, 
she never mentioned poison. She just said, when I asked her outside the Tuesday if she really thinks that Mark would do something to her, she said yes. So the day before, she had this uh, problem on Wednesday. On Tuesday, she told you that she feared Mark would really do something to her. Yes. And then on Wednesday, when something was happening for, to her, she didn't ask for any help. Correct. Prior to that day, had you offered to allow her to use your property at Lily Lake? Yes, my husband did. Were you there when your husband asked her? I don't remember being there, but I know he told me about it. And she declined that offer, right? Yes. On this occasion when, Drew, when Julie dropped off the film, she came to your house? Yes. Rang the bell? Yes. Right? And then she gave you these undeveloped film canisters, correct? Yes. And just a couple days after you received that undeveloped film, Julie came back to your house? Yes. And let me take a step back for a moment. Did she tell you to do anything with the film other than just hold on to it? She just said to hold on to it. Did she, say, did she say what, she sh what you should do with it? No. When she came over on, uh, to get the, the undeveloped film back, you had, just before that, seen a police car pull into her driveway, correct? Yes. Do you recall what day of the week this would have been? No. Do you recall what time it was? I... I think it was in the morning. Or early afternoon because I was home by myself. My kids were in school. Did she say anything other than to ask for the film back? She didn't ask for anything. She just said, can I have that film I gave you? Right. You didn't talk to the police officer that day? No. The police officer didn't come over to try to talk to you? No. Did you see Julie give the film to the officer? Did you keep looking out the window? Actually, I, I didn't see it, no. You don't know how long they talked or anything like that? No. Did Julie tell you that she wasn't eating? Uh, no, but I heard it from my husband. She didn't tell me that. Did Julie tell you that she wasn't sleeping? Uh, no. The Sunday before Julie died, you saw her, right? Yes. You saw her and Mark and Douglas and David? Uh, no, David wasn't there. And their dog. And their dog go for a walk? Yes. They looked happy? Yes. Was it a nice day? It was. Because this was, this was late November? Yes. After the walk, Mark was shooting baskets, playing with the kids? Uh, after the walk, I remember Mark took Douglas and then they went to a store, so they left. Julie came over? Yes. Was she upset? Uh, no. What was she talking to you about? Well, first of all, I asked her a question. I said, oh, uh, I saw you going with Mark and Douglas for a walk. And I was actually happy, and I'm like, is it getting better? And she said, oh, no, no, it's even worse. That's why I have to make that phone call to the Officer Cosman. And she called Officer Cosman? Yes, she did. Did you see Officer Cosman come over? Um, I saw him come over that Monday, the what? week. On December, 
on November 30th? Yeah, that's Monday. What time of day did he come over on the Monday? Again, I thought it was the morning hours. Mark came home then, right? Monday? Uh, no, I'm, I'm going back, sorry. Oh, you I'm, I'm going Sunday. back to the, the Sunday conversation. Oh. Julie was at your house, right? Yes. Mark came back. Yes. Julie got upset that Mark came back? She got panicking because she didn't expect him to be back so soon. And you were nervous too? Well, I was nervous for her, yes. Julie had been at your house hundreds of times, right? Yes, on certain occasions. That never bothered Mark, right? Yeah, I guess not. You never saw him be unhappy that Julie came over to your house, right? No. So what was the concern with Mark seeing that Julie was at your house? At that time, she felt like he's getting suspicious that she knows something, whatever he's planning or whatever he's doing, and that's why. Did Julie say what she was worried about if Mark found out? Well, because Julie, at that time, she she wasn't sure herself what was going on. That was the problem. She wasn't sure what Mark is planning, if he's just scaring her or if he's actually planning on killing her. Or <coughs> that's, that's the reason. She didn't want you to contact Mark, right? No, she did not. She did not want you to... Uh, tell him the things that she had been saying, right? Correct. She didn't even want me to tell the neighbors about whatever I know. She didn't, she didn't ask for anybody to intervene, right? Yes. Correct. Correct. Right. With respect to the neighbors, there were a number of neighbors she would talk to, right? Yes. You didn't really know how close she was to the neighbors? No, I, I didn't know. Following Julie's death, the neighbors talked quite a bit about the Jensens. Yes. There was a lot of speculation about what had happened. Everybody was giving their opinions and whatever they knew or noticed or whatever they were guessing had happened, right? I don't know. They were guessing at the new. And one of the things they were gossiping about was seeing this car in the driveway. Well, I right. seen the car. Yeah. I mean they did gossip about that too. Now, what kind of, how many times did you see that car in, in uh, December? I, I, I just want to say maybe I saw it once or twice. That's about it. What kind of car was it? I, I it just in my memory, I, I just remember it was some kind of dark color, maybe black, maybe dark, maybe blue, but I don't know the make. I don't know what it was. Uh, do you know who the car belonged to? Well, at that point, I assume it was Kelly Labonte. At that point, you didn't know who Kelly Labonte was, right? No, I did not. I just knew there was someone. I didn't know her name even, but at that point. So you're assuming now that it was? Yeah. But you well, didn't? I mean later, yeah, because later... Uh, some neighbors actually got um, to know her, so yeah, but I knew later for sure it was her. So, well, that's what the neighbors told you? Yes. There were other women who were coming by the house to help Mark, right? Uh, yeah, I think I seen his sister 
and by his mom. He had family, family friends who were doing the kinds of things that people do when their spouses die, like bring dinners over. Yes. He had cleaning people, right? I don't remember the cleaning people. I know you asked me that before, but I don't remember the cleaning people. Well, people came by the Jensen house, and you didn't always know what their purpose was in being there. True? Well, yeah, that's true. I, Mark didn't keep the car for that long. I think within two weeks the car was gone. He sold it. Well, in fact, Julie's family was staying at Mr. Jensen's home for over a week after Julie passed away, right? Julie's. Her, Julie's her family came in from out of town and members stayed at his house, right? I don't remember seeing anybody. I'm sorry. Do you know whether that Toyota was sold to her brother who drove it, who drove it home when he left from attending I, the funeral? I don't know who he sold the car to. I don't know. You have no idea why that Toyota might not have been parked in the garage right after her death, right? It was kind of strange to see it outside right away, but I don't know what was the reason. No. There, were, there were visitors at the Jensen home because they were in town for the funeral, right? I guess. The only woman that you, you said you saw Kelly Labonte at the house within two weeks? Well, I saw a person walking in and out, and yeah, I would presume that was her. In December? Yeah, within two weeks. Okay. Do you recall being asked the following question and giving the following answer when you testified on July 12, 2007, page 68, line 7? Let's see. Let's start here. <coughs> Question, so the only woman you ever saw there in December, there being the Jensen home in December was somebody with longer reddish hair. Answer, yeah. I remember seeing that girl, yes. And I saw her like the almost, I would say next day or, yeah. That was a, that was a younger babysitter, right? right. Like a high yes. school babysitter. Yeah, or early college, yes. And she was the only woman that you saw at the Jensen house in December. That's, that's correct. She was the woman and I just saw the car, so yeah, you're right. Well, and you only saw the car, you saw a car you didn't recognize one time in December, correct? Yes, correct. And then in January, you saw Kelly Labonte there. Yes, as it got warmer, then they would go, I mean, be outside with the boys together. So it wasn't... see her more and more. It was, it was after December before you yes. ever saw her? Yes. And you didn't see her much in January, it was more in the spring? It was more in the spring, correct. You spoke with Julie on uh, Tuesday, before she, two days before she died, is that yes. right? Yes. She had just gotten back from the doctor, she said. Yes. She was alone? Yes. Did she say that she had seen the doctor for depression? No, she just said that she went to the doctor and that was it. Did she tell you the doctor had given her antidepressants? No, she did not tell me that. Uh, she told you she was very unhappy because Douglas is in full-time daycare? Yeah, she seems unhappy because of that reason, yes. She was unhappy and upset about that, right? Yes. And that's the and that's the conversation in which she said she believed Mark would do could do something. Yes. Right? What about Pardon? Oh, I mean, that, that, is that the same conversation where, where she said that Mark... You mean the same day? Yes. Yes. Well, is it the same conversation? Uh, yeah, it was one of the questions. So, yeah. Let me... I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I didn't ask a very good question okay. to start this, but 
she came home on Tuesday from the doctor, right? Yes. She pulled in the driveway, correct? Yes. And she also had gotten some groceries, maybe? Yes. And you talked to her in her driveway, yes. correct? Yes. And at that time, she told you that she'd been at the doctor, right? Yes. And is this the same conversation where she tells you that she's unhappy and upset about Douglas being in daycare? Yes. And it's the same conversation in which you ask, uh, do you really think Mark would do something? Yes. And this is a five or ten minute conversation on a Tuesday afternoon? Maybe, yeah, ten, fifteen minutes, yes. She didn't ask for any help from you at that time, correct? No, no she did not. And the only other time then you talked to her uh, between that point and her death was the next day when she called you on the phone and said, don't worry, you don't see me outside. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The only other time you talked to her between that conversation on Tuesday and her death was when she called on Wednesday and in this conversation where she said, don't worry if you don't see me outside. Yes. One more question about the, the Tuesday. Did she tell you that the doctor had given her medication at that time? No, she didn't mention anything about any medication. You saw, uh, you mentioned seeing some things in the, in the garbage? Yes. Those were... <coughs> Other than that red vest, did you see anything that you could identify? Like I mentioned, some craft things and sewing boxes and the red jacket that I saw her wearing recently. Do you know, well, and you couldn't see what, there were bags out there? There were bags, yeah, but I, I don't know what was inside. You couldn't, you couldn't see other than one red vest that was outside well, of the bag? Well, that's what I remember seeing. I, I know there was more loose things laying, but I just, I cannot tell you what it was because I don't remember. Julie was uh, smart. Yes. Uh, you were aware that she had uh, worked uh, earlier in their marriage, right? Yes. She told you that she had worked in the financial industry? Yes. And she told you that she had gone to nursing school? She didn't tell me that. She had her own car? Yes. She had her own car the whole time you knew her, right? Yes. Uh, she never had any financial complaints, correct? No, correct. She came and went as she pleased during the day, right? It seemed like it, but um, it was pretty much grocery shopping or there was something involved with boys. You were part of her book club, is yes. that right? Yes. And Julie missed book club a number of times uh, because, well, she said it was because of Mark, right? Yes. She, she would uh, say she couldn't make book club because Mark was working. Objection, right? Your Honor. It's irrelevant unless there's a time frame established. Well, I think you should put the time frame in. Okay. The uh, <clears throat> before her, uh, <clears throat> in the months before her death, well, in November, Julie hosted book club, right? Yes. In the months before that, she missed several book clubs because of Mark's, because of Mark, right? Or she would come and leave early. Okay, so she missed some, and then she left early from some. Yes. And she would she would say that's because Mark needed her at home or because Mark was working. Yes. You didn't know whether that was true or not. I believe Julie, but I didn't know. Right. You didn't you didn't know whether that was actually required of her to go home or not. Correct. Yes, but knowing Julie, I. I don't see any other reason. You never heard any of these discussions between Mark and Julie about her getting a job, right? No, I did not. 
You never heard any of these discussions between Mark and Julie about Douglas being in daycare? No, I did not. You don't, if Mark wanted uh, Douglas in daycare, you don't know the reasons why? Well, Julie told me that Mark wanted Douglas in the all day care because um, Julie had bad influence in Douglas. That's what Julie had told me. Okay. And did she? Did you know why she did? He didn't work, or why he wanted her to work? Um, well, Julie always worked one way or the other. She babysit, uh, so she could make some money, contribute to the family. Um, but why he wanted her to work, I don't really know. Why well, she, he wanted her to work out of the house. Well, she was complaining about that, right? Yes, she wanted to stay at home with Douglas. And you don't know whether, in fact, Mark wanted her to work, right? Well, that's what she said. Right. And you don't, you don't, you don't, you never talked to Mark about that and no, got his I view. Did. And if that was true that Mark wanted her to work, you don't know why, right? Well, that's the only answer she gave me, that she's bad influence on Douglas and she wants him to go full daycare and her to get a job. But again, you didn't talk to Mark to get his side of the story, right? No, I did not. Did Julie uh, talk to you about having seen a counselor for depression? No, she did not. She never, did she ever tell you that she had been on antidepressants before? No, she did not. And in 1998, she didn't tell you that she was taking antidepressants? No, she did not. Did she tell you about seeing the doctor in September and telling him then that she was feeling depressed? No, I don't remember her telling me that. On the Monday before Julie died, you had a conversation with her? Yes. When was that? Uh, it was probably early afternoon. It was, as always, on her driveway or her yard. And that was another five to ten minute conversation? Yes. And in this five to ten con minute conversation on Monday, November 30th, uh, she told you that she had had an affair, right? No. Did she ever tell you that she had an affair? She did, but not that Monday. When did she tell you that she had an affair? When she came to the house that Sunday to make the phone call. Oh, that was the day before? Yes. And that just came up from nowhere? Yes. Would you bring what's on the printer, please? Thank you. <clears throat> after the, after your telephone call on Wednesday, did you try calling Julie back at all? No, I did not. You didn't stop at the house? No. Is that because she had discouraged you from intervening? Well, like I said to my husband, I said, you know, she said well, that, my... Actually, why don't you just... Uh, his question was uh, whether um, she had discouraged you from intervening. Yes, she did. Go ahead. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And at no time during any of the conversations you had 
during the last two weeks of Julie Jensen's life, did she ask you to uh, talk to Mark, right? She never asked me to talk to Mark. And at no time during those last two weeks did she ever ask you to talk to the police, right? Correct. And at no time during those last two weeks did she ever uh, ask you uh, to help her get away, correct? Correct. Did she tell you that she had previously filed for divorce against Mark? I heard about it. I'm not sure if she told me or my husband did, but I, I knew about it. Thank you, that's all. Um, Mrs. Voigt, this um, conversation where Julie Jensen had told you about her affair, when did that conversation occur? On Sunday, when she came to make the phone call. And this was the Sunday before she died? Yes. And tell us, um, tell us everything you can remember about that when she came to make a phone call. She made the phone call, and after the phone call, actually, that's what she said. She said, um, I had uh, uh, I had an um, affair with the co-worker. Uh, that's about it, what she told me about it. Do you remember? I didn't ask her any questions, and I, it just, it was kind of, uh, I was very surprised. Do you remember her saying anything about Mark or about how Mark felt about her after she told you about this? Yes, she said the reason she did because she thought that Mark doesn't love her anymore. The reason she did what? The reason she told you about this or the reason that no, she... No, she told me that the reason I had an affair was because I thought that Mark doesn't love me anymore. Um, what time of the day on Sunday was this phone call? Uh, it's probably like a little bit maybe after lunch time, kind of around lunch time, I would say maybe one o'clock. And um, did, were you able to hear her speaking on the telephone when she made the phone call? Yeah, I didn't know what she said, I wasn't listening, but yeah, I... Excuse me, I heard her. Did you somehow know who she was going to call? She told me she's going to call Officer Cosman. <coughs> so I knew who she's going to call. Yes. And was this before or after she had given you these film canisters? After. Was this before or after she'd come to reco recover the film canisters? After. Thank you, Mrs. White. I don't have any further questions. Just a couple. <clears throat> Did... So was it your understanding that this affair had been recent? Uh, no, you know what? She probably had, because I knew she, Douglas was a baby, so yeah. She must have mentioned it, so I knew it wasn't recent. You... Your understanding was it was when Douglas was a baby? Yes. And Douglas was about three or four at the time? I don't know how old he was, but it, yeah, it sounded like it happened when she had Douglas. And I don't know if she was still working at the time, because she, she said co worker so. Okay. That's all, thank you. Mr. Jenkins? Um, as you're sitting here now today, Yes. Are you sure that it was about the time after she'd had Douglas, or could it have been about the time after she had David, or aren't you sure? It was after the time she had, uh, did they say Douglas? It was David. It okay. Was David. So as you're sitting here now today, you're, you yes. know who it was? It was David. It was after she had David? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. So Ms. So Ms. Boyd, and David would have been about... Well, he was the, a baby. I don't know how old he was. Well, you don't. I was going to ask. I was going to ask how old he was in 1998. You're not. You're not sure. 1998, when uh, Julie died, how old was David? That's yeah. what right. you're asking me. I think he was about eight years old. Okay.
just I'm sorry, I, I did have one one other thing. When when uh, she told you about this miscarriage, again, that's something you only heard from Julie, right? Yes. You didn't ask Mark anything about it, right? I did not. And you don't know what Mark's side of the story is, right? No. Okay, that's all. Yeah, I, uh, I need that exhibit, the uh, photograph. Uh, I don't know what number it is. Do you, well, do you, do you have the photographs here? Yes, they're here. They're in here? It's the photograph of Julie and David and Douglas. So would that be near the bottom? This is what I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, this is exactly. I show this photograph. <coughs> it's been marked as state's exhibit uh, S104. And um, I ask if you can identify the persons depicted in that photograph. It's uh, Julie, David, and Douglas. And um, would you say that does that photograph appear to have been taken sometime? And uh, we'll, we'll, by looking at that photograph, can you tell whether it was taken at some point within a matter of months of Julie's death, or did it appear to be taken at Ob some time earlier? Objection beyond beyond this witness's abilities. Uh, it seems like it was taken uh, within a month because looking at the boys. That's about how David looked in the last uh, months preceding Julie's death. Yeah, I think so. Nine years, so. Is that about how Julie looked in the months preceding her death? Yes. So how old would David appear to be there at that photo, would you say, if you know? Yeah, he looks more like, yeah, seven, eight. And Douglas looks like three or four. Thank you, Anna, for the question. Nothing further. Uh, you may start, step down, yeah. I take it that's our last witness for the day? It is, Judge, and I'm just moving that exhibit number seven into evidence. All right. Any objection? All right. Seven will be received. Okay, folks, thank you for everything you've done today. Uh, we're going to start at 830, so please be here before that. Have a good evening again. Please don't talk or watch anything about the case, okay? Thank you. right away. Let them leave. All right, the, uh, you can have a seat. Sit down. Um, the jury is outside the courtroom. We have an issue then for tomorrow on uh, witness number 65, Eric Shore. That is the uh, friend of David, the young friend. Um, I do have the case that was brought up by Mr. Jamboys, and I do have um, the statute that I'm going to look at. We'll deal with it at 8.15 so we don't keep the jury waiting. So, Thank you, Your Honor. And I would, then I'll figure out what to do. I would point out one other thing, Your Honor. If you wanted to look at where that came up in the last trial, it's on transcript uh, for January 28, 2008, page 10, line 1, through page 21, line 10. What's the transcript line again? January 28th, 2008. Okay. Page 10, line 1, through page 21, line 10. Thank you. And I would just note, Your Honor, that at that time there was an issue about confrontation. Um, and there was no confrontation clause issue at that time because David Jensen was going to be made available. There is no confrontation clause issue this time because this is not a testimonial statement. This is not a testimonial statement. It's not a confrontation clause issue. The only question is whether it's admissible as either an excited utterance or uh, under the residual hearsay exception. And, and I know um, I do try to multitask up here. 
Um, I don't know who brought it up, whether it was you, Mr. Janvoys, or Ms. McNeil, the issue of that the um, David was a minor and the um, excited utterances looked at different for minors, but that's only for sexual assault cases. Um, well, Your Honor, I would disagree with that. I would say that it's not only for sexual assault cases. I don't have any other cases. Trust me, I've read a lot. Oh, you guys are watching this video. There is no other case that says there's an exception just because he's a juvenile. But, Your Honor, if you look at, for example, the five factors that are... I, I, we're, not, we're not talking about the five factors. That's a different hearsay exception. Okay. I'm talking about excited utterance. And the case law says there's preference given for minors if it's a statement regarding sexual assault. And this is not a sexual assault case. As you reminded me, when the jury was out, this is a homicide case. Yes, Your Honor. And by the way, Your Honor, I'll say this. I apologize for the way that I, I spoke. Trust me. We get heated and we try to do our jobs. And I, and I accept your apology. I hold, hold nothing against you. So that doesn't mean the defense gets to yell at me tomorrow. Wait, wait, wait. All right, have a good evening. We'll see you Judge, at 8.15. Judge, if I could add something. Oh. Um, so we will research this tonight. We'll work on it. But um, I do want to point out, give another case site that I Regarding think an excited <laughs> utterance? Yes. And what case do you have? Uh, Gerald L.C. And the case site is 194 with second. 548. 194 Wisconsin 2nd, 548, right? That's right. All right. Do you have that, Mr. Jamboys? I do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. He's got to wait to make sure the jury's out. They're all out?